You hear me? We're having technical problems. That's Hang good. On. Yeah, you can hear me, but show has not started yet. This is not the show. This is me dealing with a lot of bullshit. So, how you doing, Dan? There we go. I'm doing uh, wonderfully. How are you? I'm, I'm about to throw a punch. Quite frankly, deep uh, breaths. Here, we, yeah. Bring all to front can't do it let's uh let's jesus fucking christ hang on uh can you uh g- give me a break here please dan uh yes sir for what yes, sir. uh right hang on can uh okay All right. All right. 
Can you hear me now, Dan? Yep, sound good. Okay. It's one of those days. Been uh, having one of those days here. Show hasn't started yet, but we're getting there. Had some family things going on. Show hasn't started yet. All right. Yeah, that's the way this day is going. Okay. All right. Welcome to the mop up for April 4th, 2022. I'm David Feldman coming to you from an air shaft overlooking a parking garage somewhere in Manhattan where the temperature is 56 degrees and sunny. Last night was the Grammys and Louis CK actually won a Grammy. I'm guessing in the category of best solo performance. President Biden said today that he is not yet willing to call what happened in the Ukrainian city of Bucha genocide, but he is calling it a war crime. Yes, let's depend on the criminal courts to bring an end to the fighting in Ukraine. Let's take Putin before the International Criminal Court for committing war crimes. Oh, wait, that's right. I forgot America isn't a signatory to the ICC. But who cares? Let's call it a war crime because that will accomplish nothing other than prolonging the war and creating more war crimes because all war is a crime. All war is a crime because war is criminal. That's why you do everything in your power to stop it from happening, Joe Biden. And you don't call the person you're trying to drag to the negotiating table a war criminal. Unless, of course, Joe Biden, you don't want to end the war. There are now reports coming from President Zelensky's office that Russian troops buried 280 Ukrainians in the city of Bucha. The Associated Press is now reporting that it has seen 21 bodies scattered around the city. According to Human Rights Watch, Russian soldiers have committed crimes against humanity, crimes against Ukrainian civilians in Cherniv, Kharkiv, and Kiev regions of Ukraine. There are reports of gang rapes as well as looting civilian property, including food, clothing, and firewood. There are reports that women and children have been executed. It is absolutely horrible and unforgivable. But there has never been a war where this did not happen. That's why you do everything to prevent war. You do everything to stop war once it has started. What did Joe Biden think was going to happen when he refused to guarantee Vladimir Putin that Ukraine would never join NATO? What did Joe Biden think was going to happen when he kept saying before the invasion that Vladimir Putin will attack? What did you think was going to happen after he attacked? You saw what Putin did in Georgia. You saw what Putin did in Syria. What did you think was going to happen? This is what happens during war, always during war. President Biden said of Putin today, quote, we saw what happened in Bucha. He is a war criminal. Biden then said Putin should be put on trial for war crimes. Yes, because that will bring Vladimir Putin to the negotiating table with his tail between his legs. Because if Vladimir Putin has shown us anything during the past 22 years, it is that you know, he admits he's wrong and all he needs is a little tough talk and he backs down. Yes, Putin is a war criminal. But war crime is redundant. All war is a crime. All war is a crime. Rape, looting, summary executions, all of this is what happens in a war yes there are rules of engagement 
but those rules are never followed. And the only people who ever get tried for violating the rules of engagement are the losers. War never involves rational actors. It is irrational. By its very nature, war is irrational. Deciding to go to war is irrational. And the people who fight the war become irrational. Now, just because we do it doesn't make it uh, okay for anybody else to do it. It's bad that everybody does it. America does it. America does what Vladimir Putin is doing, Joe Biden. If you look at the American military, our soldiers, our military leaders are guilty of rape, rape of our own soldiers. Forget the enemy. Our military rapes its own. Our military, the American military, is guilty of looting of this country. The American military industrial complex loots its own country. We spend trillions on weapons we never needed, and the military industrial complex charges 5,000 times what they should be charging to maintain the weapons and equipment that we never needed. All war is a crime, and in America, much of that crime is fraud. There is nothing legal. There is nothing responsible, nothing remotely moral to war, to any war. During the good war, World War II, my father's war, we killed innocent civilians in Tokyo, Dresden, as well as dropping atomic bombs on Nagasaki and Hiroshima, in which entire swaths of neighborhoods with thousands of women and children were wiped out. The women and children were wiped out if they were lucky. The unlucky women and children went on to live painful and shortened lives consumed by radiation with half their skin peeled off. In Vietnam, we burnt villages to save them. The military said it was necessary to burn South Vietnamese villages to save them. During the My Lai massacre of 1968, American soldiers killed as many as 600 unarmed South Vietnamese women and children. We left them on the side of the road for dead South Vietnamese women and children, our allies. We were fighting to save the South Vietnamese. We were fighting on the, on the side of the South Vietnamese. And during the My Lai massacre of 68, we left 600 dead, unarmed South Vietnamese women and children dead on the side of the road. They were killed by our soldiers and Colin Powell, made his reputation back then by helping to cover this up. The military, the Pentagon, was never going to tell us about the My Lai massacre. We had to rely on the great investigative reporter Seymour Hirsch to uncover it, writing for the Dispatch News Service. We, America, dropped napalm on children in Vietnam. We dropped more bombs on Laos than we did on all the countries we've ever dropped bombs on combined. War, all war, is a crime. We illegally invaded Cambodia. We illegally dropped bombs on Cambodia, which spawned the Khmer Rouge and Pol Pot and that genocide. All war is a crime because civilians die in all wars and killing civilians in a war is a war crime. It is a crime to kill civilians during war. All war is a crime. Shock and awe is a crime. The Watson Institute at Brown University, they are one of the leading experts on civilian casualties in war. According to the Watson Institute at Brown University, 
387,072 innocent civilians in Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, Syria, and Pakistan have died as a result of America's post 9-11 global war on terror. That would be 387,072 innocent dead civilians because America declared war on countries after 9-11 that had absolutely nothing to do with 9-11. That is a war crime. The invasion of Iraq was a war crime. It was not sanctioned by the United Nations. The United Nations told us not to invade Iraq. The invasion was a war crime. It was not sanctioned by the United States. And every general, every American leader, including every United States senator and congressperson serving on the Armed Services Committee from 2002 till, uh, what, 2021, should be dragged before the International Criminal Court. Unfortunately, America isn't a signatory to the International Criminal Court. We can't be because we drop bombs on innocent civilians. 387,072 dead civilians in Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, Syria, and Pakistan since 2001. And that doesn't include Somalia or all the other illegal drone strikes we have ordered and continue to order. We torture, we waterboard, we hold American citizens and enemy combatants indefinitely without a trial. Yes, Vladimir Putin is a monster. His soldiers have committed war crimes. So has America. We have lost our moral authority to judge Vladimir Putin's war crimes because we engage in illegal war and all war is a crime. The phrase war crime is redundant. War is a crime. Our weapons are used all over the world to kill innocent civilians in Yemen. Our climate czar, John Kerry, cannot travel everywhere around the world to combat climate change because when he was secretary of state he authorized sales of weapons to saudi arabia even though he knew those weapons would be used against innocent yemenis yemenis john Kerry could be dragged before the international criminal court he has to be careful where he travels according to the watson institute that's brown university's a department that studies the deaths of civilians during war. America's war on global terror has created as many as 60 million worldwide refugees from countries such as Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, the Philippines, Libya, and Syria. Our war to avenge 9-11, according to the Watson Institute, according to Brown University, conservatively speaking, has created 60 million refugees. We invaded Afghanistan. We invaded Iraq. We invaded Pakistan to kill Osama bin Laden and Lord knows who else. All that creates refugees. Hillary Clinton, as our Secretary of State, orchestrated NATO airstrikes against Libya. That creates refugees. Before Syria turned into an even more of a massive bloodbath, back around 2013, President Obama authorized Timber Sycamore. Timber Sycamore sounds nice, doesn't it? Timber Sycamore. That was a secret CIA program to provide Syrian rebels with money, weapons, and training to overthrow Syrian leader Bashar Assad. America, through Timber Sycamore, funneled Kalashnikov assault weapons, rocket-propelled grenades, tow anti-tank smart missiles, night vision goggles, and trucks and other assorted military equipment to rebel forces in Syria who are trying to overthrow Bashar Assad. Bad guy, Bashar Assad. This is what 
Benghazi was all about, the hearings were all about. This is according to Peter B. Collins, who will be on later in the show. He said the Benghazi hearings were about the Republicans wanting to get even with Contragate. And they were using the Benghazi hearings to get Hillary Clinton to admit that when she was Secretary of State, she was guilty of the same exact crimes the Reagan administration was guilty of back when they traded arms for hostages. More about Contragate in a second. That's what the Benghazi hearings were all about, according to Peter B. Collins. Nobody knew that Obama, through Operation Timber Sycamore, was secretly funding rebels in Syria. Obama's CIA, now the CIA is supposed to gather intelligence. The CIA set up its own paramilitary troops in Syria to train the rebels so that nobody would ever find out about this. The rebels were sold all these American weapons and military equipment. They were sold somewhere in the Balkans by our Jordanian or Saudi allies. And then all the weapons were shipped to the rebels in Syria, who were then trained secretly by our CIA, who were on the ground. Look it up. It's called Operation Timber Sycamore. It was finally revealed in 2016. It had Hillary Clinton's fingerprints all over it because she was Secretary of State. It had General David Petraeus's fingerprints on it. And of course, Barack Obama and who was the vice president? Oh, Joe Biden, our vice president, also had his fingerprints all over Operation Sycamore, which violates international law as well as the American Constitution. It is against the War Powers Act. It violates Congress's war making authority when our commander in chief, Barack Obama, works in secret with our CIA and General David Petraeus to fund and train rebel soldiers around the world, like in Syria. We didn't find out about this until three years later when the rebels we were training that equipment fell into the hands of the newly formed ISIS. I'll get to that in a second. When we fund wars, when we fund rebels, Congress must authorize this. It cannot be secret. It violates our Constitution. Many of you don't remember Contragate. This was during Reagan's second term, where Co Colonel Oliver North, working under Ronald Reagan, authorized the sales of weapons to Iran in exchange for the release of some of our hostages being held in Beirut by Iranian-linked paramilitary groups. The profits from the sale of those weapons were then turned over to the Contras, who were fighting to overthrow the Marxist leadership in Nicaragua. Hearings were held. This was against the law. It violated something called the Logan Act, but it just violated the Constitution. The Logan Act specified that you were not allowed to fund the Contras at all, uh, but you don't need the Logan Act uh, for this to be illegal and unconstitutional. Hearings were held. And uh, then, of course, there was a special a prosecutor which required uh, George Herbert Walker Bush to pardon everybody. Reagan lied when he said he didn't authorize the sale of weapons. He lied when he said he didn't arm the Contras. He lied and he went on national television and pleaded senility. And I'm being serious. And then when he testified in court, he pled senility. Read about this. And the Democrats decided not to impeach because Arthur Lyman, who was the Democratic Party's lead counsel on the Iran Contra Committee, said it would be unseemly to impeach two Republican presidents in a row. So they let Reagan slide. Obama should have been impeached for funneling weapons to Syria. Hillary Clinton should have been impeached as Secretary of State for funneling weapons to Syria, but she was no longer Secretary of State. She was the Democratic nominee for president when we found out about this. 
Obama kept this secret from the American people and it was never authorized by Congress. Congress wasn't in the loop. But there are still Americans who defend these stealth operations by insisting, you know, it's a dangerous world out there. And yeah, we're violating the Constitution, but we need the president and the CIA keeping us safe by working in tandem with rebel groups out there in Syria or Nicaragua to fight these secret wars to keep us safe. And you know what? I would, I would buy into that if it kept us safe. If we ever won a single secret war, which we never do, and they backfire. They always have unintended consequences like 9-11 or the Kennedy assassination. When you do things sub rosa without Congress debating, without the American people finding out about it, it always has disastrous consequences. That's why secret wars are illegal. And that's why Barack Obama and Ronald Reagan should have been impeached. We never win these secret wars. Syria, Bashar Assad, evil Bashar Assad, and he is evil. He's also still in charge of Syria, despite our funding of the rebels who wanted to topple him. It didn't work. And now we have millions who are either dead or displaced in Syria all the refugees that came out of Syria, not primarily because of America, but we contributed to the dead and displaced in Syria. Daniel Ortega, the head of the Sandinistas, who Reagan was trying to overthrow by aiding the Contras in Nicaragua, Daniel Ortega, what has it been, 40 years? He's back in charge. He's been in charge, I think, for more than a decade. And he's become a monster because the American government refuses to stop meddling in the affairs of Nicaragua. Libya, Hillary's war, is a human rights nightmare. Can you tell me who's in charge of Libya? Nobody. They don't have a government. They have several government. Then we had the not so secret wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, which created two failed states. The very, the very thing America was trying to prevent by invading Afghanistan and Iraq. The global war on terror in 2001, when it was launched, was built on the idea that terrorism arises out of failed states. And that's true. And terrorist attacks on American soil arise out of America creating those failed states. Afghanistan was a failed state partly because we armed the Mujahideen in their fight against the Soviets after the Soviets invaded Afghanistan during the late 70s when Jimmy Carter was president. And I've mentioned this on the show before, and Professor Marianne Cummings has talked about this. President Carter's national security advisor, Zbigniew Brzezinski, Mika Brzezinski's daddy, Mika Brzezinski from Morning Joe, her, her dad was Jimmy Carter's national security advisor, who insists that he helped bring down the Soviet Union. He helped the Soviet Union collapse by tricking the Soviets into invading Afghanistan so the Soviets could get bogged down in their own quagmire-like Vietnam. And before he died, Zbigniew Brzezinski wanted his parade. He wanted his parade for tricking the Soviets into invading Afghanistan. No, no mention of all the, the, the dead people who... Uh, because the Soviets invaded. And he doesn't like to talk, he's dead now, but uh, he never mentioned how the, the uh, 
CIA armed the Mujahideen to fight the Soviets in Afghanistan. The Mujahideen, they were all foreign fighters coming to liberate Afghanistan. They came from Saudi Arabia. The Mujahideen was where Osama bin Laden got started. Osama bin Laden from, Afghan from Saudi Arabia. And then all the weapons we gave Osama bin Laden were used to kill Americans eventually overseas and eventually Osama bin Laden ordered his soldiers to fly planes into our buildings on 9-11. All that money, all those weapons, all those dead people around the world because America thought they could help Libya, Syria, Afghanistan, and Iraq. We made those countries and America worse. They're not better off, they are worse. And it's created what the CIA calls, quote unquote, blowback, blowback. It's where the CIA foolishly thinks, or the president of the United States, foolishly thinks it's doing something good by conducting a secret war or secretly funding rebels uh, to overthrow Bashar Assad in Syria. And the blowback is discovering that the American weapons we gave to the rebels end up in the hands of the newly formed ISIS in Syria. And so the blowback is America now, instead of funding the rebels in Syria, has to go in to Syria to fight ISIS. And that prompts Vladimir Putin to go in to support Bashar Assad and Syria. And suddenly, Syria is now a proxy war between the United States and Russia. That is what happened during the Obama administration. Syria became a small proxy war between America and Russia because we were involved. We were helping the rebels. And it was a proxy war that Vladimir Putin won and America lost. We lost in Syria. Bashar Assad is still in charge. We lost. And the message Vladimir Putin took away from all this is that America is weak. He beat us in Syria. America pulled out of Afghanistan. We pulled out of Syria. So Putin thinks I'm free to invade Ukraine because America in the end is all talk and no action. So that's the blowback from secretly arming rebels in, in Syria. That's the blowback from tampering with Syria. We lost, nothing good came from it. There are consequences to arming rebels in a complicated civil war like Syria. There are consequences to overthrowing or trying to overthrow governments. We never succeed in overthrowing governments. Maybe Iran, maybe Chile, but we rarely succeed in overthrowing governments. And the blowback from overthrowing Chile and Iran Need I remind you of what the blowback was from those misadventures? The CIA worked with the mafia and the Cuban exiles to try to overthrow Fidel Castro in Cuba repeatedly. We committed crimes. We tried everything. The blowback from that misadventure was Fidel Castro quickly turning to the Soviets for protection, which precipitated the Cuban Missile Crisis, which some say almost triggered the end of civilization. The blowback from the late Eisenhower administration, early Kennedy administration, the blowback from tampering, waging secret wars against Cuba, the blowback was an empowered mafia working with the CIA, feeling that it was entitled to do whatever it wanted here in America because the mafia had become America's secret overseas paramilitary intelligence gathering 
organization. And that is why FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover refused to acknowledge the existence of a mafia. J. Edgar Hoover refused to acknowledge that the mafia existed because the mafia was part of the CIA, was working with the FBI. Since the time of Roosevelt, the American government has relied on the mafia. And they became, the mafia said, they were able to claim during the Kennedy administration that they were as big as U.S. Steel because they were a multinational corporation, the mafia, and they could move elections. The mafia got Jack Kennedy elected. And the blowback for Kennedy was getting his head blown back into the left, blown back into the left. That's why Kennedy was assassination, assassinated. The mafia wanted what was coming to them. Kennedy refused. So he got what was coming to him. At least that's what the mafia decided. And anyone who doesn't think the mafia and the CIA didn't know about the plot to assassinate President Kennedy, well, uh, you need to read up about how the CIA worked with the mafia and how the mafia was protected, not just by the judges and the local police chiefs and mayors, but by the people in the upper echelons of our corporate controlled federal government from the time of World War II. We all know that Meyer Lansky and Lucky Luciano worked with Franklin Roosevelt to protect American ports because the mafia controlled the stevedores. And so the mafia claimed they were patriotic and they promised Roosevelt to keep an eye out for spies. German submarines promised there would be no labor trouble during the war. What many of us don't know is the role of Frank Costello, Lucky Luciano and Meyer Lansky, the role that they played in the lead up to the invasion of Sicily and Italy in 1943. The War Department under Franklin Roosevelt, the OSS, which was the uh, CIA's uh, predecessor, uh, they had frequent contacts with the mafia for advice and assistance on how to wage war in Sicily and Italy. I bring this up only because when you talk about war crimes committed by Vladimir Putin, you must never forget that all war is not only a crime, it is primarily fought by criminals. Criminals. Criminals who commit atrocities or soldiers who witness those atrocities and become criminals by refusing to report those atrocities. Criminals during war become our allies. The mafia was our ally in World War II, in Vietnam. It was our ally in trying to overthrow Castro because war is a crime. And if war is a crime, then war is only fought by criminals. It's only waged by criminals. We need criminals to help fight our wars because all war is a crime. You cannot declare war without it being an international crime of lies and massaging the truth. And war zones are breeding grounds for more crimes, not just crimes against humanity. War zones are conventions for criminals. They are conventions for criminals, mobsters, paramilitary groups. Betsy DeVoe's brother, Eric Prince, who founded Blackwater, they all flock to war zones to exchange ideas, to exchange weapons, and most importantly, drugs and cash. Did I mention drugs? Did I mention that all war zones involve the exchange of drugs? Afghanistan, Vietnam were also about the opium 
the heroin trade, the CIA, in order to placate rural areas, goes out and makes peace with the opium dealers. They did that during Vietnam. They did that in Afghanistan. Professor of history, Alfred W. McCoy from the University of Wisconsin-Madison writes in The Guardian, this was four years ago. This is what he wrote in The Guardian, Professor of History, Alfred W. McCoy from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. This is what he wrote in The Guardian. Quote, throughout its three decades in Afghanistan, Washington's military operations have succeeded only when they fit reasonably comfortably into Central Asia's illicit traffic in opium, and they suffered when they failed to complement it. America's military does well when we work in tandem with Central Asia's illicit tra uh, drug traffic in opium. And when we take on the opium traffickers, we fail. He writes that the CIA has been working with the opium trade for 40 years in Afghanistan. We have a 40 year history with opium growers in Afghanistan. And that's why 40% of all our heroin comes from Afghanistan. The other 60% comes from the Sackler family, or at least it starts with the Sackler family. But then when Americans can't get a legal prescription, uh, we turn to heroin. In order for America to be in Afghanistan, it's CIA makes sure that our soldiers are kept safe. And the way they are kept safe is by guaranteeing the opium trade, because the opium trade is what keeps the rural farmers in Afghanistan going. And you can't sell heroin outside of Afghanistan unless the Afghan government gets a cut, provides safety. So unless the CIA assists the opium trade, the people, the growers, as well as the Afghan government, especially the Afghan intelligence agencies, which profit off the opium trade, they are going to fight us. They're going to kill our soldiers. So the intelligence agencies in Afghanistan and Pakistan are part of the heroin trade, working in tandem with our CIA, with our military. And so we fight a war on drugs back home in America by locking up people of color for dealing a gram of crack cocaine while we are literally funding the, the production of hundreds of tons of heroin to be sent here to America. That is the blowback. The blowback is heroin addiction in America. We commit the crime of invading a country. Then in order to protect our troops, we make an alliance with the heroin dealers who are criminals. And then we funnel money to the heroin dealers and the intelligence officers in Afghanistan and Pakistan who work with these heroin growers and dealers in order to ship 40% of America's heroin supply to America. This is what we did in Vietnam. Our CIA is part of every component of the heroin trade. We partly finance everything that has to do with heroin addiction in America, except treatment for heroin addiction. Yes, we, we have no problem paying the opium growers for protection so they don't attack our soldiers. We, we pay off their intelligence agencies who get a cut of the heroin trade. We pay them all. We pay for everything except treating American citizens for the heroin addiction. Because if Americans no longer are addicted to heroin, then who's going to buy the heroin from Afghanistan? We want to prop up the opium trade so they don't kill our soldiers. All war is a crime. All war is a crime. And all war is fought for, with, and by criminals. All war, 
all American wars involved crime or war crimes, crimes that turned Americans into heroin and, of course, crack addicts. You can't forget crack. You see, the blowback from keeping the Soviets out of Central and South America was blow. The blowback was blow, specifically crack cocaine. There were rumors that John Kerry, when he was a senator, looked into. There were rumors that the CIA was dealing cocaine. And then John Kerry decided, you know what? I want to run for president. Let's forget about this. There were rumors that Contragate's Colonel Oliver North was helping to fund the Contras by dumping crack cocaine into American ghettos. Ooh, crazy conspiracy theory, David, right? That's I'm trafficking in crazy conspiracy theories that are just as crazy as, you know, trafficking drugs to African Americans in the ghettos. That would be insane for me to believe that's true. Many very paranoid journalists and Americans say there is no coincidence that crack the crack epidemic of the 80s coincided with Ronald Reagan's illegal support for the Contras. But of course, that would just be a conspiracy theory. Nobody, no president could be that evil. Well, yes, they can. Yes, they can. You know, somehow we're convinced by mass media that all our neighbors are serial killers. And then if I ride the subway, I'm going to get my throat slashed and pushed into an oncoming train. But I cannot imagine that Ronald Reagan would be OK with dumping crack cocaine into the ghetto. That that's a bridge too far. I'm surrounded by serial killers. I can't walk the streets of New York without getting my throat slashed by a person of color. But the CIA Nobody's that evil. Nobody would dump crack cocaine into the ghetto. Uh, Ronald Reagan authorized the sale of weapons to Iran, thinking he would free the hostages. He thought that was a noble idea. He thought that was defensible. Why did Iran need weapons? To kill Iraqis. How noble is that? He was okay with that. Iran was fighting Iraq. That war went from 1980 till 1988, ended in a stalemate, as most wars usually do. Nobody won. Most wars, nobody wins. And we took a side. We were on the side of Iraq. We were on the side of Iraq. Remember Rumsfeld shaking hands with Saddam Hussein? We were on the side of Iraq, but we sold weapons to Iran even though we were on the side of Iraq. Something like 500,000 Iraqi soldiers died in that war. More than 100,000 civilians died. I've heard it's as much as a million for a stalemate. But Reagan thought he could justify trading arms for hostages as a noble pursuit. This was noble, selling weapons to Iran to free our hostages in Beirut because a few American lives in Beirut are worth millions of lives in Iraq. That's how we measure the body count. That's how we do the body count. And then uh, Oliver North, with orders from Reagan, overcharged for these weapons we sold to the Iranians. And the profits were illegally sent to the Contras who were trying to overthrow Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua, he's still in charge. An army of 100,000 Nicaraguan men, the Contras, who once worked for the brutal Somoza regime, which was corrupt and murderous, just like Batista in Cuba. They, Somoza, like Batista, created all the conditions for a Marxist to rise to power, that Marxist being Daniel Ortega, who led the Sandinistas, who took over. But, you know, Reagan was OK with funding the Contras and thousands died in that civil war. He was OK with all of that. The death, the destruction, the lies, the deceit, the shitting on the American Constitution. We're all willing to accept that Oliver North 
and the Reagan administration and George Herbert Walker Bush, who was the vice president who helped orchestrate some of this, they were all okay with giving weapons to Iran, which would kill Iraqis. He was okay with funding the Contras to kill Nicaraguans. But somehow they drew, they drew the line on dumping crack cocaine into American ghettos to get African-American males addicted to the stuff. That's too much for them. That, they, they would never do that. Do you honestly believe the CIA, our military, the Reagan administration was too moral to pull off something like that? They were, ra they were a racist administration. The Reagan administration was a racist administration. They would have no problem getting people in the ghetto addicted to crack cocaine. Ron Reagan Jr. recently said that by contemporary standards, his father, Ronald Reagan, was a racist. We know that. He launched his campaign in Philadelphia, Mississippi, the site of one of the KKK's most infamous murders of civil rights activists. He launched his campaign there because it was a message to the Southern white voter, I got your back. Reagan won the old Confederacy. And all the racism in the Republican Party starts with Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan wouldn't lose a minute of sleep over black people getting addicted to crack cocaine. Learn about Free Ray Freeway Rick Ross, the convicted drug dealer who helped dump crack cocaine into the ghettos back in the early 80s. Learn about Oscar Glendone. He was a Nicaraguan drug trafficker who sold the crack cocaine to Freeway Rick Ross for Freeway to sell in the ghetto. Blandon, as he is called, worked for the Somoza regime as the director of agriculture. So when Somoza was overthrown by the Sandinistas, Blandon moved to America and used his connections with the drug dealers. He was secretary of agriculture under Somoza. He knew all the drug dealers and he used his connections to funnel cocaine to freeway Rick Ross and use those proceeds to fund the Contras the rebels trying to overthrow the Marxist leadership of Nicaragua, the Sandinistas. Blandon conveniently was a Contra. He knew where the, the drug dealers were. He was a Contra. And Reagan called him a freedom fighter. The, the Contras were freedom fighters. It is believed that Blandon, former agricultural minister of Nicaragua under the brutal Somoza regime, got the cocaine and uh, gave it to Freeway Rick Ross, who dumped it in the inner city. And the proceeds from that sale to Rick, Freeway Rick Ross were used uh, to fund the Contras. The Contras were being funded by illegal American arms sales to Iran. So think about it. Why wouldn't they also be funded by illegal cocaine sales to African-American drug dealers who would get black people addicted to crack as if Ronald Reagan would care that black people are, are getting addicted to crack? Blandon secretly was working with our DEA. This is the former agricultural minister who funnels cocaine to freeway Rick Ross Turns out he's also working with our DEA. And so he had immunity from prosecution because he was helping the DEA bust Freeway Rick Ross, who ended up going to prison for dealing crack cocaine. So the entire crack epidemic of the 80s was nothing more than a gigantic sting operation. This is how the Reagan administration sleeps at night. It was a sting operation to lock up Freeway Rick Ross. That's how the CIA... Oliver North, the Reagan administration justified dumping crack cocaine into the inner city. It was to fund the Contras and lock up one of the country's biggest drug dealers because the guy giving the cocaine to our country's biggest drug dealer was working with the DEA and also happened to be a Contra. It was all part of our fictitious war on drugs. We gave Freeway Rick Ross the cocaine he gets the inner city addicted to crack. And then the Contras, according to the DEA, are the heroes because they're supplying Freeway 
Rick Ro- Ross with the cocaine, and it serves as a honey trap to lock up uh, the biggest drug dealer in America, right behind uh, the CIA. Uh, if you think this didn't happen, then you also think police don't shoot unarmed black men in the in the back. Uh, you have an entire prison industry built on free labor, which is why crack cocaine had stiffer sentencing guidelines than regular cocaine. Crack was a black drug. Cocaine is a white drug. And our prison system needs black men behind bars to finish the job that the Civil War interrupted, which was keeping black people working for free. I recommend that you read Dark Alliance by Pulitzer Prize winning reporter Gary Webb. Some of what I just told you is from his book, and none of it has been disproven. It is a well-researched book, and nobody has ever been able to prove that any of it is factually incorrect. But the pressure came down so hard on Gary Webb's newspaper, the San Jose Mercury News, they fired him anyway. They never said his reporting was false. All they could fire him on was they didn't approve of his style of writing. They called it simplistic. And they didn't want simplistic writing. They want incredibly simplistic writing, writing that is essentially a word for word statement from the DEA and the CIA stating categorically that the American government would never sell drugs in the inner city to fund the Contras. Yes, that's believable. We would sell weapons to fund the con fund the Contras. We have no problem with selling weapons that kill people, but you know, we admitted to that because we were caught red-handed. But selling drugs to fund the Contras? Never. Never. That's an impossibility. I can't imagine that happening. Bullshit. Gary Webb uh ended up committing suicide he committed suicide three times once when he exposed the connection between the crack cocaine epidemic in our cities and the war against the sandinistas in nicaragua that was the first time he committed suicide the second time he committed suicide was with a gun twice he committed suicide twice with a gun and oh, what a suicide that was. Webb was found dead in 2004. He had two gunshot wounds to the head. Two. He committed suicide with a gun twice. It was ruled a suicide by the Sacramento County Coroner's Office. And it makes sense because when you're blowing your head off, you always remember to add another shot just for safety to make sure you got it all. The point I'm making is all war is a crime because war creates crime. War is based on a crime. You can't fight wars without forging dark alliances with criminals. And those criminals turn ordinary Americans into criminals. And these crimes beget more crimes and crimes beget wars, which beget crimes. And the virtuous cycle keeps rolling along. It keeps rolling along. We've barely moved out of Afghanistan and already we're pivoting to Ukraine. And Joe Biden has the gall to call Vladimir Putin a war criminal. Because Joe Biden is shocked and appalled that atrocities are taking place in Ukraine. It's shocking. And that appears to be how Joe Biden is going to play this whole thing. You have Vladimir Putin, who I hope is losing this thing, whatever losing means. We right now, supposedly, if you can believe the Western press, he's cornered like a terrified rat with enough nuclear fuel to wipe out the world. And our president is calling him a war criminal. Is that going to stop the fighting in Ukraine by calling Vladimir Putin a war criminal? Don't you want to offer Vladimir Putin an easy way out with dignity? Don't you want to offer him a graceful exit so Ukrainians stop dying? 
uh, it's becoming increasingly apparent to me that Joe Biden doesn't want peace. He wants to see Vladimir Putin defeated. I hope I'm wrong. But it seems to me Biden's response to the invasion of Ukraine is not about minimizing the suffering in Ukraine. It's not about the minimizing of Ukrainian suffering or the, the deaths of their soldiers or the Russian soldiers who reportedly are also victims in this. Many are refusing to fire their weapons. Uh, they find themselves sitting ducks in these tanks. Uh, Biden's talk is Putin must go away. That's what we're hearing as we go into the second month of this atrocity. The talk is Putin must go away. And so we negotiate a peace with whom? Now, maybe, and again, uh, I'm rooting for my country uh, and I'm rooting for Biden. I, if that happens, if Putin goes away, then historians will forget all the dead bodies, the 5 million refugees, and Biden will go down in history as the guy who brought down Putin. And the world will be better off because the world will be better off without Putin. That's how history and most Americans will remember all this, assuming Putin is overthrown or meets the same fate as so many of his generals. We will forget conveniently the thousands of dead and the millions displaced. But what if it's a stalemate like so many wars, like Iraq versus Iran? What if it's a stalemate, like our war on drugs? Or what if we lose, like in Iraq and Afghanistan, or Nicaragua and Cuba? We lost all those wars, the, the ones that we knew about and the ones we didn't know about. Even worse, what if Vladimir Putin has a different definition of victory than what the West, than how the West? What if Vladimir Putin defines victory differently than how we define victory. What if Vladimir Putin learned how to survive from his ally in Syria, Bashar Assad, who is still in charge? Assad won. It took more than 10 years. How many hundreds of thousands, if not million dead Syrians, millions of refugees, millions of refugees, entire cities demolished in Syria, but Assad won. He used chemical weapons, never got taken before the ICC. America tried to overthrow him. We failed. Putin helped Assad. Assad won. What if Putin's definition of victory is what his friend Assad accomplished in Syria? What if Putin is Assad? Forget nuclear weapons. Let's assume that's off the table. Let's just assume Putin is fighting this war, taking a page from his friend Bashar Assad's playbook. Putin is bringing in mercenaries from Syria, reportedly. He's paying them seven grand a month to go fight in Ukraine. What if this war just goes on and on and on and on, and it's a war of attrition? And it goes on and on and on, like in Syria. And economic sanctions that we're imposing only destroy the Russian economy. They end up killing the children of Russia, but nobody in the military, because that's what usually happens with economic sanctions. What if Brazil, India, China, Israel, and other countries decide to trade with Russia? What if the EU and America only represent 1 billion of the 7 billion people on this planet and Russia finds its way around the economic sanctions to fund their war? They'll fund the war, but not the people of Russia. The people of Russia, they will die. They will suffer. What if this goes the way of Syria? What if it goes the way of of practically every war America has fought since World War II. On and on and on. What will the blowback from this one be? 
Right now you have Ukraine flooded with American weapons. Whose hands will those weapons end up in this time? Will it be the Syrian mercenaries? Will the weapons be brought back to Syria and then end up in Iraq or Beirut? Will they end up in the hands of Russian soldiers? The Azov Battalion fighting for Zelensky? The neo-Nazis who are fighting for Ukraine? Will they end up with Putin's Wagner Group, his own paramilitary? What is the blowback from Ukraine? It won't be good. And it's making me question why Joe Biden seems to be fanning the embers. The only way, President Biden, to stop this war is identical to the only way to stop it from ever starting, by promising Vladimir Putin what is already going to happen, and that is Ukraine will never join NATO. You could have told Vladimir Putin before he invaded that Ukraine was never going to join NATO. That might have stopped the invasion. Instead, America, all we said was, he's going to invade. He's going to invade. There's nothing we can do about it. Really? How about doing everything you possibly can to stop what is happening right now? What if telling Vladimir Putin, we promise that Ukraine will never join NATO. What if that stopped the invasion? Seems to me it'd be worth a try since Ukraine is never joining NATO. It's astounding to me how little America has offered Vladimir Putin in terms of olive branches before the invasion of Ukraine and during. It's almost like Biden fancies himself as a big new Brzezinski trying to trick Putin into taking the bait and invading Ukraine. So Putin falls the same way the Soviet Union fell, stuck in a quagmire. Is that something? Is that a chess move you want to be proud of? Is that really that smart? Mika Brzezinski, was your father really that wise? Did that really turn out so great? Tricking the Soviets into invading Afghanistan? Is this something we want to take pride in, that we tricked Vladimir Putin into invading Ukraine? Uh, I hope I'm wrong, and I always am. But it sure feels like the Biden administration wants to prolong this war. War must be prevented and must be stopped. Here in America, war is pornography. I was visiting my mother who kept turning the channels and every news station we landed on kept reporting about the atrocities that the Russian soldiers are committing in Ukraine. CNN, all night last night, CNN was tantalizing its viewers by saying pornographically, we got to warn you, you're about to see graphic pictures. And then they added, but the world must bear witness. That's how CNN justified their war pornography. The world must bear witness. Yes, CNN America is always okay with the world bearing witness to atrocities committed overseas, so long as we're not bearing witness to the atrocities committed overseas that America is responsible for. We are never allowed to see our own atrocities. That's too disturbing for the children. And that's why Colin Powell moved up the ranks so quickly. He covered up the My Lai massacre. All war is a crime. And it turns out CNN, our media, they are 
accessories after the fact. If you know a crime has been committed and you don't report it, you are an accessory after the fact. What Putin is doing in Ukraine is an atrocity and we have to bring an end to it yesterday by offering olive branches to him to stop it by making him think he has a graceful exit it sure feels it sure feels like this war is just getting started it sure feels that there are a lot of people here in the west who like to test our weapons who like to see the satellite imagery to see what Russia's got. We've got military analysts creaming their pants over this war because this is not a war game. It's an actual war. And it's not just the military that's creaming their pants to see what weapons work on the ground. We also have the neoliberal order creaming their pants over these economic sanctions because the neoliberal world order needs these economic sanctions because the neoliberal world order is terrified. For the first time since the 1930s, the American people, the world is questioning capitalism. The neoliberal world order is up against the ropes. And uh, if it can get Russia to pull out of Ukraine by strangling the Russian economy, then the neoliberal world order can lay claim to victory and say, see, we made the entire world addicted to our money, our debt, our values, our stuff. And we don't need to fight wars. We can just cut rogue nations off and they will bend to our will. And, and we can claim that the neoliberal world order is an instrument of peace as long as we conveniently ignore all the dead Ukrainians killed in this war, all the Ukrainians displaced from this war, all the dead Russians, the soldiers, the dead Russian soldiers, and of course, all the dead Russians who will starve to death from the neoliberal world orders, economic sanctions against Russia. And don't forget all the African nations that are about to starve because Ukrainian wheat can no longer be harvested. No, the neoliberals will sell this as a victory for their control over the world order. And most Americans will be stupid enough to buy into it the same way we bought into 500,000 dead Iraqis, 500,000 dead children and women from Madeleine Albright's economic sanctions, which succeeded in killing 500,000 Iraqis and that's it. Saddam Hussein was not toppled because when you have economic sanctions, nobody has the food, the medicine, or the energy to rise up and topple the autocrat. Hussein remained in power, so we had to invade, and millions died and were displaced. So Biden is right. Putin has to go. I think Biden does too. And so does this entire war-based economy, including our media, which gins up war by selectively deciding what we can see and what we can't. You wanna show us Russian atrocities? Then when we go to war, you better show us the American soldiers coming home in coffins. And I wanna see their grieving families because in the last war, we were never allowed to see that. We are not allowed to see our wounded soldiers or the atrocities we commit overseas. Putin has to go and our war economy has to go. We will be back after this. Traveling light, got everything I need. Got a little bottle of wool light and a little bag of weed. Overseas. To solve Putin has to go. Because I really like to read. I'm traveling light. I'm a creature of the road. Got no regrets. Gave up. 
up my postal code and cigarettes. I'm doing much better with a touch of Tourette's. I'm traveling light. <laughs> Just need a clean room in a Motel 6. Not too close to downtown, but not out in the sticks. I need my pen and teller magic kit so I can do my tricks. Got my favorite pillow, which I call Mr. Fluffy. Four kinds of allergy pills in case I get stuffy. A pound of Epsom salts, cause my ankles get puffy. I'm traveling light. I got two pairs of socks and shorts in my little valise. A couple of passports and my sex doll Denise. I'm staying real quiet so they don't call the police. I'm traveling light. I need my sedatives and my antipsychotics. A high speed parallax motor, cause I'm into robotics. And my little red speedo, I like to do aquatics. I'm traveling late. Got my CPAP machine and my George Foreman grill. A copy of Lolita and my little blue pills. A Navajo blanket. I get a chill, I'm traveling light. Got my margarita mix and my rusty old blender. A fifth of tequila in case I go on a bender. My attorney's number in case I want to change my gender, I'm traveling light. In case I have some visitors For breeze if I'm really stinky A Polaroid in case I get kinky My Jesus bobblehead And my Star Wars bed spread I'm traveling light I got my rabbi costume And my portable dark room My hair plug lotion And my expensive wrinkle cream My Emmy statue For my self-esteem I'm traveling light my podcast mixer and a fancy microphone, my exercise bike so I have a place to hang my pants, my very valuable Hummel collection, a menorah made of fish heads, a Christmas tree, I like to keep my options open, don't you know, a shoe shine kit, a skill saw, a crossword book, a large supply of mechanical pencils, a year's worth of New York magazines I've been trying to get around to read. Some scripts that I've been tweaking for those people in L.A. And my end- so sad, David, when the kid named after you turns out to be such a disappointment. I tried to get Don Jr. to switch names with Ivanka. They wouldn't do it. I wanted Ivanka to be Donald Jr., but Jared wouldn't allow it. He didn't want to be married to someone named Don Jr. And Don Jr. fought it tooth and nail, too. He wanted to keep the name. He thought it meant that he'd have to be married to Jared. We tried to explain it to him, said it's just a name. We got a professional name swapper to explain it to him, but he didn't get it. He didn't budge. He said, I want to, I'm angry. I want to kill an elephant. Not a bright boy. (laughs) Bad namesake, bad, terrible namesake, like Fred, like Fab Five Fred. Yeah, that's not nice to talk about your older brother, Fred, that way. Okay, well, listen, David, his daughter has been very unfair to me. Very unfair. Very unfair. Nasty woman, nasty woman. Very nasty. Sad, sad, nasty. But let's talk about Dr. Mary Trump. She has a PhD in in clinical psychology, Mr. Trump. Psychology, psychology. You know, I've never been to a shrink, David. You've never been to a shrink. Never, never been to a shrink, David. That is hard to believe. 
I know, right? Because I'm so, I'm so well adjusted. I amaze people by how well adjusted I am. No quirks, no anxiety, no paranoia. I took a well adjusted test just a couple of years ago, David, when I was president. I got an A plus. Most doctors said I was the most well adjusted president in history. Doctors were amazed. Every doctor I meet is amazed, amazed. They always want me to meet their psychiatrist friends because they say they've never seen a man as well as adjusted as Trump. They all want to study Trump. Every shrink wants to examine me. They want to learn the secrets of my well adjustedness. <laughs> you're the, yes, you're the exemplar of mental health. Every doctor, David, I meet, everyone wants me to go to a shrink. I mean, they want to study me, I guess. They, when I was a kid, doctors told my parents that I had a fascinating brain, David. It would be a shame not to share it with the psychological and psychiatric community, David, but we decided against it. I'm incredible. I'm, I am the most well-adjusted president ever. No imaginary enemies. I'm loving and caring and filled with grace. That means I can share with others the divine gift of salvation, David. You probably don't know what grace means because you were raised by the money counters. I love oh, those people, the money counters. I love them. I love I, I, them. That's a nice thing to say, Mr. Why, I, what, I called you a money counter. I love, I love the money counters. My daughter became one. We need you people. I'm not sure that's that's you're perpetuating a stereotype. David, what are you talking about? The money counters have no bigger friend than Donald Trump. Can we talk no about your friend? Weisselberg, right, is a money yeah. counter. <laughs> Chief financial officer of my company. Terrific money counter. Wouldn't flip. They arrested him, but he won't talk. They want him to flip, but he's not a rat. He's not a rat, David. He just looks like one with that nose. Uh, everything is going wrong today. Everything, and now I see jo John Ross is here, but you're not on the bill. When did you? When did you? I I, I didn't. Uh, you you should uh, communicate with your uh, offspring. I, I yeah. got I got an email and said, "Do you, uh, David need somebody at six? And I I said, uh, "Okay." And so, but look, I I don't need to hang around. I will. Uh, well, let's do this. Let's do this. Go ahead. I'm having there. There is somebody. Uh, my mother isn't feeling well, so I. I oh, I'm sorry to hear that. So, uh, uh, so I had a. So it's been. Uh, if you saw the first five minutes of the show, you can, and I can all the equipment. So I, and I have to go back and visit my mother. And uh, so I'm a little off today. Do Here's what to I, go, do you want me to go visit your mother? Uh, I remember what happened last time you visited her. Here's what I want to do. March 31st, 2022. Yes, on your you. It's okay. the first five minutes of this show were an absolute disaster. I, what is the date here? Let me just put it on here. Uh, April, today's the 4th. So here's what I want to do. I need help. I want Jason and you and Dan to join me and, and help me get through the next 30 minutes as my friends. Okay? I don't know that you need that, but I... I need I, Okay. I'm, I'm asking for help because I... So let's do this. Uh, let me bring in first uh, Dan Frankenberger, who is the quiz meister... I believe it's I Fra think, I, I think it's Frankenberger. Dan Frankenberger. Berger. Bergder. Berger. We're gonna we're gonna do the quiz. I don't know what it's about. And then we're going to I wanna get your I know you have something to say. I wanna get to find out what you have to say. And then we'll bring in Jason and we'll find out what's on this is revolution and we'll get through the next thirty minutes with our friendships still intact. So let us now go to uh, Rochester, 
Hello there, Dan Frankenberger. Oh, Rochester. <laughs> okay, your your mic is not working, Dan. Mike, okay, so so your your mic is not working. And we had this problem. So can you can you hear this? I can hear you now, yes. Okay. I got rid of the mic and I'm just using the laptop. Well, I have a quiz. Um and it is based on magic because on March 24th in 1874, it was Harry Houdini's birthday. Okay. And this was the quiz from last week, which you didn't get to do. So this is the March 24th quiz. Right. Okay. So let's bring in Jason because he's a magical person. Uh, and Jason? Can you okay. hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, cool. Are you in Mexico? Hello. I am in Mexico. I'm at home. So we'd like to call it home here in Mexico. Okay. So this is how we're going to do things today. Uh, I'm having family issues, so I need uh, to get back on schedule here. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a quiz. Then we're going to check in with John Ross. Because I know he wants to comment. Look how pissed off John is at me. This is pretend. That, let me ask you a question, John. Pretend we just met. Yeah. If, 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 if you didn't know me since 1983, two. What would you be doing now? If I didn't know you, I, yeah. I if you just met me. If I just met you, wow. I I don't know how to unring that bell. That is, <laughs> that is but, like. The cracked Liberty Bell and, and an air raid siren uh, all in one. I don't know how to undo that. Pretend just for today that we just met. Well, that would be better for you. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think you would probably have less resentment. I would. Us. But if, if I listened to that whole opening, I think I would have gotten up to speed with the resentment. <laughs> You're asked, my question to you is, what if this podcast goes on and on and on? Because I get a feeling it's just getting started. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, uh, Dan Frankenberg, let, let me put uh, some money in the kitty, right? That's a lot of money in the kitty. And... Uh, the three of us will compete to see who knows more about Harry Houdini. The topic is magic, so it's not necessarily Houdini. But we have uh, six questions, oh, and they're all multiple choice. Okay, so we'll start with Jason. Okay, Jason will go first on the first question. So the first question is, in 1983, which magician appeared to make the Statue of Liberty disappear on live television? Was it David Devant? using helicopters and a huge curtain? Was it David Blaine using camera tricks? Was it David Copperfield using a giant screen? Or was it David Feldman using his prison wallet? <laughs> My what? My prison what? Wallet. My prison wallet? Yes, sir. So you have to pick one of those, Jason. Oh, I, I missed the question. I think it's just breaking up. All I know is that you were using your butthole for something. <laughs> oh, that's what a prison wallet is? Oh, I didn't know that's what a prison wallet meant. Finally, this show is educational. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a prison wallet, man. It's a I'll, I'll read the question one more time for you, Jay. No, I'm just, um, I, 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 I want to go to Italy because they have a lot of pickpockets. So, <laughs> you want them to pick that hemorrhoid out? <laughs> okay. All right. In oh. 1983, which magician appeared to make uh. the Statue of Liberty disappear on live television? Was it David? Oh, Devon? David Copperfield. Okay. Jason David Copperfield. Susan, David Copperfield. So now it's, uh, who's going to be next? Uh, Feldman, you're next. 
Well, I, I by, by his certitude, I, I'm going to have to say I agree. I, I, was, I, I thought Donald Trump, but he's not a magician. He tried to make the Statue of Liberty disappear. Uh, so I'm going to agree with Jason. Have you, do you know how it was done? No. Right, it's cool how it was done. There was a whole thing about it. They, they uh, did a little documentary. It's pretty cool. It was David Copperfield, and it was very cool. He sat the people on a, they didn't know, it was a rotating thing, and it had these screens on the side, and they had two helicopters lighting it up, uh, right? And so they dropped the thing down, and then the thing starts to turn. So they're turning away from the Statue of Liberty, but the curtains are going with them and the helicopters are moving just a little bit. So they think they're still looking in that same spot and they drop the curtain and it's gone. So it's pretty cool. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. What is the correct answer? David Copperfield. It was on All national right. TV. Yeah. So I'm winning three to one. I'm winning three to one. Question number two, uh, Feldman is first. This is for John Ross. No, I'm going clockwise on my screen. You're next. Oh, matter. okay. Feldman's first. Here we go. Uh, this is more of witchcraft type of magic. So which direction is associated with the element of water? Is it upwards, west, north, or the golden stream? I think that's a, another prison wallet joke. <laughs> the direction of water. Which direction is associated with the element of water? Well, I have to disqualify myself because I've been married to several witches. <laughs> Not my first, second, or third wife, but uh, uh, when I just uh, I, I I have to disqualify myself because Group Captain Mandrake gave the answer in the chat room and I accidentally saw it. So I'm going to uh, beg out of this and give myself a zero. All right, John Ross. Well, I, I, I saw something in the chat room too. Um, so I, I yeah. but I didn't let's, know. Let's give this question. Let's give it to Jason. Yep. Yeah, give it to Jason. Give One point for Miles. It is West. It's that West. is correct. And he, Andy is correct. One point. I, I, I did. I did know that. I did actually know that because of uh, the band I was in. Um, I thought it was funny because I played like metal music, but I think the imagery around it is silly. So uh, I thought it was funny if we had a shirt with a pentagram on it. And the guy that designed it actually said that a real pentagram has to have the elements. Around it. So we had to actually look that up. That's the okay. only reason why I know that. Now, does that have anything to do with uh, the divination, you know, where they, they find the water with the... Uh... You know the fork the stick divining rod. Yeah, divining rod. Didn't uh, Joseph Smith? That was his first scam. Was doing that. <laughs> Joe Smith. Yeah, Joseph Smith. He, mm -hmm. was, he was. He was doing. That was his first scam. He had. He was like Trump. He had, like all these guys are the same. They're all just you know. He was. Like, he was. A, he was a Mormon fella from Yonkers. <laughs> he was. Was he from Yonkers, Joseph Smith? They chased him out of every town he went to. My By favorite. Way, my favorite Joseph Smith story was the, um, he like the guys in the town found out that he was fucking all their wives. And so they dragged him out of the woods and they were about to beat the shit out of him and like leave him for dead. And he's going, wait, 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 wait. I just I've just had a revelation from God. We all get to have as many wives as we want. And they're like, OK, let's let's hear him out, fellas. <laughs> they all walked out of the woods together and they got new plan. <laughs> wow. The Smith fella may be on to something. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Joey. <laughs> all right. Uh, question number C. Question number three. Can you hear me okay? I put had earbuds in. All yes. Good. Okay, good. Um, spiritual. Oh, who's this for? This will be for me. Were you were you first? No one cares. No, just no, just no. go. We come, come on. Spiritual groups around the world gather at full moon to perform ceremonies. What is the common feature that links these rituals? Is it invoking the spirits of the four directions? 
Is it dancing naked around a bonfire? Offering a sacrifice to the goddess of fertility? Or giving service at the hole of glory? Uh, give me the give me the choices again. They are invoking the spirits of the four directions, dancing naked around a bonfire. I'm going to say uh, dancing naked around a bonfire, or maybe that's the Bohemian Grove. But I'm going to go with dancing naked around a bonfire. Sorry, I think Ross was next in the rotation. I'll say the four directions. Okay. Mr. Miles. I should say four directions as well. Casting a circle by invoking the spirits of the four directions is correct. Ah. So who got it right and who got it wrong? Who was right and who was wrong? I was wrong. Yep, and John and Jason were both correct. I'm losing. Did I did I mention David? Did I mention I had a pagan wedding in the UK in 2013? Did I mention that? Really? Yes, totally serious. Okay. Are you well, still you... married? No, no, no. She left. No. Oh, okay. She had a nervous breakdown. Took off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm sorry to hear that. You have her phone number. <laughs> <laughs> just want to check up on her, you know. Just want to tell her, Jason says, "Give her the Joe Smith hello." <laughs> <laughs> well, Jason, Jason is first on question number four, and because of your experience, you might have an uh, inkling on this one. What yeah. German? What Germanic goddess? gave her name to the Christian celebration of Easter. Was it Estragon, Ostara, Estrega, or Hatton Rabbit? First of all, what's the fourth one? Uh, the Germanic goddess uh, Hatton Rabbit. Is it, but what's the prison reference there? It's no prison, it's <laughs> Hatton <laughs> Rabbit. <laughs> That's Clint. <laughs> What's the prison reference? Say, say, the, say the third name again. Say the third name again. Is, uh, is the third Estrega? name was Estrega. We got Estragon, Ostara, mm -hmm. Estrega, mm -hmm. or Hatton Rabbit. Uh, Estrega is my guess. I'm guessing. Feldman. I'm going to agree. I think it's Ostara. Uh, the answer is Ostara. Mr. Ross ah, is correct. Ah, Ross, wow. Ross has got them all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, I figured out how to do the score. There are three, there are three points up for grabs. This is what we'll do next time. And okay, go ahead. All right, question number five. This one, uh, Dave is first. Which magician cut Daisy Duke herself, Catherine Bach, into six pieces? did the same to Jennifer Lopez, and in 2009 saw Taylor Swift in two. Was it Lance Burton, Chris Angel, David Copperfield, or Theodore Bundy? Theodore <laughs> Bundy. I, I, I'm going to go with uh, Chris Angel. Hmm. Hmm. Mr. Ross, what do you think? I've never heard of Chris Angel, but I guess that doesn't mean anything. So uh, Lance Burton seems like a magician from a thousand years ago. Um, but I'll, I'll say Lance Burton just because I've heard of him. I'm, I'm going to have to go Lance Burton, Vegas' number one magician between the hours of uh, 1130 and 1 a.m. The answer is... David Copperfield. Oh, he did what? Two. You can't have kid David Copperfield. Oh, that's how he tricked us. That's okay. Is Meister? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Don't, don't call him the Meister for nothing. <laughs> Jason uh, is leading, but I did. But I do know who Lance Bird. Yeah. Okay. All right. The last it, question. 
Question number six. Most people are familiar with the four elements of fire, earth, water, and air, but what is considered the fifth element? Is it spirit, carbon, space, or Plutonium? Um, who, who has to answer? Uh, first up this time is John Ross. Ah, uh, Fifth Element's a really good movie, but I don't remember it. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Mm. So I'm no, going to no. say, I, I'm going to say, oh, you're not going to make a joke because of who starred in it, because it's mean. Um, I met him uh, a long time ago. Jersey. Um, boy. What's that? He was a Jersey boy. He is a Jersey boy. He was a Jersey boy. boy, but they had that place in, in Idaho, and they liked Jake a lot, and um we went and did a show in idaho for them um me and jake did anyway i'm gonna say carbon jason it's a uh, space carbon what was it again space I, I will read one? the answers again spirit carbon yeah. space mm -hmm. or plutonium uh spirit I'm going to agree with John. The correct answer is spirit. Mr. Miles. Oh. Actually, mm -hmm. uh, Jason is winning. Uh, four to, uh, I have one point. John Ross has two. And Jason is winning uh, with four. I think Jason having... has one. That was the last question. Okay, I did not enjoy that. I found nothing. Okay, before, okay, John Ross. Thank you, Dan F., quiz, the Quizmeister. Thank you. Have a good night, guys. Contact you. Uh, you can uh, send in your submissions for Community Billboard at dentfeldman at gmail.com. Fantastic. Thank you, Dan. Uh, John, uh, any thoughts about the Grammys? Uh I didn't watch the Grammys and you're probably talking about the Oscars anyway. Um, uh -huh. first, let me, let me uh, offer some of my thoughts on your, your uh, opening the Ukraine. Um, I don't know if this would work, um, but I think it's worth a try uh, to stop this war. If America were to offer Vladimir Putin, uh, Florida and Texas, um, <laughs> <laughs> can, we, can we throw in Staten Island? I think we got plenty of other places we could throw in to sweeten the deal if we need to. But all I'm saying yeah. is, this is a win-win. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that that's my thought there. Um, what did you you wanted me to talk about? Uh, what happened at the Oscars? Is that? What you wanted to well, I know you're, you are, you are, you, there's something bothering you. What is it this week? Well, there's Other always than how to do my show. Uh, well, there's always things bothering me. Uh, you know, now Katanji Brown Jackson, if you were in the Senate, uh, would you be voting to confirm her? Me? Yeah. I think so. You would? I mean, there was yeah. a lot of questions. And at no point, I still don't know whether she likes beer or not. So I don't even know what, what kind of confirmation hearing was that? I, does she or doesn't she like beer? So I have a, to me, it's a coin flip there. Right. Um, did uh, what else can I tell you? Uh, I think Clarence Thomas uh, should recuse himself from any case that has anything to do with um, the law or the US justice system <laughs> in general. I think he needs to step back because clearly right. there's a conflict there. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, uh, I, I, I initially thought that the slap was fake because, you know, these guys, they're both Hollywood multimillionaires they're part of the elite. You know they're into child trafficking and drinking baby's blood. So this is just kind of a, a you know, a distraction from all right. that. 
you know, right. so trying to throw people off the scent. But I think right. the big winner, the big winner is um, your friend uh, um, up in Canada there, Mark Breslin. Um, I think comedy club attendance is just going to spike now that people know that they're free to walk on stage and slap the comedian. I think it's a, that's a big attraction. I would be you're replacing uh, the stage with an, an octagon is what you're saying. Yeah. Well, it, you know, you ever go to the fair I, and there's somebody sitting on the thing and you, and you throw the thing and you hit the thing and it goes in the right. dunk tank. Mm -hmm. That's what comedy is right. going to be like. You just. Can, yeah. can I ask a question? Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Ross, are you a com comedian or a writer? I, I, yes, I'm, I'm a writer. I was a comedian and uh, then I stopped. I got, I got in the eighties. Yeah. In the eighties. Yeah. In the eighties, okay. yeah. I have a, I have, I have a lot of questions to ask. Uh, I've, I've had conversations with uh, Feldman's daughter about yes. comedy in the eighties about him. I would love to sit down in real life with uh, with Brother Feldman and talk to him. Uh, but um, there was a documentary ten years or so ago that uh, Jamie Kennedy put out called Heckler. I don't know if you guys remember that. I, I don't. In that documentary, he kind of asked this question about hecklers. Ultimately, uh, the question being, is a critic a heckler? But in, in the documentary, he actually shows a lot of footage of comedians not, you know, there's a, there's a hierarchy, right? The scale, some smaller, some a lot bigger. Actually getting people walking on stage, uh, one of the guys... Uh, who was playing the guitar, someone tried to take it from me, he hit someone upside the head with the guitar. I thought that was rather funny. Um, don't, don't, don't walk behind me. You, you might get fucked up. Uh, I'm a musician. It's very different than being a comic. It's very different than being a comic. In your guys' time in the 80s, which was wild for several reasons that we will keep off air, uh, did anyone ever try to walk up on stage on either one of you at any point in time? And did you ever get the need to want to punch somebody at any point in time? I just want to know outside of the whole Grammy Oscar shit. I want to know about the real D guys on back at the day. David, do you want to take that? Well, I think we should hold off on it was a guy's name Ken, Kenny. Kenny Moore. That's a whole different story. We that's a different story that we've yeah. covered. Uh but uh once in Vegas at the Tropicana, a guy approached me and uh, and he backed off. <laughs> it, yeah, I, I would say, you know, back in, in the 80s, comedy was there's was still a little bit of reverence for it. You know, there, there was a special like thing that people thought was pretty damn cool. It wasn't like everybody was a comedian. You know, now you ask a kid, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? Like a policeman, a fireman or a comedian? You know, it's like it's just a, a regular old. But it, it was it seemed more special and people had a more reverence for it. I, I was never. Of course, I was unbelievably charming. So um, <laughs> no one ever, um, you know, tried to come up on stage or attack me or anything like that. Um, I, the only one that I ever I, didn't Rick Reynolds, didn't somebody come up and. Um, the Several Lunch. times. And yeah. Yeah. The Holy City, too. I saw that. Uh, Rick, I mean, Rick would say things about Jesus that I'm Jewish and I was offended by it. Well, I mean, it was I, I, just... but even and in real life, Rick just took great pleasure in going for whatever your soft spot was, whatever you were sensitive about, and just trying to, um, you know. Nothing was out of bounds for Rick. And, if, and the more sensitive it was, the faster he would go right to it. And he would do that to audiences too. So it was inevitable that somebody would do that to him. Um, but right. no, I, I never had any, any problems. I, I'm going to be careful saying this. Most of my problems were with female hecklers. Really? Yeah. yeah. Uh, because... because you know, you, the, the idea is you you let them. I, I what happened was I decided to let the heckler win, and then move on. And uh, for some reason, 
female hecklers would get the laugh and then they would keep going after I let them get mm -hmm. the laugh. They'd move in with me, uh, they'd borrow my car and uh, just a big well, problem with the, the, the worst part, the thing about hecklers is they, for the most part, usually the vast percentage of the time, they think they're helping. They think they're making the show better. So they say something and then you make fun of them to shut them up, but it gets a huge laugh. And they think, oh, I'm like part of the show. I'll say something else. And then you say something else mean to them. And that gets another big laugh. And the thing is, you want to move on. You want to keep going with your act. You don't want to play this game. But they keep going and going and going. And, and there's kind of nothing you can do. So, And the, the biggest pieces of shit will come up to you after the show and go, oh, that was great. Wasn't that great? And you're like, you want to hit them. Yeah. I, I, I didn't understand. A friend of mine is a comedian. And he opens for Chappelle from time to time. And I didn't understand. I would see him do things, and I thought it was hilarious. Like, oh, the joke didn't hit right. The joke didn't hit right. Or I wanted a bigger laugh. And, and so I understand that comedy is something for me to watch. Um, I really do see it as, a, as an art form, especially when it comes to crowd control. I, I always appreciate crowd control. But what's interesting to me about this conversation that you guys are having when it comes to hecklers, um, I think heckling, if you will, uh, which is a very negative word um has moved on to the online sphere in the comments and, and chat sections where people definitely um feel that they are a part of the show and they don't even have to buy a ticket which is what i don't like bitch at least buy a ticket you know you go to well, the fucking and, open mic you gotta get two drinks at least and and you show your face and People, you know, yeah. you have to stand behind what you say because you're right there online. Everybody's anonymous and boy, people's courage sure goes up a lot when, <laughs> you know, they're, they're anonymous and they can it's, say it's whatever the, they it's want. The, to me, it's the same thing as heckling to me. A, lo a lot of it, not all of it. A lot of people do want to contribute to a conversation, but uh, a lot of it is just heckling. And, you know, now with that thumbs up button, you can be uh, reassured so where the heckler could yell something out and get a laugh now there's a uh, a like button on the on the negative comment so you can heckle and and get your right. dopamine rush that your your heckling is justified well what do you think if, oh, go ahead i would i just want to say my serious take on the the oscars what happened uh first of all the, you know the the uh, the offending joke is so unbelievably not offensive, even if he did know that she had alopecia, which obviously he didn't, but even if he did, I mean, to me, the, somewhere in LA, there was an executive going, well, hang on a second. What about G.I. Jane 2 starring Jada Pinkett? That's, <laughs> that's, 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 that's not a terrible idea. That'd probably make some bang. Like, it, it just was barely a comment. It wasn't even uh, and the other thing is that's been the payout window on the Oscar show for the last how many years it's been oh how rough could the host be how many rough jokes could he make making poking fun at everybody and that and everybody's trying to top everybody you know going back years and years that's just been the that's been the real coin of the realm there and he says this really nothing joke and the level of narcissism for Will Smith to just go, I'm going to get up not only in front of hundreds of people, but a billion people probably around the world. And what struck me, the casualness with which he strode up to. That's why Chris Rock stood there. and was like, he's smiling, going, hey, like, what's up, bro? He like if you were really that angry or something, you'd be like you know, like shaking and almost like running up there. He walked up there mm -hmm. like it was nothing. And he looked practiced in the art of slapping someone across the face, just hard enough to humiliate them and hurt them a little bit, but not really like leave a mark. He'd done that before. That, and, and then the fact that they gave him a standing, because, you know, I didn't watch it live. 
lost. So I watched the clips and I saw his speech and I said, oh, that must have happened first. I was so shocked to find out that he slapped him and then he gave that speech. I was and I heard that it was his PR people after the slap. They just went into high octane alert and started. Going, <laughs> OK, this is it. It's you're the protector. You protect everybody. You you protected um, like Serena Williams needs his fucking protection. Like she could beat him and Chris Rock up together with one hand tied behind her back. You know, so it was it, just when you think you can't predict the next crazy thing, you can't. You know what I mean? Like you just can't think of what would be crazier than what just happened. And that was crazier than anything that I'd it, it could have imagined. It's unbelievable. And I Jason. hope. I, um, what did you I mean, my take on it, my take on it uh, was real simple. The, there, there is. Uh, we talked about this on the show. The word coon has a new definition. When I was growing up, <laughs> coon meant that you probably uh, re reified uh, reified white ideals like comes out of Jim Crow of, of what a buffoonish black person is um, and now a coon is a person acting white uh, yeah, I'm sorry you're picking up oh, we just lost him he just disconnected oh wow uh, actually, I just cut him off. I was and 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 then what is so shocking to me that uh, your conversation with Emil and he was running out all those stats. And regardless of you know the fact that it was it was more or less, the fact that it was always virtually 50 50 is right. shocking to me. It yeah. should it should be ninety nine to one. It, it's just unbelievable. It looks like he's back. Jason is back. And if you could unmute yourself. And now he's, <laughs> this, this goes, uh, the magic, uh, this, part of this the is, this is one of the day, you know, the, the, I do I'm the sure. show. Uh, but, you know, before we wrap it up, the thing that struck me, well, not what struck <laughs> Chris Brock, but something, it was the first time comedians were invited back in a while. Mm -hmm. There's a fear of comedy at the Oscars. They're beginning not to like comedy. They don't want to be made fun of at the Oscars. It, it, as, yes, so you, you have a good point. It's like that's more and more an author, authoritarian state. You know, it's like free speech, uh, a little too free, you know? Yeah. And I thought Amy Schumer, her attacks on Aaron Sorkin, and how horrible the the Lucille Ball biopic was, which it was. I thought that was. I think Amy was amazing. I, I didn't see her clips. I'll look for them. Like, have you seen the the Aaron Sorkin movie? I didn't see that movie. Oh, you got to watch it. Right, it it's it is it is so bad. The it, acting is okay. You know, Antonio Bandera, not Antonio, but uh, Jesus. Forget it. Um, Jason, get your wor your word. Sorry, sorry, sorry. That was sorry. Um, what I was trying to say was there's there's a new definition of coon and coon is now a black person that wants to be white. So that kind of means that underclass ideology or uh, quote unquote acting ghetto is like the authentic blackness. So the fact that he could go do something like that, which is so out of character, um, and and kind of get back to his seat and feel extremely comfortable to yell out, keep my wife's name out of your MF and mouth or whatever it was. Um, it just seems silly. Like yeah. this isn't, I mean, you're so far removed from that reality that I don't understand how you would think in your 50s that that was okay to do. Like I'm 44 and uh, I don't really give too much of a damn what somebody says about me as long as they're not threatening me or the, or the person I'm with. 
So to think that uh, in the most non-threatening setting that you can possibly imagine with a very uh, milk toast joke that will not be remembered, but now will always be remembered from kind of a buffoonish uh, act to kind of gallivant on stage and then saunter off and then sit there and kind of lay back in uh in kind of a racist ideology of this is authentically black and I'm taking care of my woman, yada, yada, yada. It's like, this is bullshit. This is silly. There's no way in the world that I would ever think to punch a comedian for saying something as lame as that. Especially if I know them outside of the joint and I know the whole business of, of show business. It's like, come on, dude. It was yeah. silly. Like it seemed like he had some kind of mental break or something. Yeah, it really can, did. Can I it ask really a really question? Did. Can I ask? A, a, yeah, we we have to wrap it up. Right, we'll we we'll wrap it up. Let, let me. I just as long as I have Jason here for this one, I just want to ask this one thing. What do you think would have happened if a white star like Bradley Cooper walked up and slapped Chris Rock? You think they would have let him get away with that? I, I think no. They, they would have been different. It would have been different. But let's but let's keep this one thing in mind. If Bradley Cooper slaps Chris Rock, the first thing we're going to think is that's some sort of hate crime. We're not going to think that, well, he's just keeping it real. Right. And, and, and I think that's what Will Smith kind of relied on was was the keeping it real aspect. Um, and it, so it's, it, all, it's yeah. almost like it, it's 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 almost like uh, like using the N word. If you are. Yes. 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 That's, yes. Okay. That's, yes. Yes. Which I say okay. quite too much, but yes, yes. I'm a big we, fan. We have to wrap up to be continued. This is great. Jason Miles is the host of This Is Revolution. Everybody should listen to This Is Revolution. And John Ross, follow him on Twitter at Fun With Friction. I can't, thank you for accommodating me on this. Uh, this was not an easy day. So th okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. Let us, uh, let us now go to... California, where Howie Klein is standing by. He is the founder and treasurer of the Blue America PAC, which raises money for progressive candidates and read them over at Down With Tyranny. Sorry to keep you waiting, Howie. How are you today? I'm okay. Uh, why is this a difficult day? Oh, my mother uh, is, she, I, had, I had to uh, go visit my mother. So it's... Uh, and she's getting on, but she's fine. She's fine. But it just, uh, we had technical, it, it caused technical problems at the beginning of the show. So, I see. Yes. Well, shall we talk about, do you want to weigh in on, uh, no, we won't talk about the slap. Let, let's talk about. What, we, what, what are we not going to talk about? I was going to ask you about, I don't want to talk about the slap. Let, let's talk about. Oh, right, right. I don't know anything about it. And I didn't watch that show. Yeah. I was, I was learning about it just now, listening uh, to your uh, previous guests. Right. So is there anything Biden can do between now and November short of beating Putin in Ukraine to have the Democrats do considerably well in the elections is, is, is how political is Ukraine for Biden? Well, I mean, it, yeah, it's somewhat political, uh, I would think, although I, that doesn't answer your question. I mean, there is, there are things that Biden can do uh, between now and, and, and the election. I think he's going to, and one of them is something that we're all very much looking forward to, which is the um, uh, the, the uh, dissolution of of all that uh, billions and billions of dollars in uh, in student debt. So I think that they're just sort of waiting on that. Uh, you know, he keeps postponing the time that they're going to have to, uh, you know, start paying paying it back. But I think that he he. He doesn't want to, but I think he has been persuaded that it's the only thing he can do to keep from having a catastrophe. They have to turn out young voters, and I think that's going to help. Uh, supposedly, 
they, they're, they're coming upon, I don't know if this is true, but they're supposedly coming uh, 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 to a deal with Manchin. I hope they've got cinema in mind too, because she's completely out of her mind to have like, so, you know, sort of a dual back less better plan. Certainly right. not dual back, but do a little something. Right. What are you doing in the background? What are you making? I don't know if it's too late. Uh, you know, they, they, they've wasted it. They've, you know, the mood in the country is surly. Uh, people feel that the Democrats have, uh, you know, made a lot of promises and then let, let them down. So I don't know how much good it can do, but we'll see. Okay. What are you cooking so, tonight? Oh, I am making, I'm so glad you asked. I am making something so fantastic, which is, um, so, okay. So it's four courses, more or less. So the first, so the, the rice, which is the base of the thing, uh, I'm making with Ezekiel, which is a kind of seaweed, plus um, uh, rice, Ezekiel, and lentils. So the Ezekiel has been soaking all day to you know, revitalize it in ginger, and the lentils have been soaking in, in garlic all day to, you know, make, and then I just put them in with the rice and, uh, and cook the brown rice. So, and that should be wonderful. And then with that, I'm going to have, you know, ever, you probably never heard of black radish, did you? No. So black radish is an incredibly delicious uh, vegetable, it, and it's, it very has a very short season. And this is the time that you can get it. So I'm making I'm making that right now. So sort of trying to peel it a little bit so it looks like a zebra. So it's also very beautiful. And then you roast it in the oven with miso and uh, tamari and a little bit of rice vinegar. Very simple to make and absolutely like mouthwateringly delicious. Okay. And then delicata squash. You also roast that in the oven, uh, and, it's, and you caramelize it in the oven, and so it's it's just wonderful. And then I made a um, a walnut pie. Okay, the, the, are you dropping the phone? What is it, what is going on with the phone? No, I don't know. It, it's it, okay. It, it it sounds like uh, okay. So ever since I moved to Los Angeles, the name Rick Caruso. I've been haunted by the name Rick Caruso, who is a building developer of the worst sort. You write that he's an oligarch. You have a picture of his yacht. Uh, hundred hundred million dollar yacht. Think about that. Uh, we're in a city with, with an incredible homeless situation, and this guy's got a hundred million dollar yacht, and he wants to be the mayor. Did he build the Grove? Is he the one behind the Grove? He built the grove. I'm sorry? Yes, he built the grove. Okay. So he's now running for mayor of Los Angeles. He's trying, basically trying to buy the, um, uh, the Democratic nomination. Now, he wasn't a Democrat until a couple of weeks ago. He was a Republican, and then he changed to be some kind of an independent. And then a few weeks ago, he decided since he's going to run for governor, uh, run for mayor, he should change to be a Democrat. So now he's supposedly a Democrat. And are people going after him? What is his solution to homelessness? It feels from everybody I talk to in Los Angeles, there is a serious issue with homelessness that he's the cause of. <laughs> well, he, he's part of the cause of it. I, I wouldn't blame it all on him. But yes, he's he's definitely part of it. And, uh, you know, people, you know, it, the thing is this, if when you go to your mailbox every day, there is, a, or every other day, there's a gigantic, fancy, expensive, uh, thick p mailing from him. None of the other candidates can afford anything like it. He's spending his own money, uh, you know, tens of millions of dollars. And, you know, some people are going to be brainwashed by the things he says about himself. I can only imagine that we're going to have, you know, tons of TV ads as the election gets closer as well. You know, he's got unlimited amounts of money and he's going to spend it and try to become mayor. Very, very bad situation. And why do you call him a predator? Well, because he, he, of his business practices. He's, uh, you know, he's someone who, you know, he, he, in some ways he's a lot like, you know, Donald Trump. He doesn't care about anything but himself. Okay. Uh, COVID. How is COVID in Los Angeles? I was outside today and I almost forgot my mask and I looked around and I saw people without masks. I thought, 
you know, I could probably get away with not wearing a mask. Is it safe? What What is the, the consensus seems to be, maybe we didn't beat COVID, but the, the COVID deniers beat us into submission and we're not going to wear masks anymore. Well, I, I went uh, to, the, um, to the grocery store today uh, to buy the wonderful uh, ingredients for the things I just told you I'm making. And uh, I would say nine, more than 90% of the people were wearing masks. So that, that was good. Uh, and I felt uncomfortable around people who weren't wear, wearing masks and they don't have to legally. And they didn't. But all the employees were wearing masks. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm frustrated uh, as you are about about the uh, being beaten down by the uh, you know these fools who, who who think it's all over. And maybe it is all over. I don't know. I, I mean, you know, I, I don't think so. I mean, the the thing is this: the the daily rates are no longer any, any uh, accurate, the reports of daily rates of, of new cases, because everyone has, um, you know, home testing kits now. So, you know, p- you, you know, we're not really finding out who, who has COVID and who doesn't have COVID. It's just not working that way anymore. Right. And um, so we're, what we really have to watch is the hospitalizations. And the good news is that the hospitalizations are really down right now. So, let, so let's see what happens. Right. Amazon failed in uh, Staten oh, Island. Yeah. I, I, forgot to, I forgot to bring one thing up, which is um, planes. Uh, you know, I'm hearing there are more and more airlines that are uh, getting rid of uh, mask requirements. And that gets me really nervous. And, uh, you know, Roland, my friend, he, he, um, he does go on planes. And he tells me, you know, there are people who are not taking it seriously. They're, they're you know you know, they may have a mask on, but it's around their chin or they, uh, you know, they, they, they spend the entire flight eating and drinking. So, you know, there's no mask. So, you know, I'm, you know, I'm staying away from flying. I'll tell you that. Yeah. This isn't something new. I was reading about the TB, uh, epidemic in New York city. I I think it must've been more than a hundred years ago. And they concluded that, one of the ways to prevent TB was to stop spitting. And whether or not that's scientifically accurate, New Yorkers refused to stop spitting. They refused to believe the science on TB. So it's not like this is a new phenomenon where all of a sudden Americans uh, are disobeying uh, medical science. Let's turn to Staten Island, speaking of spitting, where Amazon tried to spit on our friend Christian Smalls. They failed. Who is Global Strategy Group, and what is their link to Amazon and the Democratic Party? So they're one of the Democratic Party's top um, strategists, and they they are embedded with the Democratic Party. You know, they are consultants for some of the top figures in the Democratic Party, conservatives, of course, conservative Democrats, establishment Democrats. And, uh, you know, people like from the Hillary wing, although, you know, I noticed that one what, of the... Uh, are, you, are you playing, are there bells? What, what's going on? No, no bells. <laughs> are you co- are no. you're cooking, right? Well, uh, I, what, I'm, what I was doing just now is coating the, uh, the black turnips with the miso sauce. Okay, so, so it's... I, it, it's... Make, it, it's making for a it, it's kind of hurting the sound i hate okay. to, thank you i apologize but it, it, it's it, it's uh and it's making me hungry so there i uh so they well, are more hungry uh yeah so uh yeah so global strategy group uh, what i was going to say is that one of the managing directors so one of the top people there was jen saki you remember her? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, you know, like I said, they're very, very uh, connected uh, throughout the Democratic establishment, uh, especially among conservatives. And they, uh, they are, they were hired by um, Amazon to come up with a strategy of how to bust the union. And they've been working on that all the time. So you wouldn't think like a Democratic group would be, you know, busy busting unions, but, th- but that's what this, this group does. And they do lots and lots of other bad things like that. 
Right. And I wrote a, I wrote a post about it. I'm assuming you saw it. Yeah. And uh, where I try to explain it because I noticed that the the, um, the mainstream media has just sort of given them a pass. They they don't even mention them. You don't see anything about them at all. And there was a lot of coverage of this um, of this of this successful strike and very little uh, discussion of uh, global global strategy group because they're right. so powerful. I mean, they, they're literally one of the most they're they're a powerhouse and they 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 have so much they're so well connected and and they have so much clout that no one wants to take them on. Right. So would you say that it feel does it feel like most of the lawyers, most of the lobbyists who are fighting unions come to us from the Democratic Party? Well, I don't know. I don't know if most of them. I know that these, these, these ones did. I, I don't know why. I would not guess that it was most. And why, why do you ask? Do you, do you have some uh, idea? Well, I, I've just did? noticed that Letitia James, who was instrumental in helping Christian Smalls, she's the attorney general here. She helped form the union. Uh, she uses global strategies for her polling, and you would think she would now disown them uh, since they're so anti-union. There are Jay Carney, who was both Biden's and Obama's press spokesperson, is now director of communications for Amazon. And I'm amazed at Twitter because he's got about 50,000 followers on Twitter. And while all this anti-union stuff was coming out of uh, his office, he's busy tweeting about how proud he is that Amazon employees are helping relief efforts for Ukrainians. Nobody's challenging him about his union busing. This is Jay Carney, a Democrat working. Yeah. Why don't you invite uh, these people on the show, like someone like Letitia James, ask her to come on and have a discussion with her about how she can you know, be doing such good and, and still be working with um, Global Strategy and see what she has to say. What would she say? She wouldn't come on my show, but what would... Why not? Uh, I Everyone get, I ask on your show says yes. I don't get incumbents on my show. I see. Do you want some incumbents? I'll take some incumbents. Yeah, but it's... I mean... We'll get, I didn't know that you wanted incumbents, or you never told me. I'll get I'll you ta- some I'll I'll take. some. I'll take some incumbents. Uh, so... Yeah, it just feels like the Democrats, the Democratic leadership is lousy with people who pay lip service to like Stuart Applebaum, who was the head of the union uh, organizers down in Bessemer. He's a Democratic operative and they failed, you know. Uh, So, yeah. Uh, Do you feel that Joe Biden is trying to bring peace to Ukraine? Do you sense that? Do you sense that the American people are being uh, supporting the idea of peace or supporting the idea of destroying Vladimir Putin? So there were two very different questions there. One was about Joe Biden and one was about the American people. Well, he speaks for the American people. He's our president. Uh, So let's talk. Let's talk about Joe Biden. So he, I think that that not that he's doing a good job of it necessarily or a great job of it anyway, but he yes, I, I do think that he um, he's trying to break. He's hoping for peace rather than for war. I don't think that he he would like to see war in, um, uh, you know, a world war. I mean, we got a little bit of a world war already, but I don't think he's looking for more of that. Do you? Uh, I don't think he wants world war, but. What about Ukraine? I mean, how do we stop the fighting in Ukraine before we worry about Poland, Hungary, and Moldova? Don't we want to stop what's going on in Ukraine? Or does he, want, do. to, does he want to stop what's going on in Ukraine? I, I think he would like to without, uh, and, and he's, he's, you know, look, the U.S. had a, what's considered in the foreign policy establishment, a very, very successful 
policy of bleeding Russia in Afghanistan. So they would they would be providing the apps with um, all sorts of advanced uh, weaponry so that they uh, they could shoot down Russian helicopters and uh, and kill lots of Russians and you know really make life miserable for them on the ground. And I, I'm sure there are some people who would like to you know do that again uh, in in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, the Ukrainians not among them. And so is. It, it does feel, I was saying this at, at the top of the show, that it feels like this administration wants a proxy war in Ukraine against Russia, where we don't have to send troops, we just provide the, the Ukrainians with the weapons of war to kill Russians and hurt Vladimir Putin. And as long as this doesn't spread to other countries, Biden will be okay with that. I, I'd like to think I'm wrong, but it feels like that. Yeah, well, I hope you are wrong. And, but do you get a I, sense that this is what the Biden administration is going for to, to create? Well, I, I don't know that I would call it the Biden administration, although it, it's semantics, but it would be more like the permanent American foreign policy um, establishment. Although, you know, an, an argument could be well made that Biden is very much part of that. And, um, and so the atrocities that Russia committed over the weekend were plastered, the papers, the news media has plastered our screens with those, that imagery. Yeah. The instinct that I have is how do we stop this war? Are most Americans supposed to respond by, well, we need to funnel more weapons to Zelensky. Forget peace talks. We, we need to start killing Russians. Is that the idea behind this? Well, it's certainly, if it's not the idea, it's what's happening. What do the American people want? That's what they want. American people seem to be thinking that we should be, I mean, most, certainly most Republicans, but even, you know, a lot of Democrats think that, you know, Biden needs to do more, uh, you know, to, uh, to get back at Russia and to get Russia, you know, more sanctions, more weapons, uh, you know, some people even want to go to war a minority but but not not an insubstantial not an unsubstantial minority I, I find this hard to believe but somebody was showing me polls on will smith versus chris rock and a majority of americans according to this poll thought chris rock was in the wrong that i don't know any about this so it's, it's silly to talk to me about it i i don't know what they i know that one of them slapped the other one but i don't know which one slapped who and i don't know why and it's just like been a story that i i don't i don't pay any attention to except when i'm on your show and the people before me talk right. about it well I, i'm just saying that it's indicative of how americans view violence that they believe that there's a time and a place for violence and that time is all the time and that place is everywhere but me. So you're, the, you're, uh, you're saying Americans are looking at the situation in Ukraine and they're, they're not okay with the atrocities, but they think the way to end those atrocities is by more war. Is, is that what you're saying? Uh, I'm saying there are some Americans who, who feel that way. I, I'm not saying that it's, it's you know, all Americans. And, uh, you know, there's a there's a big disagreement about. Look, there's a lot of propaganda from Ukraine and the U.S. There's a lot of propaganda from Russia. The one thing is not disputable, uh, and that is that Russia invaded Ukraine. Right. So, so there's you know there's no argument about you know you can't say Ukraine invaded Russia. It doesn't it doesn't you know that doesn't hold water. Right. Don't you think? So, don't you think it could have been stopped if Biden had promised what Zelensky is now promising that Ukraine will never join NATO uh, I don't think that that was Russia's only demand Russia has working very hard to uh 
to, to take pieces of Ukraine uh, and make them part of Russia again. So he's, uh, you know, that's, and that's a problem. I mean, you know, what if someone, well, I, I was going to say, what if someone wanted Florida, we'd probably all be for that. But what if somebody wanted, uh, you know, to take, to take Illinois? You know, we won't attack you if you give us Illinois. Right. We, 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 who would go along with that? And I can understand why Ukraine doesn't want to give up um, uh, uh, the Crimea, let alone the Donbass area, but they don't. And I'm sure you can understand it, too. Well, at least go back to the Minsk agreements and work off those and, and try to minimize the fighting. Just seems like uh, that's one way of uh, putting an end to this. Or yeah, well, I, I don't know that Putin. I mean, you talk, you say that uh, Biden doesn't want to put an end to it. Uh, my gut tells me that it's Putin that doesn't want to put an end to it. Not not Biden. I don't want to, you know, just blindly blame Biden. I'm not saying that he's innocent. Of, you know, and like I said, it, it, it's more like. You know, the, if there's a culprit on our side uh, at all, I, I, it's it's the the permanent transpartisan foreign policy establishment, uh, and, and that's not a good bunch. Right. Uh, and and Biden is connected to that. You know, he is definitely part of that. But um, I, I I I just I don't know. Uh, you know, I don't know what the answer is to it. You know, and, and I'm not meant to know. Um, I can guess and speculate, and I've, I've run uh, posts on my blog from people who are all in on, uh, you know, uh, defending Putin and, and saying that Biden is the uh, Biden is the bad guy here just because I wanted to have uh, another uh, point of view. But that's not my point of view. Right. Right. All right. Are you uh, before you go? Are you, By the way, I apologize. I'm on edge today, so I apologize for. Uh, oh, fixating you know, on, on the the cooking sounds i'm just a little on edge today are they are they are you still hearing them i'm sorry are you still hearing them I, i'm having trouble hearing you are you still hearing the cooking sounds i i'm hearing something but it might be the voices in my head uh <laughs> so i i i i'm not uh a hundred percent today uh but before you go any good news about 2022 midterms? What, what, anything that that makes us hopeful? We had good news last week. I will have good news in any in any situation, no matter what. Even you know, I mean, even if, say the Democrats lose 20 seats, which would be a catastrophe, and I acknowledge that it's a catastrophe. You know, if 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 most of those 20 seats, which they would be, are, are blue dwarfs and new Dems, there's your good news. Right. And the good news is that are there are there any DSA members, any people on the left who might win? But, or, yes. Okay. Good. There are. For example, who are you up? Uh, for example, there are uh, in Southern California. There are a number of strong progressives, including some DSA members who are fighting against uh, awful blue dogs. Like, uh, did we have Mike Ortega on on the show? Yes. He's one. Um, Joaquin Valesquez down in San Diego, he's another one. Um, there's um, uh, Christina. Do we have Christina Garcia on the show? I think so, but we should have her back. She's fantastic. She's an assembly woman, so we can see her body of work already. But she's fantastic, and she's running against the mayor of Long Beach, who is um, named Robert Garcia. So it's two Garcias, Christina versus Robert, and uh, she's you know as far left as you can go, and and a, and a kick-ass uh, strategist, she's really incredible. And he is a Republican, and you know he got elected as a Republican when he first uh, ran for office, and once he realized he wanted to run for higher office, he decided to have to change his party. Now, that doesn't change him. It's just instead of having an R next to his name, he has a D next to his name. Is he still a piece of crap? Absolutely. Absolutely a piece of crap. And, uh, you know, the Democratic establishment is all gung-ho on him. They want him. 
Okay. Should be continued. Howie Klein is the founder, treasurer of the Blue America PAC. They raise money for progressive candidates all around America. Read him every day over at Down With Tyranny. Thank you, Howie. Thank you, David. I'll, we'll have an uh, incumbent on next week. Oh, good, good. Do we know who yet? Well, I, have, um, I know who I'll invite, and then we'll see who, who, who wants to come. I mean, the first person I'm going to invite is going to be uh, Marie Newman. She's got an interesting story. She's in a, a very, very tough race against a conservative Democrat uh, and, you know, incumbent versus incumbent. And, it, you know, if she has time, she'll do it. I mean, I have a good relationship with her, and I, and I, I hope that uh, she's got the, the time to do it. I mean, the, your show is on while, uh, they, uh, while they're in session. Okay. But, you know, we'll, she, you know, if she can make room, she will. Thank you. Thank you, Howie Klein. I'll talk to you next week. Thank you. Adios, David. Thank you. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. When we come back, the founder and president of Yuck Yucks, the largest comedy club in America, North America, Mark Breslin. Dave, by the way, David, you should get that thing looked at. You, you really what? should get that thing looked at. That thing. What? I wouldn't wait, David. That's definitely not good. I would go to a dermatologist tomorrow, first thing, David, and get that looked at because that does not look good. What? Really? Where? That what? thing that you have right above your shoulder, David. My neck? No, your face. The whole <sighs> thing. The whole thing, David. You should tear it down and start all over again, like I did with Ivana. Ivana, yeah, Ivana. Your first one. My first yeah. wife, Ivana. Eight chairs in this Bessemer shop. Back in our day, don't ever seem to stop. The man went down because his heart gave out. Get back to work, we heard them shout. They said the EMTs are common, that's what they're for. And life slipped away on a cement floor. I know the bookstores are all gone away. Got me some books, I'll read them someday. Right now I got to make my rate and all these extra shifts. If I can make it to Christmas Eve, the kids will have nice gifts. And the big boss will have more money so he can go up into space. But there still won't be no chairs in this Bessemer place. Last year we had a meeting and they made us go They gave us all pins It said, vote no But maybe this year Union can give us a little more And put some chairs on this Bessemer floor I'm hoping the union might make things right Some days I just don't have the strength to fight This plant down here can take its toll It'll break your body, it'll crush your soul Feels like this packing ain't never gonna stop And there still ain't no chairs in this Bessemer shop
Yeah, that's uh, Professor Mike Steinel, and I didn't, I hit the wrong button. Uh, dealing with some stuff today. Let's go to Toronto, where Mark Breslin is standing by. He is the founder and president of Yuck Yucks, the largest comedy club in North America. Sorry to keep you waiting. I'm dealing with family stuff today. Uh, so I just wanted to, uh, I had to take a call, uh, but everything's okay. How are you? I'm okay, but I do want to say that uh, I know how strongly you and the show feels about about unions. And to yeah. that note, I've been calling around to some of the regulars on your show, and right. uh, we're all getting together. And next week, we're starting a strike action, unless you meet our non-negotiable demands. So I'm just letting you know now, okay? Okay. And and what are the non-negotiable demands? Um, we'd like to get paid. <laughs> okay. Right. That's our only non-negotiable demand. Right. Okay. Right. Hey, uh, let's talk. I didn't have. To, it's good to see you. The the obvious question that everybody wants me to ask you is: Have you ever slapped a comedian? No. Uh, violence. Uh, Will Will Smith and the violence. What, what was? Okay. What you your... take because I I thought about it for a long time and it kept changing. Um, so here are some things that I think um, you want to think about. One, Chris Rock doing that particular joke on that particular show, I believe, was a comics mistake. Um, I always think of the Oscars as a sort of the biggest corporate you can do. Um, and believe me, it's corporate. You only have to look at it to realize how corporate it is. And when you do, when I send comics out to do corporates, you know, they're always told, uh, you know, watch what you say. Don't One of the things you don't do is you don't make fun of somebody's body. Um, it's an unnecessary risk to take in a corporate setting. That having been said, he could have muted it a bit. He could have ameliorated the joke by giving a compliment first and then doing the line. Like, um, I see Jada Pinkett Smith's here. Isn't she beautiful? Everybody applauds. And then he does the joke. So it's right. hard to get mad because she's already gotten applause for how beautiful she is. It's it's right. Such a simple thing that I'm shocked that Chris Rock wouldn't have thought of it because he's such a good comedian. All right, that's right. the first. Uh, the second thing is um, why was there no security? Um, maybe Will Smith was really crazy and had a knife in his pocket, and uh, there's better security at my clubs than there is at uh, at the Oscars. And I guess because they think, well, anybody who's rich and famous, they're not going to pull anything because they're rich and famous and they're different than us. So they're never going to pull anything. Well, guess what? That's not true. Um, so the next thing, what should Will Smith have done? I think that he slapped Chris because there's something deeply wrong with his marriage. Um, because only um, a wife or a spouse who feels that they have been maligned and poorly treated over time would even think of suggesting or having your husband think that you would want you to do that. Because in a healthy marriage, that would never happen. I think there are problems in their marriage, and you keep hearing that now as things get uncovered and unpacked. So um, I think it's really more about their relationship than anything else. Next right. thing, um, what should Will Smith have done? He couldn't do nothing, though. So what he should have done is when Chris delivered the, the joke, he should have turned to his wife and said, just wait till the after party. I'm really going to let him know what how we stand right. and then at the after party you go up to chris and say you know chris i don't know if you know that my wife has a a medical condition which is why she shaves her head but she does and she was horribly offended by the fact that you made fun of that in front of a billion people she's standing over there you think you could go over and apologize and chris right. knowing chris would say oh i'm so sorry and would go over and apologize but then Will Smith go, calls his publicist and says, guess what? Uh, he just apologized, put it everywhere. And then Will Smith gets the last laugh that way. So there were so many possibilities of things that could have happened where it didn't have to get violent, but it did get violent. It was obviously a horrible choice that uh, Will Smith made to deck the guy. And yet, I have a confession to make. I kind of like it. <laughs> Well, let me explain why. <laughs> I kind of liked it because even though I'm a nonviolent person, 
it just cut through all the ref, the disgusting corporatism of the Oscars and of the entertainment business and set it back to what it really was, a bunch of people playing in the mud. And I liked it for its weird honesty. I'm not saying he should have done it. I'm just saying that part of me kind of liked it because it kind of revealed what show business is really all about. Okay. It's, yeah, yeah, and what America is all about. Sorry, and what, what is America it? is all about. Yeah. yeah, That that, I mean, it's a cliche, but we are a violent nation. We think we can resolve issues through violence. Hollywood was built on violence. Be careful when you say America and exclude the rest of the world. Because there's an equivalent, um, there's an equivalent thing here in Canada called the Gemini's and the Genies that keep changing the name. And in 1979, Bruno Gerusi, who was the um, star of a show called The Beachcombers, which is as exciting as it sounds, got mad at somebody and actually pulled a gun on him at the at the Gemini's. It can happen anywhere. The Gemini's, the awards for. Yeah. But yeah, your Oscar the award show, he pulled a gun. Uh, uh, one of the most famous actors in Canada pulled a gun on somebody who was up there winning an award. I can't remember the details of why he did it. Not that it really matters. But, you know, when you say America, be careful, um, because it's not like the, um, it's unknown anywhere else in the world. But what I really like about what happened is um, the Oscars is supposed to show America at its best. Right. These are the best and the brightest and they're the most creative and they're the most beautiful. And the most creative and the most beautiful people are still thugs. And I think that's sort of, there's something kind of fantastic about what happened on that level. It was so unscripted. It was so off the chart. It was so off the narrative that um, it made me, it made me, it made me kind of like, it was Dostoevsky, you know? Um, remember Dostoevsky said that if evil didn't exist, man would have to invent it. <laughs> so, um, uh, I, I liked it for that reason. And the, and the word liking it is probably the wrong term anyway, and it'll get me in trouble. But um, his violence is always wrong, right? So um, mm -hmm. so yeah. two things happened this week. Yeah. While people were asking, can Will Smith recover? I understand there have been a couple of projects that are now on hold because of this, which surprised me that he's uh reaping economic blowback from the slap louis ck won a grammy and jeremy piven who has been fielding me too accusations numerous me too accusations was on the red carpet somewhere talking about his movie asked to comment about will smith I know he's doing stand-up comedy. Uh, have, you, have you worked with Jeremy? Has Jeremy Piven well, played I, Toronto? Yes, I booked him in Toronto and in Niagara Falls. About, I guess, just before the, the pandemic started, he was extremely difficult to work with. Extremely difficult to work with. I felt that I was making a bit of a leap to you know, have him at the club because there was a lot of negative, a lot of negativity. But um, I, I love his, I love his work. Not that I necessarily love the standup, the standup show that he did for like 75 minutes was okay. It was more of a kind of retrospective of his career and telling funny stories than an actual standup. Um, and he did some impressions, which were pretty good. I think it's a show you'd see once, but I'm not sure you'd see it twice, but he was difficult to work with. And, you know, um, the, I told him I would insulate him from the press, but I couldn't completely and he got really mad at me and called me names and um he wasn't an easy guy to work with that's for sure and and without opening yourself up to litigation did your experience with jeremy piven uh lend credence to the accusations the way he treated you did you often wonder well if this is how he treats me i can only imagine how he treats women well yeah that did occur that did occur to me um, but you know, I, so a lot of those, those things happened at the Playboy Mansion, which I don't know if you've ever been to the Playboy Mansion, 
but there might as well be a big sign saying, please squeeze the girl's breasts. Um, but here's what I think probably happened, seeing what his personality is like. I'll bet that when he squeezed the girl's breasts and she said, no, no, I don't want that. Instead of saying, oh, I'm sorry, I, I completely misunderstood. He probably got mad at her and called her a name and, you know, just turned it into something else that would invite somebody to um, criticize him, go public with it, that kind of thing. Right. We're finding paths of redemption for white men who have been me too uh, Jeremy Piven, Louis C.K. wins a Grammy this which week. Surprised, which surprised me. But remember that you can't find his stuff on Netflix. It's all been taken down. He cannot get distribution for the movie that he spent $5 million to make. Um, there are most clubs will not hire him, especially in North America. He's doing a tour. It's true. But the tour is in Europe. And that's a whole different world there. He was going to play Kiev before the invasion. That's right. That's right. And if you and if you think that the two things are connected, I see where you're going with this. <laughs> because Europe is also a comedian. <laughs> and there could have been some jealousy, some professional jealousy. Am I, am I right? Oh, Zelensky is also a comedian, well, and he saw there could have been some professional I, jealousy. Right. With with, with Louis C.K., his crime is exposing himself, masturbating without permission. No, that's not that's not it. No, David, he asked permission each time and he got permission. Permission was granted and then the women decided, wait a minute, why did I give permission? I, that was disgusting. Um, so, right. and then they, they, had, they changed their mind after the fact, which is why I don't see what he did as being as horrible as Bill Cosby or any number of other people or Harvey Weinstein. This is a bit different. Right, right. So he wins a Grammy. And he's like Woody Allen, who the accusations against Woody Allen are far worse, but limited, I believe. The one well, yeah, but there's been a, a couple of models who have come forward now. And he was friendly with Jeffrey Epstein. But Europe doesn't judge this behavior the way we do here in America. Well, I think, first of all, they don't judge. And that's why I've always thought that any of these people who are accused of any of these things should go to France and uh, where they can have their own talk show. In fact, they should probably all have their own talk show. It should be a, like The View um, in France, but it would have Woody Allen, uh, Jeffrey, uh, who else? Woody Allen, Harvey Weinstein, uh, Jeremy Pivens, Louis C.K. They would all have like a show together. They just have to learn to speak French. That's the only thing. Jerry Lewis, it turns out. I, I read that. Yeah. Who would ever think a man as as dignified as Jerry Lewis would be a, a, a disgusting, a pervert, serial molester? Who would ever think? Right. I've had fights. Some people uh, won't come back to my show because they were fixating on redemption for these white men who have been me too And I would say... What about the victims here? Uh, and that doesn't seem, I don't hear too much conversation about the, the pathway forward for the victims. I'm going to say something. I think with Louis, if what you're saying uh, is correct, that he asked for permission to masturbate and he was given permission to masturbate and then the the women decided afterwards it was disgusting uh and, and an abuse of, of his power and an abuse of his power uh and like a self-loathing comedian that he is he didn't realize he had the power over these women uh yeah you know i i can see uh i can understand uh yeah i can understand 
uh, Will Smith, how much trouble does Will Smith find himself in? He's an African-American, an African-American male. The rap against African-American males, even though it's not true, is that they have a preponderance towards violence, even though statistically speaking, that's not true. Uh, you know, it's funny, David. When I watched it, I didn't think it was uh, necessarily a black man hitting another black man. I thought it was a millionaire hitting another millionaire. I thought it was a billionaire hitting a millionaire. That's I what I saw. No, I don't think Will Smith is quite that wealthy. Um, he has more money than um, I, I read that he had three hundred million dollars, and that uh, Chris Rock only has sixty million dollars. I feel really oh, yeah. sad for Chris Rock. How do we know what people have? That, that's one of the things. There's a site. Like, how, there's a go on it. Right. Right. There, and do you believe that site is accurate? Yeah, it's close enough. He's rich. They're rich. They're both rich people. They're both rich and very successful people. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't have, I, you know, he should never have hit, he should never hit him. But I didn't really care a lot because A, Chris didn't get hurt. There was, he didn't really get hurt. And B, it, it's just what, in another era, it would have been um, a one aristocrat hitting another guy's uh, face, another aristocrat's face with a handkerchief and, and saying, I want a duel which actually right. was fantastic if that had actually right. happened and we, because the duel could happen on um, like on pay-per-view and they could clean up. Um, the other thing that I think is probably going to happen is that next year at the Oscars, uh, I think the hosts will be uh, Will Smith and Chris Rock. I think that that's guaranteed, guaranteed box office, guaranteed people watching. Is there an allergy now to comedy at the Academy Awards, because this was the first time comedians were hosting, I uh, believe, a couple well, of years, right? Well, I mean, Bob Hope used to, you could say Bob Hope's not a comic, but that's not true. Um, Bob Hope. It just feels like uh, there's been a problem with comedians hosting the Oscars ever since the Me Too movement and the PC police. They don't oh, like. Yeah, that's true. I don't think that's true. I think that after, I think Letterman did such a, a box job. Everybody felt that Letterman did a box job. And if you take a look, there were far, far fewer comics hired after Letterman because Letterman did not do a good job. Remember Billy Crystal? Wasn't he perfect? He did a little dance. He did a little song. He had a little seltzer in his pants. Um, he was kind of perfect for the, for the job. Right. It's hard to find somebody who's old Hollywood and um, and he has that sort of feel to to them. Um, I thought actually that they underused the hosts. You saw them right at the beginning. I thought Amy Schumer's monologue was pretty good. And yep. then disappeared from the show. Why did they even bother? I think they're afraid of the comedians at the Oscars. I think they find the comedians to be offensive that any that every joke is in that they they perceive every good joke as an attack on the nominees uh, but you want to have a little bit of an attack on the nominees because you see the people sitting at home aren't worth 300 million dollars and they love to see the people who are high brought low but it's delicate you know you have to just bring them down a peg not um you know a whole 13-story building that's what that's what the audience wants to see. I suspect the Academy does not like being made fun of, that well, they don't Then they shouldn't be booking comics, but they still are booking comics. They know the comics are the only people who can really set the tone of looseness. It is such an uptight show, you have to admit. It is so structured and so without any spontaneity whatsoever that when anything human happens, like somebody actually really cries for a good reason or tells a story about their childhood, it's real. Like, I thought that Kevin Costner's- um, uh, He was great. I thought he was great because he was quite real for somebody who's in an unreal world. So when that happens, it becomes something that people just are shocked about. Well, comics have the same ability to do that, but it's a very, like I said it in the beginning, it's a corporate, it's a very delicate balance and they have to get it just right in the strike zone or no good. I thought Kevin Costner came out like a well-seasoned walk 
and just spoke the words and there was so much inherent gravitas it's a very powerful just talking about was it how the west was young his sing yeah yeah uh, i think yeah. he's i i mean he looks like a baseball glove now but you know yeah. the thing is he's um it was real it was actually real and and i loved it and i think most people did and what comics do is comics make it real too they just can't go over the edge right before i have to keep this show i may have to cut this show short tonight so i want to make sure so i'm going to cut back on on time for everybody i apologize but i'm, I'm dealing with it. before you go how is covid in canada and how are the comedy clubs well, are, let me tell you that i wasn't on the show for the last couple of weeks you didn't call for me and that's sort of a good thing because we were on vacation for the first time in two years we went to palm springs and ah. when, when we went to palm springs nobody was wearing masks nobody was socially distancing we were on two long plane rides five hours each one way one way one the other way and when we came back we had to be tested to get back in the country and we were fine i come back and here where everybody is still wearing masks everybody still here is you know worried about being too close to people and People are getting it left and right, even if they're vaxxed and masked and everything. So I just don't understand it. I don't know. So we have gone back to being very careful, of course. And as far as the clubs go, uh, we've been adding shows. So people are starting to relax about it, but I'm not sure they should. You know, my nephew uh, got it and um, he's the most careful person I've ever known. The most careful person I've ever known. And he didn't get it. And also everybody I know who's getting it isn't getting it badly. It's a bit of a cold, you know, it's, it's nothing serious, but they do have it and they do have to isolate and they do have to quarantine. So if you don't, if you're not immunocompromised, if you're not obese, suffering from diabetes, you have nothing to worry about. Unfortunately, half of America is pre-diabetic. Right. So. And I'm diabetic, as you probably know, type yeah. two. So, you know, all that Coca-Cola. Right. Thank you. It's good to see you. Uh, Mark Breslin is the founder, president of Yuck Yucks, the largest comedy chain in North America. Thank you. Hopefully, I'll see you next week. Yeah, I hope that whatever is going on with your family works out. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, we'll, uh, we'll plow through. Thank you, Mark. Let's go to Dr. Harriet Fraud, who Hello. is the host of Capitalism Hits Home, and it's not just in your head. It's good to see you. Uh, Hi, happy birthday. You happy me? birthday to your yes, happy birthday to your husband. Okay. Everybody Ooh. was talking. And uh let's talk about Ukraine. Oh, is it my imagination? I've been saying this since the show started that this country does not want peace in ukraine that we want to fight a proxy war against putin in ukraine to get him trapped in a quagmire the same way we got the soviet union trapped in a quagmire in afghanistan that the refugees the dead ukrainians the dead russian soldiers are just accidental byproducts uh, collateral damage in a geopolitical dogfight to establish dominance i think so and i think the united states was threatened by looking like a loser because we lost the last four wars and also because we have been the least of all the countries to handle COVID with the most deaths and Therefore, we wanted, we were very threatened by the friendship and connection between China, the rising world hegemon, and Russia, which has the, doesn't have as much population, but has the armaments which China doesn't have, and has the minerals and oil and gas that China doesn't have, and has the wheat that China doesn't have. And therefore, we set it up by surrounding Putin with missiles and hostile NATO bases so that he had no choice. He was on his last one 
where his pipelines go to Europe. And he had to, he fell for the bait. And so we are fighting to the last Ukrainian in order to bog down Russia and create dominance for US world markets. So for example, Germany, which wasn't all that hot on this venture, once they got to rearm, they got hot on it since they have to buy all their armaments. They're in NATO from the United States. They have a $100 billion arms deal. Great for the arms dealers in the United States. And the United States hopes that by presenting this war as what wars really are, horrible, destructive, like we never saw in Vietnam or in Afghanistan or in Iraq, or in Syria, or any of the other places where we have invaded often and been terribly destructive. And these are white people. And so Americans can feel they are really just like us suffering and get excited about it. Meanwhile, US companies gain world dominance by bogging down Russia and interrupting the partnership between Russia and China. So I think that's right. I think you said it right on the nose. Collateral damage. And if you were to say to an American, yes, the, these atrocities in Ukraine are horrific. Horrific. What do we do about it? What we what do is, about it is in the war and we could. If we stop, look, we'll Zelensky about it. is an American it's puppet. Zelensky say that again, you broke up. We could I, I didn't stop the war. We could stop, stop the war. The war. Zelensky is America's puppet. We put him in when we helped organize the coup of the pro-Russian that preceded him. And uh, he is an American, he gets his lines from the United States and delivers them. And all we'd have to say is no more armaments. You're neutral for the rest of history. You sign off, you get back to the Minsk Accords of 2014. You've killed, what is it, 14,000? people in the Russian breakaway republics, you let them speak Russian, you don't kill them, sign on the dotted line, it would be over. But we, you know, the American corporations want markets unimpeded and they don't want what was happening before with the Nord Stream pipeline between Germany and Russia. Although we've allowed Europe to still get gas and oil from Russia, that hasn't been on the list. But still, you know, we are interrupting their market share. And that's what it's all about. And people are pawns in the game. The way they justified the illegal invasion of Iraq was we have to fight the terrorists over there. So we do not fight them over here. And I remember saying, but then they I'm weren't. There. They're not there, and they but, never were. They're Arab, but they're Arabs. Yeah, but it was so, all Saudis but one who bombed the World Trade Center, and the U.S. loves the horrible dictatorship Saudi Arabia that carves up the journalists and takes their bleeding body parts out of the embassy. Oh, go figure. You know, and this and is democracy. This is crap. The American people are thinking, they've been trained to think, it's better to fight Putin in Ukraine so we don't have to fight him over here or in Poland or Moldova or you know Hungary or France and Germany. This is where we have to, this is the hill the Ukrainians have to die on, not the American people. Exactly. Not NATO. This exactly. is where we, this we'll is work, where we have to sell arms and, and arm them. Also, right. you know, the mass of Americans from the polls that I've read are much more concerned about inflation wiping them out, whereas most they get a 3%, a 3.5% wage increase when um, inflation is 8%. They're much more worried about inflation than they are about Ukraine. They're so, always right. so terrible, but so, so what? What they're really worried about is inflation, which is terrible for them. And these other things are always, that's very sad. Uh, so what? Americans the are very American people, It feels like the American people are not being asked 
What do you think we should do about the situation in Ukraine? You're being asked to be appalled by the, the endless stream of atrocities that are pouring out of the TV screen into our hearts. We're just being fed a steady diet of right. atrocities, which, yes, there are these atrocities, but there's no debate as to, there, there aren't two sides to one what side. we should do. There's only yeah. one side, and the idea is bad, bad, bad Putin. Good America, a democracy. Never mind that we support dictatorships over the world. No, 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 no. Democracy. We are for democracy. And democracy means capitalism. And Putin, who's also a capitalist, is bad, 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 bad. That's, right. you know, that's what we're being sold. And these poor, good white people are being tormented. And they are heroic. And we want them to fight to the last Ukrainian. Right. I am not seeing on the editorial pages of the mainstream media, like the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the LA Times, the Washington Post. I am not saying roads to peace. I am no. saying I'm saying uh, this is horrible and it must be stopped. The Russians not- must be defeated by the noble Ukrainians and we will give them arms and we won't get involved any further than that. And Zelensky will say we go down to the last Ukrainian. That's it. And he won't mention the other alternatives. And uh, our European allies are trying to get what they want. Germany got disarmament. Others might get something else. You know that. But they're not putting boots on the ground either. They know better. It's a it's would- a market share battle. Right. I was watching I was watching CNN and this very earnest anchor woman was saying uh, we're going to show you some graphic pictures of these atrocities I have to warn you it is but but you must bear witness to this and I'm thinking how come we don't get to bear witness to the 50,000 Americans who die every year because they're underinsured or not insured. How come we don't get to bear witness to the more than 250,000 Americans who die from medical malpractice? How come we don't get to bear witness to the children who are living on the street, to the Americans who are dying from malnutrition? How come we don't get to bear witness to uh, all the women and children in Afghanistan last year? Right who are starving or who died from our drone strikes gone wrong. And our but we have to bear witness, we must bear witness to this pornography coming out of Ukraine. Yes, we must, because we're, they're whipping up the population that really I think Americans don't care too much about Ukraine. They care about inflation. But it's a distraction. Isn't this terrible? They can cluck their tongues. And but, but, but we also have, we love a blood sport. We love football. We love professional wrestling. We will get on board a war just for the sake of hurting somebody. Yes, spectator sport. But we are not going to get bloodied ourselves. We are right. going to watch it on television. And we are going to stay home and watch it on television. And feel so some. That's right. We like to watch blood sports, but that's on television. And it, and it gives our life excitement. meaning. Is what? It gives our life excitement. And suddenly we are a democracy, even though we're not consulted about anything, including right. the billions spent in the Ukraine. Right. We consulted. can feel something. When you see a, a child uh, um, who's bombed we can feel something it makes us feel alive it makes us feel superior it makes us feel compassionate yes it does and those poor things and people don't think hmm, how come what's going on there they don't wonder why we don't see all those other wars that we've created we don't see the results why are we seeing these people and some people particularly some black people are saying that's because these are white no it's not just because they're white it's because there's a geopolitical struggle for dominance in the capitalist world. And these people are sacrificed. 
And look, they're not all Nazis, but there are two big Nazi brigades that have gone in and killed those 14,000 people in the Russian breakaway republics. And Ukraine did side with Hitler, and they have a long tradition. So these noble people are very mixed. But it's, we're the good guys. And yet most well, people... I, I, that, that, I, that I want to push back on. Uh, we're, I mean, we're not seeing uh, evidence of Nazis in Ukraine. No, we don't see evidence because they don't cover those battalions with the swastika flags. They don't. Even are we though. seeing are we seeing massacres of uh, Muslims and Jews and the LGBTQ community? Is this rampant in Ukraine? I don't know, but I do know that they, the Nazi party is a big party there and they have two Nazi battalions fighting. That feels like Russian propaganda, actually. I don't think so. If you look it up, they have a history of fascism and they opposed the Russian Revolution and they, uh, they opposed Russia against the Nazis. Right, but so did America. I mean, so did practically... Well, no, we don't have battalions flying with the swastika flag in America. No. We had a lot of Nazi sympathizers during World War II, but they didn't prevail. And I don't think that's what's, it's not who it is in the Ukraine. But, but you, think the, you, think, you think the Nazis are prevailing in Ukraine? No, I think that the US is prevailing in the Ukraine. And so I think the there's a problem. I think the Azov battalions, is it C-14? I think yeah. they're, a, they're, they're, a component, they're a component of the, the military yes. they've been absorbed into it but a lot of white supremacists and you know our military is rampant with uh nazis. white supremacists and, and nazis but i don't think they're the official policy as long no, as the republicans not. are in office uh but uh i'm not finding that i am i i've been looking for evidence that there's that Putin is correct in denazifying Ukraine. He's I can't correct. find. He's not hmm? correct. They aren't a dominant force. They are a force, but not a dominant force. And that isn't why he's fighting. He's fighting because he doesn't want to be completely ringed by hostile bases, just like the U.S. risk World right. War III not to have the Soviets in Cuba. Right. Uh, you know, because that will choke them off and destroy them. And so they are fighting and they and Putin is a monster, a monster authoritarian capitalist billionaire ripping off his people. He's a right. monster. Right. I don't think he's going away, though. I think he no. is, I think he learned from, I think he learned from Assad in Syria. I stay. You go. I'm not going anywhere. You're no, going. he's not going to relinquish power unless he's forced to, and he's fighting every voice against him, poisoning people, imprisoning people, even pussy riot. My God! And he reinstated the Ukrainian, not Ukrainian, the Greek Orthodox Church there to try to get people to feel submissive before the Almighty God. I mean, he's he's a monster. Yeah, yeah. But he's still being ringed by hostile American bases, and he's fighting for his existence. The hardest thing for me to accept is that American leadership is not just okay with war, oh, but wants it. Wants it because it wants to defend U.S. capitalists' world hegemony, and that is worth it. And that's what they're fighting for. And it's sad and it's horrible. And they don't, you know, they used to say about Asians, they don't have any respect for human life. Well, capitalists don't either. You know, it, and they need to be defeated like they were at Amazon this week, which is a bright spot indeed. Christian Smalls. Why did he win? What, what did he do? He and Derek Palmer, his organizational partner, what they did is they didn't come in as a 
a group outside and decide they're going to decide what is right for the workers at Amazon. They worked at Amazon. They had both joined hoping for a career in Amazon. Christian Smalls was already an assistant manager. He got on the wrong side when he brought up that they were endangering people of COVID and he got fired for his concern. But what they did was they parked out at the bus stop. They talked to people. They also, many more black people than white people were fired. They also made, um, well, Christian Small's aunt made soul food, made ziti, made baked chicken, made collard greens. They brought West Indian food because there's a big West Indian population there. And they talked to people asking them, what are your concerns? We want you to be represented. What do you care about? What's important to you to change on your job? And they made a platform that is the most democratic thing possible. A platform from the people who were most affected by it, who they wanted to make the decisions about their lives. And I think the reason that the retail union failed in Bessemer is they came in to tell people what they needed and they weren't people who grew up there and they weren't people who knew that job, like Christian Smalls, like Derek Palmer, like all of them. And also they showed their people they were brave. They went to those meetings where, they, where the company was trying to brainwash people by talking about how terrible the union was and they stood up and talked back. And so did the other people from the Amazon labor union. They braved yeah. them. And they got fired, but they did it. And people saw, wow, these are people who stand for us, with us. That's very dramatic and very democratic. The, the retail, wholesale, and department store union, which twice failed to unionize the Amazon Fulfillment Center in Bessemer, Alabama, is run by Stuart Applebaum, who's a graduate of Harvard Law. He also is a vice president of the AFL-CIO. He is also intimate with Andrew Cuomo, worked for Andrew Cuomo, and is a chief counsel for the Democratic National Committee. Yeah. So that says it all. You know, ever since- to negotiate. Let me ask you a personal question. Would you ask Stuart Applebaum to negotiate your raise? Of course not. And ever Why not? Since, because he's not representing my people, my interests. And that's not what he's put his life into. And one of the reasons they won is they're an independent union. The AFL CIO sold out the left in the 50s, kicked them out of the union, and also extinguished the spark in their union by kicking out the leftists the communists who were seen as traitors, the socialists who were seen as fellow travelers, and the leftists who were seen as aiders and abettors. And the union movement started to die. And they became, you know, spies overseas. They lost their representation of the working class. Only people like Sarah Nelson, who called out the democracy of the Amazon labor union and said, of course, they're of the people. And she consulted her uh, flight attendants before she did anything, and which is why she's the most progressive labor leader we have. But of course, I wouldn't want Applebaum to represent my values. Right. The AFL-CIO spied on labor unions in Western Europe for the CIA rooting out the communists. Absolutely. In that's common knowledge. Yes, it is common knowledge. And the working class needs labor. One of the things that I found most exciting about the Amazon labor union and all of the other unions that are trying to form and those that are striking, and also that the parents join the Sacramento teachers and the teachers are joined by the paraprofessionals, that there are these big, labor movements, because without labor, you don't win. In Chile, the socialists won with a unity of labor, the feminist movement, the indigenous movement, the climate movement. He did it. 
right. Boric. They did it. And his, the head, his second in command is a woman who was active with them. And the anti-abortion movement, which is very powerful in Chile. You know, it was a unity, but labor was at its core. And American labor is ahead of everybody else these days. And that's very exciting. And Bernie was the first to congratulate the Amazon labor union. And Chris Smalls was there saying, we got an endorsement from Bernie and everybody was cheering, you know? Right, right. That's beautiful. And they when will lose their millions against him. They will. Yeah. When, when I criticized Stuart Applebaum, the head of the union at Bessemer, they are the retail, wholesale, and department store union. By the way, I have trouble remembering retail, wholesale, and department store union. That's, how, that's what a Harvard Law School diploma gets you. Uh, Christian Smalls, who didn't graduate from Harvard Law, I remember Amazon Labor Union. Absolutely. And Christian Smalls was belittled in the memos because they said he's, we don't have to worry. This guy is inarticulate. He's stupid. He'll never make it. I heard him being interviewed on Economic Update. He's very articulate, but he doesn't talk like Harvard. No, he doesn't. He talks like Staten Island Warehouse Union. And, and he dresses, and he dresses the same. His dress right. is freedom. He's it's freedom. Right. And he's not yeah. trying to look corporate. He's trying to right. look like the people that he that he represents and that he is. And so is Derek Palmer, his co-organizer. They started together because they wanted a career at Amazon together. Right. right. What is the history of racism in the American labor movement? Because so many on the left poo-poo diversity. They think, no, it's class struggle. Diversity is window dressing. Isn't the problem is the isn't the problem with labor, the labor movement? Wasn't it that it wasn't inclusive, that it left out it women? Inclusive. The Knights of Labor, which preceded the AFL, didn't allow work, you know, ordinary workers, only elite workers and skilled workers. And then they eliminated women and uh, from any kind of leadership position. Look, one of the things that Martin Luther King said at when he was talking at the Longshoremen's Union is a real union is the best integrator in the whole world. Black and white together fighting for what we have in common. And I think that the AFL always had that kind of segregation, racism, sexism, and though their chickens have come home to roost in the fact that they have 9% of the workers enrolled, whereas in the 50s, they had 35%. That's a big demotion. And they don't have the passion. The, the, the purpose of a union is solidarity, you, you, is self serving self-interest through solidarity. That's right. You, Solid, there has to be something in it for me to experience, to be willing to experience solidarity. What's in it for me? What's in it for us? And if you were black, if you were a woman, if you were a member of the LGBTQ community, if you were a farm worker, if you were Hispanic, there was nothing in it for you. Bessemer has a history of black unions, but for the most part, the upper echelons there was nothing in it for for people who weren't white straight men so you can't have solidarity without diversity you can't you can't ask the 99% to get on board the labor movement if it's not all inclusive yeah well the longshoremen's union is proof of that in the early years their strikes were broken by strike like breakers who were black and who they wouldn't hire they wouldn't allow. Then they started allowing black people and everyone else, and they won because they had that solidarity. It has to be, we want to win, and we won't win by excluding the mass of others. We are the people. That's what we have, our number. And so 
we have to unite just out of a practical sense or we'll never win. So what we, what we spread around the world isn't democracy, isn't no. freedom. It's not an ideology. We, we spread and we commit our military to fight for the Capital. right, the cheap labor, cheap right. sources of cheap labor and cheap resources for American capitalists. That's who we're fighting and dying for. Right. Right. So, you know, make no mistake. And I think people do sense that they're surrounded by fake news and they are much less involved in this than they are in worrying about inflation and eviction and no raises and danger. We have the highest crime right now in the advanced world. Americans are mentally breaking down as the system breaks down. And we don't have a mental health system that could support anybody. That's right. a whole topic. It's, it's late, but we don't. We have the worst mental health system to support people. A medicalized pharmaceutical hospital doctor and insurance company driven profit system. A market driven health system and people are breaking. American shootings in New York City alone are up 100%. That's thanks, of course, Mayor Adams, police, everything has not exactly succeeded there. And we need to spend more money to fight gun traffickers, that, that, you know, right. as opposed to passing gun control laws. I want to play you a clip that I've been playing on the show that I will continue to play on the show. I, I want your response, and I want to know if you've seen this. This is Congresswoman Katie Porter, who's been on this show. Oh, great, yeah. Right. And, and she was interviewing Dr. Collins from the Commonwealth Fund. I think that's her organization, which for more than a century has been working to expose and improve our rotten health care system. These are a series of questions that Katie Porter posed to Dr. Collins, who is an ally of Dr. So I've played this before. They were at, people asked me, well, is Katie going after Dr. Collins? No, she's just using her as a sounding board. Uh, let me play this for you. Sure. And if we look at just billing costs, just billing and insurance costs, Medicare is at 1%. Wait, private companies spend 17 times more on administrative costs than Medicare? What are private insurance companies spending on that Medicare is not? Does Medicare spend hundreds of millions of dollars on television advertisements like private insurance does? Dr. Collins? No. Does Medicare spend millions of dollars on stock buybacks to shareholders? No. Does Medicare um, spend money on marketing? Private insurance likes to put its name on stadiums and PGA tournaments. Is there a Medicare arena? No. Does Medicare spend $23 million on executive pay like private insurance companies do? No. We know how much it costs to run a high quality health insurance program. One dollar. Out of $100, research shows that Medicare spends 1.1% on administrative costs. We spend $4 trillion on health care every year. We could save $200 billion on administrative costs with Medicare for all. And those savings, they could go to expand Medicare. We could spend that money to let patients see dentists. We could let, spend that money to let patients pay for hearing aids, to help older adults afford eyeglasses, to bring down the cost of prescription drugs, to finally pay mental health professionals for the work they do. Instead, all this money is wasted. We're not talking about paying to keep the lights on in operating rooms or improving the quality of care. All this money is used to, to through pay big insurance to push paper. It's death by 200 billion paper cuts. Now, have you seen that, Dr. Fraud? Have you seen I that clip? I know that. I know what she's talking about, and I haven't seen that clip, and it's just perfectly on point. Is there, anything, is there anything factually incorrect in that clip? No, no. And in fact, she's not even pinpointing some of the things that research is a tiny percent of their budget, 
whereas marketing is huge. And they don't only market with stadiums, they market with very prestigious, well-paid psychiatrists writing articles praising their drugs. And they also market with writing the articles and having the guys sign it or the women sign it. And they also endow chairs and they also have fellowships and they all, they buy it, they buy it. It's they everywhere. advertise on Rachel Maddow and Laura, MSNBC, all, all of MSNBC are drug ads. That's right. And at the end of the articles in the medical journals, they don't say Dr. X is working for Merck, is working for GlaxoSmithKline, is working for all of them. They could list about 10, but they don't have that. Yeah. And so the American people are not told the truth about Medicare for all. No, they're Bernie, not. Bernie could not make the case for Medicare for all. He could not get a two minute speech heard around this country to explain the insanity of our healthcare system. He had a shout over the 18 other Democratic candidates at the debates and nobody, no journalists uh, during the debates, nobody let him explain make the case for Medicare for all. You cannot make the case for Medicare for all in America. You talk about censorship in China. You talk about censorship in Russia. You cannot. Nobody has seen Katie Porter's clip that I just played. I never saw it, but I do know that America has the most expensive health care in the world, and it rates 17th among the developed countries even yeah. though it spends the most. Right. Uh, yeah. But we're the bad, we're the unpatriotic ones who want to save American lives from the corporate predators. We're the ones who are hypercritical of this country for wanting to spend money on our children instead of on bombs to kill children. We're the bad guys. But we According to the mainstream are media. not trying to protect. We're trying to protect people from corporate greed, from capitalism in all of its ugly manifestations. And there we are, the protectors of American people, and we are the patriots. Yeah, we're the real patriots. We are. We're trying to save this place. Not Joe Manchin and not his inbred daughter and wife who profit off pharmaceutical, off the EpiPen, Even who are guilty of guilty. price fixing. That's right. That's right. But it's all in, you know, they have the same priorities. We're trying to save lives. We're trying to fight for life. Yeah. Hey, what do you think about Americans no longer paying, paying their medical bills? What about instead of a general strike, we just say, hey, it's time for a jubilee and just stop we, we we get celebrities hollywood celebrities who you know supposedly they're liberals i'm jennifer aniston and i urge you not to pay your medical bills and we all just don't go together that's right i think that would be great a medicare bill strike everybody would get a crappy credit rating for a while but if everybody has a crappy credit rating there's not much you know you can do about it then the banks can't loan anything and somebody pointed out to me, somebody wrote to me, he said, the reason doctors won't join the nurses is the health insurance companies buy medical practices. That if you're a doctor, you get bought out by the health insurance companies. So the doctors are complicit in killing American people. Yes, they are. Killed by the health insurance companies. Also, Doctors don't act as individual practitioners. They join medical, medical corporate practices. And those practices are trying to enhance their profit. And they fit into the recommending of, like in the mental health system, the psychiatrists use the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, which reduces human misery to little categories that can be medicalized, that fits very neatly 
into the insurance companies that approve medications, but not therapy. And the medications are there for big psychopharma, the most profitable pharmaceutical area, and then put people in the hospitals until their insurance runs out. And so that right. it's, you know, it's a, an interlocking system of four horsemen of the medical apocalypse, doctors, right. hospitals, insurance companies, and big pharma working together to give us an inferior medical system that is market driven and high priced. Right. Before you go, the next year's Academy Awards, you know, I liked the Academy Awards. They talked about diversity yeah. and it was great. Next year's Academy Awards should be about solidarity and everybody should be encouraging Americans to stop paying their medical bills. Just I stop. think that's great. We should stop. We A general are. strike. And uh, well, it's a little dangerous to to figure this one out, but you know, uh, there's a will, be, there's a way. We'll figure it the, out. The health, the health insurance companies would go out of business. They'd come to the federal government for a bailout, and then we'd have single payer. That's right. We well, we'd have to have a powerful socialist movement behind this, because nothing is done without a powerful organization supporting people. But we're getting there. Yes. We're getting there. People are organizing. Doctor, Dr. Harriet Fraud, host of Capitalism Hits Home, and it's not just in your head. How do people contact you? They could look on, go to my website, harrietfraud.com. That's F-R-A-A-D, H-A-R-R-I-E-1-T, fraud.com, or hfraud at gmail.com. God bless you, or and whatever. I bless you, and we all bless each other. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Let us well, Bye -bye. let us now go. Let's go to a better country than America, Canada, where Professor Adnan Hussein is standing by. He is the chairman of the religion department at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. It's good to see you, sir. Good to be with you. Hi, Dr. Fraud. How are you? Hi, I'm very glad to see you. Oh, oh you and we. You've muted yourself. Oops. Sorry, I often miss you because you always have good stuff to say. That oh, I thanks. I'm always glad to overlap with you and hear some wisdom. So thank you so much as ever. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fraud. We'll see you next week, I hope. See you next week. You sure will. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Professor Adnan Hussein, host of the Mudgeless Podcast and Guerrilla History, uh, it looks like Marine Le Pen is surging in France. It looks like Orban in Hungary is reelected. Is that the way it, I haven't it's seen looking? the latest news, but that wouldn't be surprising. Um, we have uh, uh, Anna Lakatos, who on office hours has given us uh, several uh, in-depth accounts of uh, politics of Hungary. And so I'm sure she is watching here closely. And she is indeed in the chat. Right. Maybe we can bring her on later on in the show to talk about Orban. It's good to see you, Anna. Uh, uh, I, I just realized that she, more than anybody else, could talk about Orban. Are we looking for peace in Ukraine, Professor? Is America trying to reach out to Vladimir Putin? Well, I don't know what the government might be doing in back channels and whether they have a line to uh, the negotiations that had been taking place in Istanbul last week and whether some discussions are being made, but all the public pronouncements by government officials seem to be ratcheting up the you know intense um, you know, alignment against um, Russia, demonization of Putin. So we had recent announcement by Biden in some uh, of his public statements that you know, uh, the, uh, you know, International Criminal Court should be 
you know, prepared to try Putin. These are obviously statements that whether you agree with them or not, ultimately from the sense of justice and a narrow or direct interpretation of the law, uh, that invading a neighboring country, aggressive war is indeed a war crime. Uh, these are obviously statements that can do nothing other than um, bolster Putin's desperate sense that he has to achieve victory um, or pay a, a terrible price. And so that's going to encourage him not to uh, seek a solution uh, or negotiate. So I would prefer um, avoiding making statements like that while um, actually discussing what might be in American, you know, in the American media and the public sphere, what might be a possible or reasonable solution. And since none of that is being discussed in um, our politics um, or in our, you know, media, it's hard to draw any kind of conclusion that the United States is prepared or we're preparing its public uh, for peace negotiations and achieving some kind of lasting, durable, equitable, um, you know, stable uh, peace that might, might uh, resolve the situation and bring this war to a quick conclusion. Because no matter what happens, it is going to be devastating for Ukraine. The longer it goes, the more destruction, the more refugees, the more suffering of people, the more loss of life, and also increasingly a sense that um, you know that it that uh, increasing um, the, the intensity and duration of the war only emboldens those who have most to gain from victory, you know, from a foolish idea of being able to achieve victory. So it makes the hardliners, um, you know, even stronger and undermines the possibility of bringing the parties together until you reach maybe some state of exhaustion. But until that happens, the dynamic is encouraging, you know, extreme positions that imagine that there could be victory. And I think that's very dangerous and unhealthy. Right. Can you believe that Joe Biden is saying that Putin should be tried for war crimes? It's astonishing to think of any American president talking about trying some other foreign leader for war crimes when the history of U.S. war crimes, it's never discussed this way, but um, the history of U.S. war crimes um, is so long and well-established um, that it's really um, kind of shocking that there wouldn't be some self-reflection that perhaps you don't want to encourage the idea that um, foreign uh, that, that a political leader uh, could just be uh, taken um, you know to the International Criminal Court and subjected to uh, a trial because um, the US would be very open, I think, um, or US presidents would be very open. To, um, to that charge. Uh, no one thought at, after the Iraq war, um, no one talked about it. Now it's interesting, there were many countries that disagreed with the United States and opposed its decision, you know, including allies like France who are members of NATO, uh, did not join the United States. Nobody at that time, other than, you know, far left fringe people like myself were ever talking about George W. Bush being tried for war crimes or Tony Blair. Um, it just wasn't um, something that was part of diplomatic language, you know, I mean, even in opposition, even those who, who opposed it, uh, they may have condemned the U.S. war, they may have talked about uh, war crimes being committed, but they never really put on the table that George W. Bush himself or other members of the administration like Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, and so on, would actually appear or should appear uh, before a criminal court. Now, obviously, they should have said that, but it just wasn't politically feasible to even imagine such a thing. Right. So the fact no, I... that it's now just commonly part of discourse is really quite quite astonishing and as an index of US power um, in some ways and also lack of, of um, self-reflection. By the media as well, because he said yes. this before reporters at the White House, when he says, you saw what happened in Bucha, this warns him, he's a war criminal. 
the the response should be oh is america going to be a, a signatory now right. to the icc the international criminal court which we are not i doubt the, our white house reporters know that or care i think they just don't care it's hard to think that they wouldn't know that or they you know don't know um about these international institutions at all but i think um that it's what's ironic there is that the United States couldn't be the ones to bring it to the International Criminal Court since they're not signatories, uh, as right. you're pointing out. What is Ramadan? When is it celebrated? Are we in, oh. when does it start? And why is Israel being told to take it easy on the Palestinians right now during Ramadan? Um, well, we can get to the latter in a minute, but just, you know, by way of background, you know, all of these major monotheistic Abrahamic religions have some major tradition of fasting as an ascetic regime that's considered part of, you know, purification, uh, you know, uh, uh, atonement for, for, you know, sinful behavior and trying to improve oneself through discipline and refocusing on matters of the spirit by distancing oneself from one's kind of uh, daily bodily needs and satisfying them through eating, drinking, and so on. So this is a big tradition in each of these religions, whether it's Lent or Yom Kippur. And so in Islam, Ramadan is the season for fasting. Every religion does it in slightly different ways. Um, so for Ramadan, which is a, a month, a lunar month that has that started on um, uh, Saturday, um it um uh begins from before dawn uh to sunset every day uh for a month um where you don't eat or drink um during the day during those hours of the day and of course there are extra special extra prayers and various other things that people do and they celebrate usually um the breaking of the fast in the evening um, with uh, meals with friends and family. Um, and it's a time for community. And it's the end of the month is celebrated and marked by a three day festival called Eid al Fitr. I see. And so, yeah. in terms of the other question um, about why, um, I guess we're in the era of the uh, kinder, gentler occupation, I suppose. Uh, so one doesn't want to um, offend the uh, you know, religious sensibilities uh, of the people you're occupying. You just want to take away their human rights. Now, I saw something. Now, there, there seems to be uh, a stirring of a new intifada. There seems to be shootings coming from uh, supposedly Israeli citizens who are Arabs, who supposedly were trained by ISIS. Who knows if that is correct? What stunned me, and it, I, it shouldn't stun me, is what's going on in the West Bank, that settlers decided to, to just loot a farm and blow up cars i think they killed somebody and they were uh their hands were held by the israeli defense force just pure vigilantism but uh taking it out on innocent palestinians who had nothing to do with any of the shootings uh and no prosecution of these israeli settlers uh and the message <laughs> i'm laughing because it's just so wrong the message is take it easy it's ramadan don't uh don't commit any of these extrajudicial crimes in the west bank during ramadan uh kind of shocking uh but not so much would it it's not wouldn't it be shocking if you keep track of what's going on in gaza and the west bank well i guess you know maybe what we have to think of um the policy or how to characterize such a policy, um, you know, what comes to mind is uh, Matt, one of Max Blumenthal's, I think he uh, uh, may have written a book by this, by this title, The Management of Savagery. And I think that's kind of what we're 
talking about when we're in the realm of, well, you know, try and keep things uh, under wraps during Ramadan. Don't, you know, do outrageously aggressive things that might bring unnecessary or unwanted attention in the way we're administering the occupation in the West Bank. And so it suggests to me that what we're talking about is something like the management of a savage system uh, in such a way to make it sustainable. Uh, what they don't want is another uprising like we had the Al-Aqsa Intifada and other occasions you know, afterward or when there were um, bombardments of Gaza and it got a lot of attention around the world um, because that of course reminds people that while we're um, very concerned about the plight of people in um, Ukraine, that there are a number of other places around the world where there are long-standing uh, occupations, invasions, uh, violations of human rights, uh, and we don't want to remember that it's been, you know, in various ways, uh, you know, since uh, 1948 that the Palestinian people have been suffering um, this kind of subordination, dispossession, um, and have been made refugees since since that time. So I think. This is actually a good period. Uh, I heard one, one in fact, may have, may have been Max Blumenthal who mentioned that um, when you see that there are so many Ukraine flags all across like Europe and you know even in rural areas in Northern New York, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, I was in the United States visiting some family and, and relatives. Um, you know, we, we saw Ukraine, um, well, you see occasionally your sub, your Confederate flags, and you also see Ukraine flags, basically. And you um, have to wonder um, about the attention. Obviously, I don't blame the individual people that they have uh, ignored all these other uh, issues or problems, whether it's Yemen or, or, or Palestine uh, or Congo. Uh, but none of these are placed before them in the media. So you can understand why people are focusing on this particular issue, because that's what's being brought to their attention. Uh, but the fact that, you know, in our public media, in our public policy, uh, these other problems um, uh, are never discussed, and we don't see the same kind of sympathy and outpouring and acceptance and welcome of refugees um, is, of course, uh, disturbing. And what we see instead is that, you know, kind of liberals have found their Palestine, you know, for the moment. They found a Palestine, you know, where they can virtue signal, express sympathy, uh, convince themselves of their concern for uh, human rights and the suffering of others without actually having to stretch themselves to really take in. You know, uh, into account the real state of the world, um, which is, you know, everywhere, you know, so many places around uh, the global south, you see the management of savagery. Yeah, yeah. Jake Sullivan, the uh, president's uh, national security advisor, said today with authority that the next stage of the war, I'm quoting here, uh, will be protracted and will likely continue to include wanton and brazen attacks on civilian targets. So we knew Putin was going to invade. Mm -hmm. and now we're certain that the, the conflict will be protracted with more war crimes. What are we hearing any calls for uh, meeting with Putin? I mean, is could there could Jake Sullivan, Anthony Blinken, Secretary of State Biden, could they make a convincing argument that there's no negotiating with Putin, that this is exactly what the man wants and there's nothing we can offer him to to stop the fighting? Well, I think the. Um... I think the Russian government has had a pretty clear position, you know, since 2014 about what they wanted and what they thought would be an acceptable solution. And um, there also was the Minsk agreement, of course, that we uh, have heard about that neither side ended up enforcing. And I think really, I think successive uh, Ukrainian governments have, you know, undermined it and indicated that they don't really plan to abide by it. Um, but there has been a fairly consistent set of objectives, I think, um, 
that has been announced. Um, so I think that could be a basis for the beginnings of discussion. It doesn't mean that everything that the Russians have put out there is acceptable for them needs to be granted, but uh, ignoring the discussion and ignoring and, and, and creating a kind of dynamic in which most people who would watch the nightly news are convinced that Putin is an unreasonable uh, Hitler wannabe is, of course, not going to prepare people for what has to be the inevitable conclusion of the situation, some kind of agreement eventually, whether it's, in, you know, in the coming days and weeks or in months. And I'm very discouraged by these pronouncements and predictions that we're entering a phase of the war that will be extended and attenuated because that suits the United States that doesn't have anything, you know, any, you know, the United States doesn't seem to have a reason to end this um, or come to negotiations as long as other people are doing the fighting. Um, and they can use this to weaken uh, Russia. I would say that I think, um, you know, we've been mentioning on this this show that uh, uh, it seems as if they want to give uh, Russia a sort of replay of the Afghanistan situation um, and mobilize world opinion, volunteers and soldiers of fortune and pouring poor weapons into, into Ukraine to replay what essentially happened in the 1980s. Um, but, you know, um, while that was a very costly and difficult war for Russia, um, some recent scholarship suggests that the wild and exaggerated accounts of uh, Afghanistan, the Afghanistan imbroglio and Brzezinski's plan as the, you know, cause of the collapse of the Soviet Union really misunderstands what was happening and the choices that Gorbachev had. Uh, and it, you know, gives too much credit to the, it, it's natural that the United States would uh, subscribe to and promote a narrative that aggrandizes the U.S. role in defeating communism, as it were. And, you know, new, newer scholar, historical scholarship that analyzes the situation suggests that while, of course, um, the Soviet Union had a lot of weaknesses and certain kinds of economic limitations, and the war uh, was concerning and unpopular, that it itself really wasn't um, a key, the key factor. It may have been a contributing factor, but a lot of it had to do with a desire for reform that predated, you know, and was building, predated um, the actual intervention in Afghanistan and that it was a choice of Gorbachev and that the Russians typically to this day do not look at that as having been defeated by the United States, but of having made this decision to try and end the destructive Cold War and turn a new page you know, in history for global peace and so on and reform of their society. That, uh, so I think if we're thinking that uh, Putin's Russia um, will simply be uh, undermined by an, a long and exhausting and uh, difficult war in Ukraine because it works supposedly in Afghanistan. I think it misunderstands the political situation potentially inside Russia. I mean, the fact is, is that under Gorbachev, there was an appetite for some kind of change and reform. What we're seeing now is that while there are some fissures and there are you know, groups that have uh, expressed, uh, you know, uh, dislike of the war, opposition to the war, and some people have been arrested, that opinion polls and so on do not seem to suggest that Putin is under political pressure. In fact, it looks like the opposite, that he has managed to shore up a weakening position because of economic problems and other things that had put him into the lower 60s uh, in popularity, that it's rising now to the 70s since the start of the war. So this could be another big miscalculation. And this is quite a part from all of the devastating consequences that the Brzezinski gambit you know, had on the United States. I mean, we're just talking about whether this works on Russia. And I, I would say that there's historical evidence that this isn't, a, a, you know, an appropriate assessment of, of strategy here. And, um, you know, the devastating consequences that it had for the Afghanis, that cannot be doubted. That was horrific for them. And just like, just so, it is horrific for the Ukrainians. 
Um, and then on top of it, um, you know, it trained up um, dangerous people. We've talked about this before. Um, the so-called unintended consequences that Hillary Clinton mentioned in her recent interview, approving of the strategy of essentially trying to attenuate the war, arming Ukrainians and sending volunteers uh, and so on there to bleed Russia. Uh, she approved of this strategy, thought it had worked, but unfortunately, of course, it did have some unintended consequences. I would suggest it didn't have really the intended consequences in a direct way, but those unintended consequences uh, are not uh, immaterial. If Zbigniew Brzezinski were still alive and he came on the show and I said to him, you take pride in tricking Russia, the Soviet Union, into invading Afghanistan, and that trick created a quagmire, you say, similar to Vietnam, which ended up decimating the Soviet Union. You take pride in that. And he'd say, yes, I do. And I'd say, what are the consequences for this? And he'd say, the fall of the Soviet Union. And I'd say, what were the adverse reactions? What's the blowback for America? What is the single biggest piece of blowback to arming the Mujahideen and Osama bin Laden? What, what, what was the big blowback to Zbigniew Brzezinski's plan? Well, I think you've named, you know, what the big blowback was, uh, is that um, it unleashed uh, years of uh, civil war and conflict in Afghanistan uh, that allowed, um, you know, the Mujahideen groupings to train and, um, you know, in fact, actually, what's interesting <clears throat> is the Mujahideen also believed in that big narrative. They thought they brought down the Soviet Union single-handedly, that it was their doing that one of the global superpowers was destroyed, that they had ended the you know, era of world communism on a global scale, and that they were these major figures in history. And filled with that sort of triumphalism, much like the United States, filled with that kind of triumphalism, felt that it could impose upon Russia you know, this neoliberal regime and privatize everything and show them the way to a glorious, you know, capitalist uh, future that ultimately destroyed their, you know, way of life, their standard of living, uh, you know, reduced the expected uh, li life expectancy for, for men by about a decade. Um, in the same way that, you know, the US thought it won, so it could now do whatever it wanted. There was another group that also felt that they had played, you know, a dramatic role in the history of the world. And they thought, we've brought down communism, let's bring down capitalism too, you know? I mean, there was the, so what, you, what, they, what we created was um, a monster that would become, you know, the next 20 years of conflict for us, you know? Well, maybe not 20 yeah. years, about 20 years, actually. Did the Mujahideen uh, splinter off or morph into Al Qaeda? Uh, no, yes, they they are definitely um, the you know there are of course when we say Mujahideen we're just talking about those who fought and and um, uh, resisted the Russian the Soviet occupation in Afghanistan. But and who what I was speaking Mujahideen? about are, are they? the the recruits the that came from other places in the Arab and Muslim world were trained by the CIA, financed by the Saudis and the drug, you know, kind of profits of heroin production in Afghanistan. Um, they, you know, were there for ideological reasons. They were not there, you know, for national liberation, defense of their homeland. They were there for ideological reasons that were encouraged by the United States and by you know, Salafist uh, Muslim preachers uh, around, you know, the, the, the Middle East Islamic world. And so um, in that environment was incubated uh, a movement that believed that the liberation of the rest of the Middle East could not take place 
without destroying the support that kept these military dictators and oppressive rulers who resisted a fair and just society and Islamic law, these all things went together for them, um, that you had to, since they had actually, first what happened was, was not that, you know, the reason why it took like 10 years or so for 9-11 is that first they began to leave Afghanistan, return to their home countries and want to carry the revolutionary spirit um, of defeating these kind of secular military uh, regimes in their own countries, particularly Egypt. Um, and so you had during the <clears throat> late 80s and through the 90s, you had attempts by various radical jihadist groups uh, to just, you know, to bring down the Mubar you know, Mubarak's uh, uh, Egyptian government. Um, this would be the Islamic Brotherhood that well, it's not the Islamic Brotherhood, but it's offshoots and breakaway movements that are much more radicalized. I mean, the Muslim Brotherhood traditionally believed that you first have to reform society before you could uh, expect the government to change. So they put their efforts into social programs, education, uh, and the transformation of society. But there were other groups that, you know, decided that the state was the foundation of society and that you could transform the this, this society by taking over the state and implementing and using the institutions of the state to, you know, change society and reform it. And those more radical ones are the ones who, you know, were led by somebody like Ayman al-Zawahiri, in fact, um, who very interestingly, I mean, was, uh, you know, this was not some kind of minor dissident. This is somebody who comes from the elite of Egyptians. He's an ophthalmologist, Egyptian. an ophthalmologist, right? Oh, well, I think you're thinking of, uh, well, yeah, actually, was I forget his specialty, but I think I maybe think you're thinking of this. Was he an ophthalmologist? I think he okay. was, because I, I remember making a joke about Mullah Umar. Oh, having, right, yes, okay. And then, like 20, right Clearly they didn't get along because he did nothing for Mullah Omar's, you know. Yeah. Well, they couldn't see eye to eye because no. he was, okay, I, <laughs> these are jokes that I wrote. Okay, yes, yes. Right after nine But, I mean, I guess my point was, is that they were, they were defeated by these brutal dictatorships, whether it was in Syria, Libya, you know, Egypt, they were defeated by these brutal dictatorships that, you know, well practiced in torture and, you know, you know, the suppression, you know, they're essentially occupations of their own of their own countries, you know, in, in, in many ways. But they decided that it was impossible to defeat them. And so the reason why they couldn't defeat them is because they were supported by the United States. They were armed and trained. You know, their armed forces were supplied and trained by by the U.S. And so they decided that they needed to weaken that relationship and, uh, um, you know, destroy these governments by attacking first the far enemy rather than the near enemy. So this is what was incubated by the US's strategy of trying to use uh, radical Islamic uh, uh, ideas um, to mobilize uh, and recruit uh, resistance to the Soviet Union. So how straight a line we do. We have to wrap it up because Peter B. Collins is coming up next. How straight a line is there between Zbigniew Brzezinski making the chess move to trick the Soviet Union into invading Afghanistan and 9/11? How straight is that line? Well, I think it, it's it's quite a straight line that follows multiple points along the way. They're not one step. You know, there are multiple points, but these are logical. I mean, there are decisions made along the way, Mis other mistakes, other decisions made along the way, but this put in place uh, in, in created the conditions and um, uh, you know, set up perfectly uh, what you know, would be sown later. It sowed the seeds for you know, what was harvested later. And you could definitely say that uh, the policies uh, were designed, whatever they were going to achieve, designed to create a militant global internationalist jihadi movement that no one that seems to have thought, how would you demobilize this group once you've created it, once you've trained it, once you've armed it, once you've given it an opportunity to really become experienced in battle and 
after you know the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Soviet occupation to create a sense of triumphal historical importance and significance that then would move on to other, other targets. In conclusion, Professor, Ayman al-Zarahi, who helped found al-Qaeda, ophthalmologist, the leader of Syria, Assad, ophthalmologist, Rand Paul, Rand Paul, Dr. Rand Paul, ophthalmologist, my brother-in-law, Larry, an ophthalmologist. Who knew? There is no such thing as a good ophthalmologist. That's how, that's what I've decided. There's I guess the only good ophthalmologist is a blind ophthalmologist. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. That's great. Uh, Professor Adnan Hussein is... Where is he appearing? Where is he doing stand-up? I know. <laughs> love your uh, show. Come on. <laughs> Uh, Professor Hanan Hussein is chairman of the religion department at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, and he has two podcasts, the Mudgeless podcast and Guerrilla History. Plug away, sir. Well, I just would encourage everyone to listen to the most recent episode of Guerrilla History about the French elections, since we were talking about them. Marlon Ettinger has some brilliant analysis and great questions from my co-hosts. And, um, you know, uh, Marine Le Pen is uh, now the sort of so-called acceptable, moderate, far-right option. And that's the kind of <laughs> politics we're dealing with now compared and to that's, Eric Zemmour. That's a win for Putin, isn't it? Well, I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure I look at the world, you know, entirely in those uh, uh, frameworks. It's a loss for, you know, many of us. But frankly, to be honest, according to, you know, Marlon Ettinger, uh, you know, if you if if Macron wins, it just means the discourse will be a little more polite. But essentially, the the positions and policies he's uh, taken up mirror uh, Marine Le Pen's. So really we're just right. at least we're getting um you know an honest account of the aspirations of 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 the far right which is not so far off uh the centrist positions in the current spectrum of france of french politics it is an honor to have you on the show professor adnan hussein thank you My so pleasure. much thanks so much thank you and we will plug rahima with uh our next guest, Peter B. Collins. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. We will return with Bay Area Radio Hall of Famer, Peter B. Collins. Looking forward to talking to him. We'll be right back after this music from the brilliant professor, Mike Steinell, who will not be joining us tonight. That, uh, that pisses me off. I'm a poor scene gourmand of the art of romance. I'm a maestro of the boudoir when I take off my pants. All of this is true, all of the above. I wouldn't lie to you, cause I'm a pig for love. My appetite's rapacious, but my capacity is dim. I seem so audacious, some call me Gentleman Jim. When all is said and done, and the push comes to shove, I'm second to none, cause I'm a pig for love. He's a pig for love. Thank you. 
Suspicious, please pardon me if I'm somewhat repetitious, like a hand in a glove. I'm a pig for love. Yeah, I'm a pig for love. Thank you, Professor Mike Steinel. Joining us is Peter B. Collins, Bay Area Radio Hall of Famer. 28 diet plan helped me lose 28 what is pounds. Going on here? It helps control your appetite, so you lose weight. Yet AIDS lets you taste, chew, and share. And the appetite depressant in AIDS is not a stimulant. You've lost control, Mr. Feldman. And it doesn't contain anything to make me nervous. Oh, I Question. know what Why take diet pills when you can enjoy it's an AIDS? AIDS commercial. Without making you jittery. Okay. Now can you hear yes. me? Yeah, enjoy AIDS. Do you remember AIDS? Yes, I do. The, it was a candy. AIDS. It was a diet candy. I just had a switch. I'm having a bad day today with many Uh-oh. things. Uh-oh. And my software, my software is just not, I need a new computer. So anyway, I the AIDS diet candy ad <laughs> accidentally. I have played it on the show, but... <laughs> Re- refresh everybody's memory about well, the AIDS candy. Well, AYDS was a weight loss product that was heavily advertised on radio and television until AIDS came along. And that yeah. forced uh, a, uh, a brand change. I think it killed the brand. I don't know that it was changed to another name. So, I think you're right. David, was that your dinner break uh, while Mike Steinel was playing Pigs for Love? That was my dinner break. Wow. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're amazing. Uh, you really are. No. Well, no, you're amazing. By the way, it almost happened to Corona beer. COVID oh, yeah. Was, yeah. Was, was old Corona. And I thought, is this going to destroy Corona? Uh, so what would you like to talk about tonight? I'm, I'm a little, uh, well, not, I can't access my email now. Okay. So. Well, I have I have a couple of things up my sleeve, and I'm wearing a short sleeve shirt. Um, okay. But I'd like to tag on to just briefly what you and Adnan were discussing. One is there are two L's in ophthalmology. <laughs> oh, I mispronounced it. Well, if if we're being actually precise, uh, I once okay. did a video narration for the American Association of Ophthalmologists. And they, uh, they made sure I knew how to pronounce that word. Uh, also, I posted in the chat a link to an archive podcast that I recently dug up uh, and put on the homepage at peterbcollins.com uh, regarding what the uh, stress fractures were that broke the Soviet Union. And Professor Serhei Plochy, who uh, is a Ukrainian native who teaches history at Harvard, uh, published a book about Chernobyl. And it's like a novel. It takes you through the sequence of the uh, events that led to the meltdown. But beyond that, he builds a case that it was Chernobyl that actually caused Gorbachev to Uh, embrace glasnost because he had no choice. And the reason is that the radiation uh, was carried by the wind to the Nordic countries where scientists were deeply alarmed by the levels of radiation in the lower atmosphere. And this kept, you know, they kept pounding the Kremlin, uh, which of course controlled Ukraine at that time. It was part of the orbit of the USSR. 
And the, you know, the Kremlin said, oh, nothing wrong. Uh, you know, we shut down our reactors, but uh, no, nothing to worry about. But as the uh, uh, impact of the disaster grew and the footprint of the radiation spread, uh, really Moscow had no choice. And I think it's an interesting and provocative argument. I put it in the category of the 1419 project that it's a different way to frame history that doesn't necessarily displace uh, other analyses or arguments. And so yes, bogging down uh, the Soviet Union in Afghanistan was Zbig Brzezinski's big idea. It's also linked and, and I would invite Adnan, in fact, it looks like he's still on the Zoom, but if you wanna jump back in Adnan, What's interesting to me is that people have analyzed uh, uh, Brzezinski's ideas and uh, come away believing that it was bigger than just uh, the uh, quagmire in Afghanistan. It was uh, starting a, a global conflict between Shia and Sunni. So Adnan, I'd, I'd be interested in your comments on that because that does seem to be one of the arcs that originates with the U.S. covert operations that uh, kept the Soviets locked down in Afghanistan for so long. Well, that's a very interesting um, suggestion. I like the idea that Chernobyl may have had uh, an important uh, effect um, that hasn't often. I do, I do remember, yeah. sorry to interrupt, I do remember there was, I think, avian flu in China that had not spread worldwide, but they referred to it possibly as who's Chernobyl. They thought that would bring down the, the who's government. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not, so go ahead. So you're mm -hmm. saying, Professor Hussein, Peter B. Collins is saying that Zbigny Brzezinski plotted a, a war between the Shiites and the Sunnis. Uh, wouldn't, wasn't the animus already there between Shia and Sunni? Uh, well, I mean, of course, that's like saying um, Catholics and Protestants wasn't the animus there. Uh, of course, right. there is historical basis, doctrinal differences, and historical conflict that um, you have to take into account. But that doesn't mean that you put a pro you know, you know, Protestants and Catholics uh, just by their own will definitely, uh, you know, uh, compete and you know start wars with one another. I mean, that's part of a particular period of history, the wars of religion in Europe, for example. Uh, similarly, Sunni and Shia, there have been periods of rapprochement, of, you know, um, cooling of, of hostilities, or even of um, coming together with uh, doctrinal ideas that overlapped. And uh, there are many mixed societies that have not been riven by conflict. I think what's happened in the modern period, and also the period of greatest uh, uh, I don't know, I guess you could say uh, animosity was actually in the early modern period after the init initial schism because the Ottomans made Sunni Islam the official state doctrine and religion and um, opposed uh, Iran, which under Shah Ismail and the Safavids adopted uh, Shiism as the official state religion uh, for Iran, and because these were two regional powers competing for Iraq, essentially, uh, they ended up coming into conflict and uh, exacerbating the terms of the conflict in, in Shi'i Sunni, uh, schismatic terms. Um, and so, but, you know, after the 15th, 16th century, this was, has not been such a live conflict. It's in the modern period, during the period of the Iranian Revolution, which initially really presented itself, even though it happened in Iran and because of Shi'i scholars like Khomeini and others leading a popular revolution to establish the new Islamic Republic of Iran, it had a broader basis. I mean, it did not emphasize Sunni Shi'i differences. It tried to create 
forms of Islamic doctrine that could appeal to both and uh, present them in an anti-imperialist politics, you know, was an, you know, against the U.S. control of Iran and likewise the U.S. involvement and domination of the, of the Middle East, also, of course, through proxy or allied powers like Israel. And so it had a larger vision of the Middle East as free from foreign intervention that it thought it could make common cause with uh, Sunnis on. And it was, in fact, actually inspiring politically and religiously in many ways among, you know, Sunni Muslims all across the Islamic world initially. However, the United States, you know, um, uh, supporting the conservative Gulf monarchies and especially Saudi Arabia, um, essentially tried to emphasize the traditional Salafist Wahhabi hostility towards Shi'is, which we see even to this day when the execution, when the Saudis executed those 81, you know, the Saudi government executed 81 people just a couple of weeks ago, the vast majority of them were Shi'is from the Saudi Shi'i minority in, in, uh, in uh, uh, Saudi. Uh, so they, you know, uh, exacerbated this uh, kind of conflict and portrayed Iran as a threat to Sunni control of the rest of the Arab Middle East and talked about a Shia, Shi'i crescent because of Hezbollah and uh, Syria being pro-Iran during this period and being ruled by a religious minority that while not like obviously a Shi'i movement is one of the kind of medieval splinters of kind of, uh, you know, the Shi'i stream of piety. And so yeah. they characterized all of this as a Shi'i crescent that was designed, you know, to dominate uh, the Sunnis. And so they characterized and portrayed this as one of sectarian rivalry when there were a lot of other geopolitical, you know, kinds of reasons for their conflict that were, of course, exacerbated by U.S. support and alliance to try and hem in Iran. Uh, so, Yes, there is the Shi'i Sunni split, but you have to see that as something being manufactured, not because it didn't exist in terms of doctrinal differences and ritual differences, but it became politically meaningful because of changing geopolitical circumstances. You know, you have long periods of, you know, Sunnis and Shi'is uh, getting along fine and those differences not mattering all that much. It's but, interesting but, because when Zbigniew Brzezinski was in the Carter administration, the hostages were taken by Iran. They were Shiites. We felt crippled by that. And so the idea is that Zbigniew Brzezinski ginned up more competition between Saudi Arabia and Iran, yeah. Saudi Arabia being Sunni, to... Well, what? if you recall, if you recall when Juan Cole was a guest on the show, uh, maybe a year ago at this point, um, not his most recent appearance, but his February uh, last year, February 2021, I think he came on and he talked a little bit about how the Iranian revolution was seen for many as a kind of popular social right. protest you know, it had a lot of class implications and what they right. were decrying about the Saudis was not, oh, they're Sunnis and they believe the wrong thing. What they decried was that the Saudis were, you know, oppressing the people, keeping all of the wealth to themselves and doing nothing about the rampant inequality and lack of development in the wider, you know, region. And so it was a kind of class analysis in some ways. And that had to be derailed because, I mean, that had a a real chance to create a popular sort of front. This is exactly what we talk about in the 50s and 60s of the Arab Cold War, is that there were radical, popular, you know, often unfortunately military, but socialist regimes that came to power on a platform of meeting the needs of the people and breaking the feudal powers of the earlier oligarchic or post-Ottoman kind of ruler, you know, rulership, the kings that were in place or the ones who the British put in during the mandate, you know, period uh, versus the Gulf monarchies that were allied with the West and who were in place because of first British kind of support and power and then subsequently the U.S. support and power. 
And so really the story of the Middle East is of these populist attempts to establish social justice in various forms uh, that have often sometimes and often been derailed during the Cold War period by exacerbating religious conflict to divide people. In much the same way in the United States, we get racial conflict as a way of dividing the working class. Peter? Well, what I was going to say is that uh, the U.S. either uh, was stunningly brilliant and cynical or uh, just totally ignorant as we decapitated the uh, government of the Sunni minority in Iraq and tried to install uh, a U.S. style democracy uh, run by Shiites who are, uh, you know, much more loyal to Iran. And this seemed to be another expression of efforts to uh, militarize or weaponize that divide between, uh, do you say Shi'i instead of Shia? In the US media, they typically say Shia. Yeah, Shia is for the collective group. Shi'i is the modifier. So uh, okay, like an you. adjective, mm -hmm. yeah, Shi'i, Muslim. Mm -hmm. So uh, what's your comment on that, Adnan, related to Iraq and the US? Uh, divide and uh, blunder strategy. Well, that exactly um, exacerbated, it was exactly the same dynamic that I was mentioning between Iran and the rest of the Middle East is that by, you know, uh, decapitating the state, toppling it, destroying the institutions, demobilizing, you know, the largest employer, uh, you know, in the country, which was the army, uh, sending all these people home with no, you know, no paycheck and, you know, no social support to their own devices, uh, that immediately uh, forms of organization outside of the state um, uh, became, you know, political. The way you could survive was banding together with others who you shared some kind of group identity with. And in the new dem democratic politics of the, you know, elections and the state created by the pro uh, coalition provisional authority, uh, first under Bremer and then, you know, in subsequent. Oh, remember versions. him? Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> Paul Bremer. Um, oh, God that what it did was it, it encouraged um, the politicization of your religious identity for the sake of parliamentary politics and establishing a block and ensuring that your community would have representation and not be left out of the spoils of the new state and the aid that was flowing from the United States. Mm -hmm. And so it exacerbated these divisions that you know, yes, they existed as different groupings, but if you talk to any Iraqis who were educated in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, is they did not refer to themselves principally. There were an awful lot of intermarriages, which is, I think, one of the major social signs of these kinds of forms of identity not having the same social purpose and utility that they would in other conditions. So, you know, we had a different circumstance where people didn't identify principally or first through their religious or confessional community or identity. Um, uh, you know, they were Arabs. There was this ideology of Arab nationalism. And of course that left out the Kurds and there were other, you know, ethnic minority groups and linguistic minority groups that would be suppressed under such a system. But this was a system that, you know, de-emphasized these religious divisions. These religious divisions that of course exist socially became important and significant politically in the post US invasion political environment and the system that they created. And so when we talk about, oh, you know, you know, it was a way for the US to sort of um, deny responsibility. It's like, well, we tried to give these people democracy and, you know, get rid of the boogeyman, you know, who'd been uh, oppressing them. But, you know, in the end, alas, despite our best intentions and doing so much, uh, spending our blood and treasure to free them, uh, they weren't capable of democracy because they you know, just fell prey to their atavistic, you know, internecine conflict, you know, when in fact, actually, the US created the conditions for those to be meaningful in ways that for a generation, they hadn't really been that significant to people. Yeah. Very interesting. Thanks, Adnan. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. 
So let's well, talk about I Rahima, know. David, because uh, <laughs> yes, yes, you you often turn to me for that, and uh, yeah. I want you to know that I have tested the donate button at rahima.org, and it is working as of about thirty minutes ago. And so you I got want... your tax refund? No, I, I'm I'm advancing the money. I have a little extra cash. Uh, no, I am I'm honoring the commitment I made a week ago, and I want to invite other listeners to test out the donate button at rahima.org and do it at the level that you're comfortable with. Uh, but uh, we have learned about this great organization started by Adnan's mother, and it's uh, pretty much a, a family affair still. And they just do a lot of great work in helping uh, uh, keeping that uh, little fire under the melting pot here in the good old U.S. of A. The good old U.S. of A, Mr. Collins, is responsible, conservatively speaking, for about 60 million refugees. Our yes. war on, am I overstating the number? No, the number is higher than that now because that was the number when Ai Weiwei released his documentary human flow, and I think that was at least three years ago. And uh, we know that there are millions of Ukrainians uh, internally displaced. The estimates uh, seem to be up around 5 million of those who have left the country. And uh, that- An argument could be made that we're not responsible for the Ukrainian, I'm talking about the war on terror. Yes. Then, then, well, the, the total of 60 million that was accurate a couple of years ago is not entirely American uh, responsibility. Uh, I would say somewhere between half and maybe 40 percent uh, is because of the wars of choice, Iraq, Afghanistan, and then uh, the takedown of Gaddafi and the involvement in the U.S. in Syria. So. Right. That's that's a way to ballpark those numbers. So since we've created with our tax dollars millions upon millions of refugees, the ones who are lucky enough to make it here because we don't let in too many, they're not necessarily all that welcomed here. They it, it must be harder for them. And Rahima dot org provides refugees uh, with food. There's a food pantry. Mm -hmm. They also provide uh, snack packs for children of, of healthy food. And uh, Adnan just put a note in the chat here that some of the Afghan refugees have been who've been trying to get to the United States are finally uh, making their way here. And some have reached Silicon Valley, which is where Rahima is established. And uh, we know that we haven't done enough to support uh, those who came from Afghanistan. Uh, and like the Ukrainians, uh, they, they left with a suitcase, uh, maybe some important uh, papers and whatever cash uh, they happen to have. And the big difference is, and, uh, you know, some people are uncomfortable when I point this out, but uh, the Afghans are not white. And the uh, reception, uh, you were talking about Viktor Orban in Hungary, who appears to be on track for another term. Uh, he is the poster boy for that hypocrisy, that uh, he has welcomed the Ukrainian refugees who have landed in Hungary. And he was the most aggressive in uh, uh, building fences and, uh, you know, removing refugees at gunpoint who were trying to transit Hungary uh, over the last uh, five to seven years. So uh, this is a critical problem. The UN is, uh, you know, designed to address it, but is not clearly up to the task. And so it falls to uh, private charities and generous individuals to try to fill those gaps. Yes. Earlier in the show, I quoted you, and I just want to double check, and then we'll talk about 
whatever uh, you want to talk about. You said that the the that the Benghazi hearings, the Benghazi investigation, seemed confusing because we kept saying, "What was this about? What was this about?" And you said it was all about tricking Hillary into admitting that when she was Secretary of State, she illegally funneled weapons to rebels in Syria. Is that basically what you said? Um, Not quite. What I said was that that they had her over a barrel, and it's a, a, uh, a barrel of secrecy. And it's a barrel that was built in Langley by the Central Intelligence Agency. And that is that Hillary knew that the CIA was taking weapons from Gaddafi's military and and facilities. And what Seymour Hersh referred to, they were running a rat line to transfer those uh, weapons to the uh, moderate rebels, as we jokingly refer to them, in Syria. And so the, you know, uh, often described uh, 11 hour hearing, Trey Gowdy was the junkyard dog for the Republicans who chaired that committee. And they kept trying to, uh, you know, force her to, you know, reject the talking points that she had been given by the CIA that prevented her from admitting that we had this CIA facility just a, a mile or two from the consulate in Benghazi. So Gowdy knew it, Hillary knew it, but the rules of engagement were that she couldn't talk about it publicly. And so there was this big game of just trying to embarrass her uh, because clearly the talking points provided by that other agency were bullshit. And so, (coughs) pardon me, she was forced to defend that bullshit over the course of those hearings. And so the Obama administration would have been guilty of the very same thing Reagan was guilty of, or similar to funneling weapons to rebel groups without permission from Congress. The distinction is that uh, Congress had passed the Boland Amendment which explicitly right. prevented that kind of transfer. I'm not aware of any such uh, uh, congressional action or even an internal policy that was in effect vis-a-vis Libya and Syria. Right, right. And, and David, while we're uh, cleaning up things from last week, I wanted to acknowledge that I made a mistake. I mixed up the Zelaya family in Honduras with the Hernandez family. And I was talking about how early in her first year as Secretary of State, Mrs. Clinton uh, pulled a maneuver in Honduras where the sitting president, Jose Manuel Zelaya, who's known as Mel, was uh, hustled out of the country in his, his jammies. And they kept him out of the country until they could install Uh, this guy, Juan Orlando Hernandez. So uh, the families matter because Jose Zelaya, Mel, uh, went into exile, later returned to Honduras, and his wife, whose name begins with an X, Ziomara uh, de Zelaya, she is actually now the president of the country, and he is the first gentleman So uh, it's been a a cycle of dynasties kind of checkerboarding the presidency of Honduras. So the immediate past president, who is Juan Orlando Hernandez, is now being investigated for his connections to his brother, Tony, who has been convicted in the United States of narco trafficking and is currently serving a lengthy sentence in a U.S. federal prison. So uh, I wanted to clear that up because I had misstated that it was uh, Zelaya who is the one who was installed by Clinton and Obama, and I had that wrong. Uh, Before we move on, 
I want to ask you if you ever interviewed Freeway Rick Ross or uh, the author of Dark Alliance, Gary Webb from the San Jose Mercury News, and ever touched on the story that the the uh, the Contras, with the help of the CIA, were dumping crack cocaine in the inner cities to fund the war against the Sandinistas. Did you touch on that? I ever? never, I never met or spoke with uh, Freeway Ricky Ross. I've seen him interviewed in uh, you know other places. Uh, I did know Gary Webb. And I interviewed him at least twice about his work on the, uh, the Contra drug running story. Also, um, when I was at KMBR in <laughs> San Francisco, which was uh, during the 92 presidential cycle, where Bill Clinton um, edged out Ross Perot and uh, George H.W. Bush, uh, I did cover the... Uh, investigative reporting related to the airport in Mena, M-E-N-A, Mena, Arkansas. And we do have solid corroboration now that the Mena airport was a transit point for the guns that were sent south and the blow that was imported to the U.S. Uh, so I, I do- we were, flying, we were flying guns to Nicaragua and the planes loaded up cocaine and flew them back through Arkansas. And the suggestion is that it was then uh, given over to Freeway Rick Ross. Yeah, I believe it was Ricky who is credited with uh, popularizing crack. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I knew people in the 80s who were uh, cooking cocaine to make freebase. And I honestly am not uh, an expert enough user of cocaine to uh, have experienced that. I, I never did freebase. I know people who did. And I don't know how freebase relates to crack uh, chemically. Uh, but he was being given supposedly the, the, the cocaine uh, by uh, a Mr. Blandone, who was the agricultural commissioner for Nicaragua under Somoza, and he was also now a Contra who was sending, taking the weapons and then sending the cocaine back to America. And I, Freeway pretty much says that's how it happened, right? Doesn't he? Yes, that's, that's what he says, yeah. And when Gary Webb was fired from the San Jose Mercury News, they never discounted his story. They never said he was wrong, that he got his facts wrong, right? Um, it's murky. Uh, not mercury, just murky. Uh, right. the, the editors did uh, disavow his reporting. But they never did it. In, it was the LA Times that put together a task force of a dozen reporters to try to poke holes in Gary Webb's reporting. But it was the pressure on Knight Ritter, which was then the owner of the Mercury News, and it was along with the Miami Herald, their, one of their most profitable papers. Uh, and they, uh, under you know, heavy pressure from the Clinton administration, uh, disavowed it. But they never ran a corrective piece that said, Webb got this wrong and this source can't be trusted. It was just they, they threw up a smoke screen and then they assigned Gary to the Cupertino Bureau. And the only way most people outside of California know where Cupertino is because the Apple uh, company is headquartered there. So anyway, uh, <clears throat> it was an ugly story. And I really recommend the movie um, mm -hmm. about Gary Webb. What, what's it called? Do you know? <laughs> I don't remember, but it stars... Jeremy Remmer, the, uh, Renner, I think. Yes. Great movie. Well, and, and, and uh, uh, Consortium News founder uh, uh, Bob Robert, uh, uh, gosh, I'm blocking on his name and I shouldn't. Uh, anyway, he was, uh, Bob was at the Associated Press 
and he and a colleague uh, paralleled the work that Gary Webb did. And uh, they, their story was spiked uh, by the AP. And that's why uh, Bob left and formed Consortium News in the early 90s when the internet was quite a baby. Perry, thank you, Marianne. <laughs> Robert Perry, P-A-R-R-Y. Right. What, uh, I've been asking you too many questions. What, what is burning? What, what did you want to talk about tonight? Well, I, I would like to yield shortly to your next guest, but um, yes. I want to alert people that tomorrow, Chairman Bernie, who is the chairman of the Senate Budget Committee, is holding a hearing at 11 a.m. Uh, uh, Eastern time. And I think it's a very important step that probably will not gain much traction, but will help people understand that we are in the grips of a cycle of corporate greed that is being dressed up as inflation. So let me read from his press release. Uh, this is really in, in the voice of Bernie. Working families across the country are increasingly bearing the brunt of growing economic pain and inequality. Across every major industry, prices continue to rise, including a 38% price uh, increase in the price of gas, a 44% increase in the price of heating oil, 41% increase in the price of a used car, 24% in the price of rental cars, and 17% in the price of furniture. Tyson Foods recently increased beef prices by 32%, the price of chicken by 20%, pork 13%. And no surprise, corporate profits hit a record high, record high of nearly $3 trillion last year, up 25%. Now we never hear that figure. We hear about inflation, <gasps> highest since the 70s or 80s at what, <clears throat> 7% in some sectors, it's, it's in low double digits, but we don't hear about the profiteering that's going on. And to try to inoculate against this uh, uh, Sanders initiative, uh, the Washington Post on April 2nd, uh, the Bernie uh, press release was issued on Friday and it wasn't an April Fool's joke, but uh, the Post just swung into action to protect its owner, Jeff Bezos. And what do they say? The headline reads, as inflation spreads, rising prices fuel charges of corporate greed. And the article uh, says, you know, uh, according to liberals, you know, liberals, <laughs> uh, the, you know, these companies are simply taking advantage of modest inflation and the disruption of the supply chain last year to just ratchet up their profits by jacking up their prices. We know that at best wages are up about 11%. And so uh, I'm happy for the victory uh, in Staten Island for the Amazon union organizers. That is a bright spot. Uh, but we need to see so much more activism. You know, Bernie, for all his, his shortcomings, he really devoted uh, eight years of his life to trying to educate Americans about runaway capitalism and the impact, and it's only gotten worse, and it keeps getting worse. And Joe Biden, who of course hails from the corporate uh, uh, founding, founding capital of America, Delaware, which is where you go to get low taxes and very little oversight by the state government of your corporate activities, uh, he, he is not doing anything. We saw the price of gasoline jump by a dollar just you know, on the news of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. And the gasoline that I pumped for a dollar more had not been produced from crude that cost $100 a barrel. And that, that's the simplest way to explain this. Uh, and yet there is no effort to claw back these illicit profits we see some states have rolled back their gasoline tax. Well, that hurts the economy going forward. It hurts the infrastructure. And it also creates a false uh, 
uh, incentive to keep burning more fossil fuels. And we need to see this moment for what it is, that we're being fucked by greedy corporate interests. And they're getting away with it because the people who are running our government get money from those corporate interests to run their campaigns. And until we bust this uh, disastrous cycle, we are simply going to be the peasants who keep paying more and more and more. And what Americans need to do is boycott these corporations and not our elections. You need <laughs> yes. to vote and boycott the corporations. Do not boycott these elections. That is, I think, is, is the secret. Uh, fantastic job. Anything else? I'll bring in Professor Marianne Cummings. Oh, I just want to, uh, as long as you asked, I have one more little item on my desk here. I was burning all last week because I watch war porn on cable news. And number one, they use stale B-roll. They're still using B-roll. That's the footage while the anchor talks. Um, mm -hmm. from the first week of the invasion. I've seen those four guys in camo uh, go through the woods of Ukraine a <laughs> hundred times. But the Associated Press in uh, uh, a story today pulls back the curtain on what I suspected. Remember, everywhere you turned last week, they said, oh, Putin is isolated. He's sitting at a 20-foot long table and his generals are afraid to tell him what's really going on. In, in the war in Ukraine and how many of his soldiers have died and how many tanks have been blown up. Well, uh, AP says that there has been remarkable coordination in intelligence and an unprecedented level of disclosures from uh, what amounts to the, the, the so-called five eyes, the US, Britain, Australia, um, Canada, and New Zealand. And there has been a coordinated messaging campaign to make us believe that Putin's generals are all, you know, afraid to tell him what's going on. But nobody made a similar, uh, you know, finding when Trump had all of his uh, temporary cabinet appointees and the people at the Pentagon he was shuffling folks, you know, his cronies in and out of there on a regular basis. And so I, I just find this uh, yeah. interesting that they're now acknowledging that what I saw last week as a psychological operation was a coordinated intelligence campaign, a psychological operation. Ah, fantastic. Peter B. Collins is a Bay Area Radio Hall of Famer and go to Peter B. Collins for a treasure trove of interviews, podcasts. Uh, thank you, sir. Can you stick around? Let me ask a favor sure. of Professor sure. Mary Ann Cummings, because we have a guest. What I'd like to do is have John, Professor Jonathan introduce our next guest. And then, uh, then we, if it's OK with Professor Mary Ann, come on after Professor Rasmus because he has to leave. He's, he's got limited time. Is that okay, Professor Marianne? Well, even if it wasn't, oh, okay. <laughs> of course it's okay. Uh, so Professor Bick, introduce our special guest. And if Peter and Professor Marianne could stick around, I will uh, yield my time to you, sir, and listen. Okay. Well, Thank you, David. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Jack Rasmus. He's a professor of economics, and he also has a uh, podcast uh, called Alternative Visions on the Progressive Radio Network. Um, professor Rasmus does not know me, um, but I suggested uh, you to David. I thought you would make a uh, insightful guest uh, on this program, and I thank you very much for, for joining us. Uh, Dr. Rasmus is muted, David. We have to unmute you there. Yeah. there oh, 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 almost, almost. 
twice. Okay. Now you go. Now we now we did it. Now we're okay. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Good evening. Good evening. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you again for coming. And uh, perhaps you could speak uh, a bit about um, inflation and the the Federal Reserve policy uh, towards that whether you think that's uh, likely to lead toward uh, stagflation or uh, a recession or both? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, you know, in inflation has uh, been raging here since at least last summer. Uh, and uh, the political argument is that it's, uh, we, we gave people too much in terms of the uh, bailout and it's a demand-driven inflation, therefore, uh, but uh, actually, you know, the uh, American Rescue Plan here of last uh, February of uh, last year uh, amounted only to $800 billion throughout the whole year. Uh, so if you uh, break that up roughly into quarters, we're looking at maybe a couple hundred billion dollars uh, over the first uh, six or four to six months here. Well, inflation began to take off uh, uh, you know, it's correlated, it appears correlated with the demand, uh, but you also have the demand from opening up uh, the economy, which is much larger than the demand from the stimulus. Uh, and if you look at it, uh, of course, we've got supply problems uh, overlaid on top of the demand problems, which are much greater. Uh, supply chain problems, not only in global uh, export import of goods, but uh, within our domestic economy as well. Uh, transport, trucking, warehousing, and so forth. So we've got these uh, demand problems, which are opening the economy uh, and the stimulus contributing to inflation. But we have the supply chain problems, which is totally different, unrelated to demand. Uh, and then we have another element too, uh, that isn't given, given very much attention. Uh, and that is, uh, I think there's just out, outright price gouging by uh, monopolistic corporations going on uh, under the cover of, oh, there's supply problems, there's supply problems. Uh, for example, 40 or 45% of all the inflation since last summer is uh, oil energy related. Uh, there's no supply problem there. Uh, there's a glut, there's a glut of oil in this country and gas. Uh, so uh, they're hiding behind, uh, raising their prices, hiding behind uh, the supply issue, uh, meat cutting. Okay, uh, there's no supply problem there. Nothing really shut down during the pandemic in terms of, of meat processing. Uh, the same thing with grains, uh, bread, and so forth. Uh, so a lot of the monopolistic uh, corporations, in other words, those industries where you have three, four, five uh, big corporations dominating uh, the, the industry, uh, they've just been price gouging. It's that simple. And of course, the rent, uh, renting uh, uh, has been a big problem, too, uh, as people uh, were driven out of their rents with the end of the forbearance going on. Uh, and uh, we can go down the line industry by industry, and it's not really demand driven. It, it's really supply driven and uh, using supply as price gouging. Uh, and that was the problem uh, going into the war in Ukraine. Uh, and now we have even uh, exacerbated supply chain problems going on, especially uh, when we deal with commodities. Uh, both uh, agricultural commodities, industrial metal commodities, and of course, oil. Uh, and uh, Biden says, well, it's, it's Putin's inflation. Uh, well, you know, it's the sanctions. <laughs> it's really Biden's inflation on top of what was uh, a supply chain uh, uh, price gouging uh, going on, which is going on even more now because you, you've got the cover of, uh, of the commodities problems. So the inflation is really significantly more than they're reporting, you know, officially at 7.9% CPI. Uh, I think it's easily somewhere between 10 and 12% uh, you know, CPI, uh, consumer inflation, goods inflation. Uh, and then, of course, we have uh, financial asset inflation. That's because of the Fed uh, pumping $4 trillion into the financial markets, mostly over the last several years. Uh, so you got to distinguish between goods inflation and you know, financial asset inflation. They're really driven by two different things. Uh, but I think going forward, we've got locked in inflation, uh, double digit here actually going on. Uh, and it's not going to abate uh, because, uh, uh, you know, Biden has taken a, a, a big leap here to restructure the global economy. Uh, 
to cut uh, uh, Russia and uh, its friends out of the global economy, to bifurcate the global economy. And no one knows the real consequences on supply chains, except the Europeans know, of course, for energy that's going on right now. Uh, we have big problems with uh, fertilizer and, and grains and wheats and corn and so forth because of Russia and uh, the Ukraine cut off. Uh, everything coming out of the Black Sea has been, been blocked pretty much. Uh, what else I can say about inflation is that when you have inflation uh, that, that's this significant, that's accelerating this fast and is going to be protracted, uh, you always get uh, a recession. I mean, it's highly correlated uh, back through uh, 70, 73, 75 recession, 80, 81 recession, 90, 91. Uh, 2008, uh, nine, uh, every time you have this much of inflation, uh, you are followed by a, re a recession in the United States. And we can see that recession exacerbated by the Federal Reserve uh, now uh, really accelerating, uh, historically uh, uh, un unnoted that before, uh, inflation as fast as, I mean, uh, interest rate rises as fast as they are doing. Uh, seven hikes, I predict, are probably be a half of uh, 50 basis points here instead of 25 uh, coming uh, next time, maybe twice. So we're, we're going to uh, d double the, the policy rate, inflation rate here in the U.S., uh, which is the benchmark rate for the Fed and all the other rates will follow. I'm looking at the two and the five year rates here, which are already higher. Uh, than the 10-year rate. In other words, the yield curve has, has flipped. The yield curve always predicts, well, almost always predicts that inflation, and uh, boy, the, the, the curve is really going to flip here pretty soon. Uh, so uh, Fed, if the Fed doesn't raise rates to cool the economy down, wouldn't inflation itself, as you just said, cool the economy down? Do we need the Fed to raise rates to cool the economy down? Well, the Fed will cool it down uh, quicker because what the Fed does when it raises rates is uh, it, it uh, shuts down those industries that are rate sensitive. In other words, your housing industry, uh, auto industry, uh, small business loans and so forth, they, they shut down. This is exactly what the Fed did in 8081, you see. In 8081, we had a supply side inflation uh, driven by oil, once again, because of the Middle East situation there with, uh, with Iran. And uh, what they did, instead of uh, taking it out on the oil companies, they took it out on Mr. Consumer, American Consumer. And they did that with, a, it's like with a sledgehammer. You take a sledgehammer to inflation uh, by raising rates to, to you know, exorbitant uh, heights here. And that shuts down those industries. And it makes demand pay the price for the inflation when it was supply that caused the inflation. But politically, it's more acceptable to do that than to take on the big oil companies. Uh, so we can have a repeat of 8081 here uh, in, in the Fed raising interest rates as high as it has. The other repeat we may have here that is equally worrying is that, uh, you know, when we had this kind of a run up in, uh, in um, uh, 2007, 8 in the interest rates, uh, what, what happened? Well, when the economy contracted with interest rates that high, it set off a financial crisis, right? We could be having the same thing, uh, although the banks are really flush with money. That, that's a, a, you know, a countervailing force here. Um, it may not be the banks. It may be the bond markets this time, which are far more important uh, than stock markets if, if they have a big hiccup here. Uh, so uh, th that's another sort of a black swan event that could come out of nowhere here if we raise rates this fast, this high, unprecedented. Uh, I've been predicting since last September that we're going to have a recession in 2023, early 2023, or even it could be uh, late 2020 in November, December of this year. But that's baked. That's baked in. in I think uh, I have no problem making that prediction and haven't uh, for the last uh, six months and uh, the war has just exacerbated those problems in the U.S. economy that were driving uh, prices up already. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we're going to have stagflation, and I think it'll be a record stagflation. Is there something? I, I said one quick. I'm sorry. Yeah, is Manchin to to the fiscal hawks justify letting the 99 percent suffer by thinking? Money thrown to the 99% creates inflation, 
but money thrown to the richest 1% isn't inflationary because there's no uh, multiplier effect. The money, money you give to the richest 1% just gets stored in a stock and the money, or, or it gets stored in a CD and it's not, that dollar doesn't spread throughout the economy. Is that how they justify not taking care of the 99%? How they see it as inflationary? Well, when you when you throw liquidity money at the the one percent, what do they do with it? They don't go go out and buy cars and food. They they put it in financial asset markets globally, right? And that's what the Fed did when uh, the COVID thing hit here in March of 2020. Uh, the Fed pumped four trillion dollars, it raised its balance sheet four trillion dollars. Where did that money go? It didn't go into real investment because we know the economy shut down, right? Where did it go? It went into the stock markets, it went into the bond markets, it went into the foreign exchange currency markets, it went into derivative markets. And that's why you see this massive increase in uh, financial asset values and why your trillionaires added a trillion dollars. Uh, to their balance sheets here, uh, you know, quickly in one year. So, uh, but it yeah. doesn't affect the purchasing power. It doesn't affect the purchasing power of the dollar if it goes into the stock market. You don't have inflation and everything else. Is that correct? Uh, no, the dollar goes up because people are demanding to buy the dollars, okay, globally, because the dollar is the global currency. So, if you have an increased demand for the dollar, the value of the dollar will will go up. And there was some of that going on, but the Fed was offsetting it by dropping its policy rate uh, down to near zero and then real terms and negative terms. So the, the, the Fed was counteracting that at the time, but the dollar would have risen. And now that the Fed is not going to counteract that anymore, the dollar is going to go up and it is going up. And when it goes up, uh, other currencies are going to collapse, which they are doing already. Uh, in emerging markets, and uh, that's going to cause a crisis in emerging markets, which we're already seeing happening, uh, you know, all the way from Egypt uh, to Sri Lanka. It's happening already early. Uh, you know, uh, there's this thing called ideology in economics. You know, economics is part science. Economics is part ideology. And by ideology here, I don't mean an ism. I mean uh, a misrepresentation of facts in using language game, games to do that. Uh, and uh, that's a, a lot of what's behind, uh, oh, you know, uh, inflation is too much money chasing too few goods. We're giving too much money to the peons here and they're spending too much. Uh, and therefore we need austerity as the solution to them. Uh, but we never have austerity for the 1%, you see. Is there anything that, uh, or what, what could the Biden administration do that could address uh, inflation without harming the you know, working people, without uh, bringing the economy into a recession? Is that possible? What, what type well, of things could yeah, it, it, it's quite possible. Uh, th there are ways of doing this. Uh, you know, if inflation is largely 40, 45 percent uh, energy related, you know, you, you address that that major source of, of inflation, what could you do? Well, well you could put uh, temporary price controls uh, on oil and gas until the crisis abates itself, right? Uh, you could put a surtax on the profits of uh, these oil and energy companies and then use that, that revenue from the surtax to distribute it uh, in uh, uh, refunds to people, uh, to commuters in particular, uh, who are bearing the brunt of, of this tax, uh, you could really open the uh, uh, strategic oil uh, preserve. You know, what, what he's doing is dabbling with that uh, because it probably won't, won't work. Uh, the oil companies will, will uh, take the reserves in an auction from the government and then they'll leave their oil in the ground, you see. So you don't really get a true supply increase. Uh, but there are uh, more aggressive moves uh, that could be made, but you know, in, in the fiscal side, the tax side, uh, in, in the price side, but uh, uh, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen uh, with the Demo Democrat Party right now, uh, who are just uh, walking on eggshells so they don't aggravate Joe Manchin. Right. Um, and uh, perhaps you could speak also about uh, the uh, reasons why the U.S. might want this conflict with Ukraine. I know well, you've written about that. 
the U.S., uh, I think, has been building towards this conflict and set a trap for the Russians, and they took the bait uh, very clearly since 1999. you got to step back and look at this whole thing historically and uh, look at it in terms of real politics and not in terms of morality, which just gives emotional appeals and people just go off the cliff. Um, this whole thing starts in the late 90s uh, when uh, Bill Clinton uh, couldn't keep his zipper closed, right? And they almost impeached him. And uh, then he made all the concessions to uh, the Republicans and the, and the yeah. neocons uh, in order to stay in office. And uh, pretty much the neocons uh, started taking over uh, U.S. foreign policy, in my view. And uh, that was the time, 1999, when uh, uh, the idea was, uh, well, let's, let's bomb the hell out of Yugoslavia and get rid of it uh, and uh, make NATO an offensive organization instead of defensive. At the same time, 1999 is the date when uh, they, we start moving NATO east. Right. We uh, the northern east eastern European countries are brought into NATO in 99. And then when Bush comes in uh, right after uh, uh, we, we, we get the uh, attack on on Iraq, you know, we bring the southern tier of the eastern Europeans, uh, you know, Romania and, and Bulgaria and so forth into NATO merchant marching still further east. And then uh, we get uh, uh, we, we entice uh, the Georgians to invade South, South Ossetia, which didn't go so well for them, right? But in the, in the wake of that, uh, what do we do? Then we bring the Baltics in uh, and uh, we start playing around, uh, uh, you know, in the politics of Ukraine from 2005 on. And uh, Ukraine is kind of like a, a, a split between Russian interests and, and nationalist interests. And, you know, they're going back and forth in terms of the president saying this. The country's really split in two, pro-Russian, anti-Russian, has been for a long time. Uh, and then we get involved with this coup in 2014. Uh, very clearly, the U.S. engineered that coup. Uh, Victoria Newland, the Undersecretary of State uh, for the U.S. for, for Europe, uh, gets caught bragging that we spent $5 billion on the ground forces there, uh, some of which were neo-Nazi, uh, in order to pull off that coup after the Russian president barely got elected. Uh, so we, we do that in 2014. The Russians then, uh, you know, make a move in the Donbass there to offset it. And uh, then 2016 comes with Trump and everything takes a kind of a, a, a hiatus for a while, right? Uh, and then as soon as the Democrats come in, uh, Biden um, starts uh, military cooperation uh, with the Ukrainians, uh, signs a preliminary agreement to bring them into NATO, uh, uh, turns uh, Zelensky loose to start talking about, uh, oh, we need nuclear weapons and so forth. Uh, I believe the U.S. was, was uh, taunting and uh, enticing uh, Putin to, uh, uh, to invade. I really do. And he took the bait. And uh, the U.S. has a lot to gain geopolitically from the war in Ukraine. First of all, it reunified NATO under its hegemony that was starting to crack under Trump. Uh, secondly, uh, it, it moves, threatens to move NATO either further east. Uh, most importantly, it stops uh, Russia's uh, penetration, economic penetration of Europe. Uh, began uh, throwing them out, not only in terms of the gas, the Nord Stream 2, uh, but uh, wants them all to, uh, to get all together out of the Western European economy. Uh, the U.S. wants to be the big dog in Europe uh, economically, and it is, uh, and that was being, being threatened. Uh, there's some other uh, secondary uh, uh, objectives for the U.S. as well. Uh, you know, if, if it succeeds and moves NATO into... Uh, uh, Ukraine, then I think it was just a matter of time uh, before you get NATO in Finland and NATO in Moldova, and then you can start uh, destabilizing Belarus and Kazakhstan, which already began. Uh, and then you got the Russians surrounded, uh, and, and then, uh, you know, the U.S. Uh, pretty much gives them an ultimatum somewhere down the line, and they got to capitulate. Uh, pretty much. And uh, that capitulation probably would have been uh, give up your nuclear weapons. Uh, so, you know, Putin uh, jumps the gun and figures, I think, that, uh, well, better to fight it out here in Ukraine on someone else's territory than eventually someday on our territory. Uh, so the U.S. is complicit in this. The U.S. policy for two decades uh, has been to put pressure on Europe, surround it with NATO, push NATO east. After, by the way, 
uh, the old guard in the U.S., the George F. Kennans and the ambassadors said, no, we're not going to move east uh, with the fall of the, the Soviet Union, which we didn't for 10 years, you see. We honored that for 10 years. But then that old guard was replaced by the ne neocons, which had been running amok here in U.S. foreign policy <clears throat> in the 21st century, I think. Uh, and, and that's the big problem. And there's a lot to be gained for the U.S. geopolitically here. Uh, find out what weapons Russia has, you know, what their strategies are, uh, you know, for down the road. Uh, I, I wrote a piece on my blog, jackrasmus.com, in early February, uh, which was entitled 10 Reasons Why the U.S. May Want Russia to Invade. Um, and a lot of them are, are, are coming true, I think. Uh, this is big geopolitical politics here. And uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, is, is attempting to tame Russia. Uh, before it actually deals uh, with China, I think. Uh, I, it can't have both of those at the same time here. Um, so that's-, that's why, can't, why can't we coexist? Why can't the three powers coexist? Well, because uh, certain people believe, uh, there's a faction that believes the US uh, should rule, you know, the global economy uh, and global politics. It believes in a unipolar war, a uh, unipolar world. Right. We have the unipolar world. We want to maintain it. And Russia is beginning to recover. And, uh, you know, China's coming up and, uh, you know, they're threatening our unipolar control. Uh, others, uh, you know, there's economic gains, shorter term economic gains. I mean, the gains that are going to be for the oil and gas companies in Europe are going to be immense here. Uh, you know, there's a whole new market when they're already losing market to alternative energy. Uh, so, you know, I think there's something to be gained from them, from uh, the military industrial complex. Uh, the, there's a lot to be gained, new, new contracts and so forth. Uh, so there are factions in the U.S. Uh, that see benefits short and long term from this and who believe in it ideologically. There are other factions that say, no, this is folly. And, uh, you know, we're, we're taking risk we shouldn't take. Um, and uh, you're referring to those uh, who are, you know, more sensible about the question, uh, but uh, allied against those are those who, who are not. Uh, and that's the battle that goes on in U.S. foreign policy a lot. I mean, you know, you would think that, that the more sensible uh, members of the uh, foreign policy uh, blob, or whatever they're calling it now, uh, would uh, recognize the dangers of essentially excluding Russia from the world economy. Uh, you know, if you if you have their economy collapse, you could have a failed state in Russia. And it's a failed state with nuclear weapons. I mean, that's extremely dangerous situation. Right. And, and it seems that that Putin has been motivated uh, in some part by his view of uh, Russia slash the Soviet Union being humiliated uh, in the 1990s and, and afterward. And, uh, you know, this, this is a very dangerous, combustible combination, but foreign policy experts don't seem to uh, take this into consideration. Well, I think they think they can have their cake and eat it. I think they, they believe uh, that they can uh, uh, pull off moving NATO and getting into Europe and restoring hegemony over, over NATO in Western Europe. Uh, short of provoking a, uh, a direct conflict uh, with Russia. That's, that's why Ukraine is so convenient for them. It's a ground where they don't have to uh, uh, deal face-to-face -face militarily uh, with Russia and the, the big risk that might, uh, you know, could trip into a, a, a tactical nuclear exchange pretty easy if that were the case, you know. They're being very careful, you know, no no, no fly zone and so forth, right? Uh, but really what they want to do is... Uh, uh, create a Brzezinski 2.0 policy. You know, Brzezinski uh, back in uh, uh, 1980 said, uh, you know, Russia's in Afghanistan. Let's bleed the hell out of them. You know, let's give stinger missiles to the Mujahideen and uh, let's, uh, you know, just bleed them economically and politically. And they did with success. Uh, well, I think they think, uh, you know, we, we can do the same thing here with Russia. And then at the same time, we'll, we'll slap these sanctions on them, right? Uh, so it's really a, a, a 2.5 or 3.0, uh, much, much you know, more aggressive than uh, 
the original Brzezinski docket, uh, document. Yeah. And Hillary have, Clinton what? basically said as much in a, in a recent interview, right? She was referring to the, this big new uh, Brzezinski uh, uh, tactic in Afghanistan approvingly and saying, you know, boy, this might be an opportunity to do it again. Yeah, yeah, that's the way they're thinking. It, it slips through once in a while, you know. So when I say they can take, the, they want their cake and eat it, they think that, the, you know, they can have this proxy war. It will debilitate Russia. Uh, it'll drive it out of Western Europe. The U.S. Uh, oil and energy and other companies will, will step into the vacuum. Uh, the military industrial complex will get, uh, you know, another lease on life. And uh, they'll see how these sanctions really work. Uh, and don't work, uh, you know, before they, they pull them on China. You know, I, I, there's a lot to be gained here politically and economically for U.S. interests. And they think that they can play, uh, uh, play chicken, I think. I really think they believe that they can do this and get away with it short of a nuclear exchange. We have limited time. We, we, I promise to get you out of here by uh, 1030. Professor Marianne, you yeah, have a question? I yeah, just a, just a quick question. Um, I'm sure that's the. I, I'm absolutely sure that's the way you think. And I think your your analysis of those headless nails that the Bush administration embedded in the State Department, so that the State Department is far more bellicose than the Defense Department is. That's absolutely mm -hmm. true. Victoria Newland is the post, poster charge for that. Child for that. But uh, you know, the world has moved on from the 1990s. I mean, China's Belt and Roads program has been an incredibly successful, by many measures, anti-poverty program. They are trading with the entire world. They have deals with the entire world. They are negotiating right now with the Saudis to uh, buy oil in yuan. They, mm -hmm. When you think of just Russia, China, and India, and India recently did a, it was a modest deal, but nonetheless significant because, you know, petrodollars are kind of what keeps our hegemony going. And now we have cracks in this. So how do you see the fact that there's been now three deals in oil that are not in petrodollars? And that seems to be like a new Russia, China, India, and a few other countries. I mean, that's half the world's population right there. Well, yeah, well, that, that, that's one of the uh, uncertain consequences of uh, this big risk, risk taking uh, adventure here, you know, in, with NATO and, and Europe. Uh, they running, they're running the risk that uh, Russia and uh, China will be able to create an all alternative uh, uh, currency relationship an alternative international payment system, which both of them have been sort of trying to develop already. Uh, that could come out of this. Uh, you would have Iran join it, probably India would join it. And uh, if you have an alternative international payment system, then uh, the U.S. cannot see who's violating the sanctions. You know, the, the U.S. dominated SWIFT system, that's an acronym, is the way it sees, it looks in through the banks and the trading and see, sees who's actually violating the sanctions, you see. But if you have an alternative payment system, you can't look in and see it. Or you can even... Uh, create one maybe uh, through the cryptocurrencies. That's a little more, you know, tentative. Not so direct. I but I think what you just said is going on right as we speak. Yes, Plus, it is. It is. Yeah. the sanctions that from the U.S. is providing Putin with political cover because he's got a segment of the po his population that are more inclined, the professional managerial class, if you would, that are more inclined toward the West. And if Putin did this in unilaterally trying to you know, decouple from Europe and the West, that would be extremely politically volatile for him. But now, you know, U.S. is doing it for him. Yeah, well, there's sanctions and sanctions, you know, uh, there's uh, uh, the sanctions that actually may work. Uh, and but then there's all kind of exemptions that are in these sanctions, like the, the major uh, Russian bank that handles uh, uh, transactions in, in oil and gas, the Europe Gazprom Bank is exempted. <laughs> it's exempted. <laughs> You know, let me, there let me are get other Peter, US banks that are exempted over there. Peter B. Collins, we're, we're out of time. One quick question, then I promised to get Professor Rasmus out of here. Please. Professor, I appreciate your commentary. Um, I agree with just about all of it. And uh, that comes from a guy who hit the wall in Econ 101. Uh, but I do have a question that you haven't touched on so far. 
the incredible bubble that's building in the real estate sector mm. with uh, not just California, but prices up uh, almost by 25% uh, nationwide in the past year. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you see that bubble uh, resolving? Uh, well, uh, you got to distinguish between housing and commercial property, okay? And it has to do with uh, debt uh, and the ability to service the debt. Uh, of course, when you have the bubble and prices are rising, the debt levels for financing housing or commercial property are rising, rising. Uh, but debt itself, the magnitude of debt is not the problem. Uh, the problem is the ability to service the debt. In other words, to pay the principal and interest of the debt. Uh, and for that, you need cash flow or you need loans. You need to roll over the old debt or whatever. Uh, and uh, I don't see that problem, the ability to service the debt uh, in uh, the housing market because it's mostly at the high end right now. Uh, I do see the problem in a commercial property market you know, uh, building offices and building uh, hotels and resorts, mm -hmm. and factories and things like that. Uh, the debt level and the ability to generate cash flow to pay for it uh, is very tenuous uh, in a commercial property. Um, so price rises by themselves are not uh, the whole picture. And yes, we have a, a bubble in price going in uh, the residential housing market, uh, but I don't see uh, a problem with serviceable debt in that particular mar market. We, we are probably going, my, my guess is, and it's just a guess, uh, if there's going to be a black swan event here, you know, like the housing cr crash was in 2008-9, <coughs> I think it's going to come into bond markets. Ooh. And the bond markets are really the core of the global financial system here, far more important, far, far larger and far more important than even the stock markets. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to watch the bond markets and what's going to go on there. All right. Thank you. Professor Jack, thank you. Professor Jack Rasmus is author of Epic Recession and Global Financial Crisis. No? No, no. That's a 2010 book. My, my latest oh. books are uh, uh, The Scourge of Neoliberalism, U.S. Economic Policy from Reagan to Trump. 2020, and before that, central bankers at the end of their ropes, 2017. So, and how do people um, how do people listen to your podcast? Uh, well, go to Alternative Visions uh, every Friday at 2 p.m. New York time, uh, where my show is on, and I talk about the problems and the issues. Uh, also, you can go to my blog, JackRasmus.com, where all my writings are. Uh, and from there, you can uh, go to my website and other places and so forth. So that's the best. Or, or follow me on Twitter day to day, uh, which is just uh, at Dr. Jack Rasmus. John, Professor Jonathan Bick, why don't you wrap it up, please? I'd just like to thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rasmus. Uh, please come back uh, in the future. Be glad to. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Fantastic. Great, 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 great job, Professor Bick. Thank you, Professor Rasmus. Let us now go to Aurora, where Professor Marianne Cummings is standing by. She is a particle physicist as well as an elected official, Parks Commissioner, Aurora, Illinois. Your thoughts on the professor? Oh, I, th I think a lot of what he says was spot on, particularly in the, about the State Department. And, you know, uh, President Cheney was a very transformational guy there. I mean, he basically put in his people and they have, a lot of them have stayed there. And they, even when they were kind of in the minority, they've had like outsized influence to their numbers. I, I think a few weeks ago, um, I had brought up, I, I had seen an article from uh, Salon, I think in 2019 or 2015, where uh, the undersecretary of state, who was Victoria Newland, was overriding her boss, who was then John Kerry, he, came, he was secretary of state after Hillary, in terms of diplomacy he was conducting with Russia, where he was trying to reassure the Russian foreign ambassador in the Russia because he was still working on these new start agreements. That was his big deal. And he, apparently he's still working on them, this uh, nuclear proliferation, um, anti-proliferation agreement with Russia. 
that's still kind of going on uh, in the background there. And uh, he was assuring them that no, uh, they understood the national concern, uh, security concerns about the Crimea and they understood the concerns about Odessa and you know the, the Black Sea and all this. And meanwhile, uh, his uh, undersecretary of state is publicly undermining all this. Like Victoria Newland was making public pronouncements that they're going to like the U.S. is going to help Ukraine get back, recover Crimea, and just end this these you know this fighting with the rebellious republics in the in the Far East and this and that. And uh, Obama went along with her. He, he he kind of was for a while backing her, you know, backing her, and then saw Obama wasn't completely. Uh, he was a very smart guy. I think he was a very weak guy. I don't think he was as bellicose, neither he nor Bill were as bellicose as, for instance, Hillary appeared to be. And uh, he was kind of, I think, uh, a little while after, he kind of balked at sending Ukraine the lethal weaponry that Victoria Nuland was telling the government that we were going to send them. So, right. Yeah, anyway, all of this stuff is, is just a way of saying that, you know, this is this is crazy. Uh, sane people who want to have a stable world don't engage in this kind of diplomacy. And but, you know, there are people that had a they still have visions of retaking the world, even as the world has moved on. I, I mean, I don't. I don't see like Russia going to be subdued. I don't think that Russia is going to concede and give up their nuclear weapons. I don't think that's ever going to happen. Um, and certainly China, you're going to also break up China. You know, that's, they're already, recon you know, they're all what, but the world I think that Rasmus was, was referring to, I think that's already happening. You know, the, the danger he says in, in pushing this thing, it's already happening. It's it's giving China and China and their road and their program much more impetus to do business because there's a whole pile of South American countries and and uh, African countries that you know are interested in the tender mercies of dealing with the U.S. State Department. You know they much rather do business with this emerging Eurasia bloc. But anyway, um, that's yeah. just. Smarter people than I am have to work on this. Um, I was just kind of amused this morning because I'm going through some of the um, videos from the talk shows, uh, the, the uh, economic talk shows and the business talk shows. <laughs> and they're still all uh, Twitter over uh, uh, the, the Amazon labor union victory. But, um, are they happy about it? Or are they upset? No, as a matter of fact, a lot of people are kind of a little stunned. Um, however, I I saw a, a video that you know was from an earlier show this morning on Bloomberg, and, and yeah, I wrote her name down because I didn't want to forget it. Her, her name is Lynn Vincent. I think she's an associate professor at Syracuse University in the School of Management, and she was like praising Christopher Smalls. And but what she was saying was very interesting. He said, you know. He took an approach of actually building consensus among the union, to getting to know them, getting to change people's point of views of themselves as workers. That, hey, you're, you're not these you know, disposable items. These guys actually need all of you. I mean, you're there like what? You are what creates the wealth for this company, not Bezos and his management team. And so she's going on about that. And what she said was quite apart from the uh, propaganda that uh, that Bezos and all wanted to catapult about uh, Mr. Smalls. She says it's really quite brilliant what he was doing because the um, Amazon union busted tactics have been geared toward the traditional, which is say with traditional in the more recent sense, unionization, which is very top down which is you know, appealing to the union leadership, cajoling them, threatening them. And when you have people making careers out of this, uh, yeah, they can be effective. Whereas if you just have people who have nothing to, you know, nothing to lose and everything to gain, it doesn't work. As a matter of fact, 
he stepped back and you know let Amazon's rather coercive tactics be the persuaders to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. I mean, so it was interesting because she went out and her co-hosts were just sitting there kind of like they had nothing to say. So Lynn did So are there people, I, I, I haven't been watching the news, especially the cable news, are there people who are willing to say, to admit that they're opposed to Amazon going union, that this is bad for the economy? Apparently, Jim Cramer was saying that. There was a couple other people I heard saying that after, you know, after Lynn Vincent's segment. And I didn't really know who they were. But uh, Cramer was, uh, he, I think this segment was from last Friday, right after it happened. And he's kind of stunned. And he's saying, you know, like, uh, you know, the, the strength of Amazon is that they can tell their workers when to work and when they can't work. And they, they just basically do what they, you know, they're told. And that's the brilliance of Amazon. I said, well, that's kind of the brilliance of a slaveholder, isn't it? I mean, it's like, yeah. that, was, that was Jim Cramer, you know? So I'm assuming that a lot of people on CNBC and Fox Business and Bloomberg and all of these other shows are, you know, probably more toward Cramer than a side view of it than uh, Professor Vincent's side of it. But uh, I, I, as I said, I... I noted Lynn Vincent because she really got into his method. I mean, everybody else was talking about what a disaster it was potentially for Amazon. And she's talking about Christopher Spall's uh, unique approach to this in actually building not not, not just a union, but actually taking, getting people to change their worldview or their view to, of themselves as workers and, you know, in, in the company. So I thought that was very interesting of her. And, and you know what, that's going to resonate. It's that is what's going to resonate. And I think that, uh, I think, I don't know who you were talking about the, the Harvard graduate who was trying to like um, organize down in Bessemer at their plant. Stuart Applebaum. Yeah. Applebaum, yeah. But I think that, um, yeah, I mean, Amazon might be much more, Amazon's cyborg techniques might actually work on somebody like that more effectively than somebody like Christopher Smalls, that's for sure. So, you know, yeah. that's, uh, because it is really a mind view. Uh, it's, it's a worldview. Um, I was, uh, found something very interesting just after I had watched all this this morning. Um, there was an article in the, and this is to con- to compare and contrast, there was an article that appeared in New Yorker magazine. And I got the article up here and it's, it's basically about the Black Lives Matters, the uh, global um, initiative, the, the global uh, organization of Black Lives Matters. So this is Sean Campbell's work in the New Yorker magazine and he, uh, and- he talked about um, how this group had have been buying up mansions, specifically, you know, six million dollar house in California, where they were doing their broadcast from, or they were claiming it was, you know, well, we want to set up a sanctuary, we want to set up a, you know, uh, but they were keeping this kind of on the down low and secret from even other people in the organizations that they they had. Uh, bought a similar mansion in around uh, the Toronto area. And I'm going, what is Black Lives Matter buying mansions for? But again, you know, the, the leaders of this organization, you know, they see themselves as kind of media figures now. That's Patrice Cullors, uh, Alicia Garza, and Melina Abdullah. And um, they are also, they also have careers. I mean, these people are giving themselves rather hefty salaries. And they are, you know, reaching out to other media outlets and they said, well, we have, you know, we, we're doing great things for the movement Black Lives Matter. We are giving them, you know, rec- they, we are giving them kind of visibility and a platform. There's a lot of people in this article, which I encourage people to read, because this is the ultimate in, you know, this kind of, I wouldn't call them charity. They're supposed to be a movement. Now, this is a, a lesson in how not to run a movement to take all those dollars and 
one of the organizers in Ferguson, which was the uh, was Michael Brown's case, is what you know uh, sort of ignited the Black Lives Matter movement. And said, you know, we still don't have any kind of community center down here in Ferguson. I mean, we've got organizers who are sleeping in the street who are homeless. And you've got all of this money going to these places and these people at the top. And I'm just thinking like, yeah, just like the, uh, just how the major unions kind of evolved where their management started living more like the CEOs of companies rather than the workers that they were representing supposedly. And that kind of was why um, Reagan was able to divide and conquer. He made the deals. I, I have an uncle back when Rachel, I listened to Rachel Maddow. She used to like refer to your uncle who watches Fox News. Well, I have one of those, but he was angry. He was a liberal, I think at one point who was just angered by what happened. And he was angered by the uh, Reagan firing all of the air traffic controllers and none of the unions striking in sympathy or even talking about it. And so, I he got think- mad. so what happened is he got mad at Reagan first, but yes. then got mad at the union for not protecting and him. His own union and the unions who were, you know, where's the AFL-CIO? Well, the AFL-CIO made their own deal with Reagan. The major unions, right. the teachers, they, were, they, they were in talks with people in the Reagan administration. Again, these are people with a management kind of mindset rather than a labor movement kind of mindset. No, the whole point is that there are many of us and a few of those a-holes. I mean, that's not a, that, that's not a now, deep Dr. concept. Dr. Fraud, in defense of the American labor movement, Taft-Hartley, yeah. As Dr. Harriet Fraud has pointed out, Taft Hartley makes it illegal for Marxists, members of the Communist Party, to run an American labor union. So that seems to me we should challenge that in the courts. That yeah, seems to me a hideously unconstitutional Marxist. I mean, Marxism, Marx was a philosopher and you know a theorist on the movement of capital, basically. I mean, how can you right. I mean, I mean, that's not even a, how do you even define a Marxist? I mean, we don't have any Marxist parties. Right. Well, uh, it seems to me the, uh, the Constitution would not allow that rule that you can't be a member of the Communist Party to run a labor union. It seems to me our labor unions should be run by at least socialists, democratic socialists. Well, why do you have to call yourself anything at all. I mean, you know, like labor, the early union leaders didn't call themselves anything, you know. Um, Marxism here was something that was just, well, I don't really know. I don't know. I know that Marx, which is odd, but I didn't realize how early Marx lived when I found out that he had um, correspondence with Abraham Lincoln, you know, about, uh, you know, the direction America could take. Um, his, I read the Communist Manifesto in high school and was stunned to under, to read it was written like in 1848. And I mean, it was like, wow, it, the, the section on women sounded like it could have been written in the 1970s, you know, feminist tract. I mean, it was, I, I was really quite stunned you know, that, you know, history is still relevant. It's not even history um, anyway, but I don't know in terms of labor movements, why I, were early were, were were the coal miners were were you know the railroad workers were these guys uh, steeped in Marxist theory? I don't know. I don't think they were. We have to smoke out. We have to smoke out the Jim Cramers of the world. He's on CNBC. He he's admitted to doing inside trading. He is a Democrat. He handled the investment portfolio for uh, Peretz, one of the original owners of The Nation magazine. I mean, this guy, James Cramer, is a Democrat. And he's been smoked out. I, I Googled it while you were talking. He's admitted that Amazon going union is bad for the economy. We need to smoke out, get every 
every politician, every pundit on record, where do you stand on unions? It's a give, We always think it's a given that everybody's for a union, but they can find a reason not in this specific case for a corporation to go union. There are people who are genuinely opposed to unions. I'm from a generation where it's unimaginable that anybody would be opposed to unions. You know, you cannot understand, you know, the history of, you know, the, the, you know, how we gain the weekend, how we gain the 40 hour week. You cannot understand uh, the, you know, the prosperity of the middle class post-war America without understanding labor history. I mean, you just can't. It's like they want to erase history. You know, I, when you said Jim Cramer now, I just remember, I know this might, this might um, not sit well with you, but I do remember John Stewart or his comedy writing team taking out the entire economic and business punditry class in just a brilliant segment on The Daily Show. I mean, he just took them all out. He just like, he, he had little vignettes of what they were talking about in the stock market right before it collapsed. They were all like a thousand percent wrong. He didn't even particularly focus on Jim Cramer, but he did show a segment with Jim Cramer and of course his mad money segment. I mean, his zaniness was, he kind of like these pretensions to being like the Jim Carrey of the you know, business punditry world with his antics. So uh, Kramer made the mistake of going after John Stewart. And I'm going, oh man, his comedy team just can't believe that this fell in their lap. And of course, you know, they, <laughs> they really did a number on him. And he went on his show. What, what they dug up though, what was interesting. I don't think this was John Stewart, it was probably one of his comedy writers, dug up an interview. And hey, you do know John Stewart fought his writers from going union. I, 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 I'm very much aware of that, which is kind of ironic. Okay. But uh, they caught, they caught uh, Kramer in an interview he did several years before that, where he's just basically telling this guy that, hey, you know, I was working for a hedge fund, and basically we could just set the prices on things. We could cause a run on the market in some sectors. We could just coordinate. Um, for years, one of the people in our chat, Landrew, was just telling me, like, look, you know, the bulk of the trading that goes on is like directed by five or six people any given day on Wall Street. <laughs> you know, it's just like, this is no such thing as free market. It's just very much a coordinated move um, until things get out of hand and then they can't control it. But, um, but anyway, I just- uh, like MSNBC, MSNBC, their new uh, 11 o'clock host is Stephanie Rule, who, is either married or dating a hedge fund manager. She has a background on Wall Street. MSNBC has been on the air 20 years? No, at they, least 30 years. Because back in the 90s, it used to be talk all day. No, money all day, talk all night. It used to be just M MSNBC or CNBC. And then it was CNBC and then MSNBC. But, uh, so MSNBC finally went yeah. union last oh, year. Yeah. I didn't know that. Last year. Mm -hmm. Finally. Well, and I don't even know, I don't even know if they're writers. I guess they're writers finally. Rachel Maddow's, Lawrence O'Donnell's writers finally had a union contract last year. Amazing. Good. I think that my mother called me today and she even saw Christopher Smalls on the TV. So, so they're watching MSNBC or Fox Business or something. So she saw him, was very, very impressed by this guy. And I said, yeah, right. uh, I mean, suddenly, so Krista, I saw just a couple of days ago, uh, Chris Hedges, who I have admired and it was a tragedy that you know years of his uh, on contact shows were just disappeared off of youtube you know it's kind of like they're trying to destroy history but uh because of he says, because of rt yeah because he was on rt america and of course he said you know um i might actually get more mileage or get more 
uh, visibility out of this than if they had just stuck me on PBS at 11.30 at night, you know, with a, a, a uh, author's book hour or something, you know, I'd probably get just as few views then. But, uh, but they were, it had a bit of an Ruben argument. His show. Yeah. They were having a bit of an argument not an unfriendly one, but a bit of an argument. This was Brianna Joy Gray was interviewing him. And, uh, and he was saying that, look, you know, he because she asked him about AOC because there was a little dust up between her and AOC and Christopher Smalls. And she and he goes, look, these, even the, the squad, they're irrelevant to what is going to happen. You need movements. You need these things to happen on the ground first. And well, Brianna said, I pushed back a little, said, well, it actually does matter if you have decent people in Congress. And he says, yeah, there were some real believers in Congress at one point here and there, but um, there was a difference between people who uh, will espouse your point of view, view and people who will fight for it. And right. now Christopher Smalls is showing people on the ground how they can really fight for it and win. We still have yet to have a tutorial uh, you know, in the, from somebody in the Congress on how to use your, we have it on the right. We have it in Manchin. Actually, Manchin is showing everybody how it's done. You know, you just be intransigent and then they have to talk to you. Um, but you can't do that unless you have leverage. And, you know, I think, unfortunately, the squad, they had a great opportunity with the Democratic Party's um, margins being so tiny that they could swing it. They didn't want to exercise that power. Uh, it's, it's unfortunate that they didn't because whatever happens, you know, I, look, I, I just was reading today that uh, when people are, we're talking about inflation, uh, one of the Bloomberg people, it was, uh, it was in Bloomberg I was reading where they said, well, people will just have to budget for like $5,200 more a piece next year. And I said, really? People who are barely making mortgage payments or rent payments and utility payments got to come up with another 5,000 bucks or more. This is going to be a disaster for, you know, the Democrats, unless they really change tack. I mean, they, they, they see, I see no evidence of them doing that. And that's why, you know, I, I can't, I can't quote get behind Dems because they have such a losing message. I mean, even now, as of Friday, it's like over 60% thought inflation of the country thinks inflation is the overriding problem right now. And only 20 something, 27, 28% think that Ukraine is the problem. Usually wars distract us from, um, you know, from bad news economically, but this, we've just got so used to all these wars going on and we're not involved. I mean, we're not fighting it. You know, people aren't getting drafted. We're not, we're not asked to even grow victory gardens. Although I encourage everybody to grow a garden this year, if you can. Um, it's, uh, so it, it's just what, you know, the cost, I mean, gas, the, the heating bill was three times what it was last year. And I cranked my house down to like 55 degrees. I've got a little space heater under my desk as we speak right now. But, uh, you know, do you think people in my neighborhood are going to really care? <laughs> they are not. So, anyway. As you pointed out, it doesn't matter if we care or not. There will be a war, whether we like it or not. Mm -hmm. Iraq. And it didn't matter. I mean, I would have voted for Hillary if she had shown leadership. Even if she had shown leadership and it failed. A year later, she would have shown to be right. And she would have been president in 2008, but she has failed leadership, her leadership tests at every turn. And now I see that she's on talk shows again. I think she was on, I don't have TV, but I, I see on, on YouTube that she was on Meet the Press or something. I, I, what in the world is she talking about? Uh, I think I she know. thinks, I think she looks at Joe Biden. I, I don't mean to be cruel to Biden, but he is doddering. Uh, he can barely keep his teeth in. He is going off the reservation. He's got a 
it's it's very reminiscent of Reagan. You've talked about this, where he says one thing and then his handlers say, no, this is what he meant to say. He just didn't say it. The, the provocation. Of the of yeah. I'm sorry? That was the feature of the second term of Reagan. I think by the second term, though, people were just kind of accepting that Nancy was feeding him answers. And although, as I said, you know, when I listened to a clip of him in in 1987 from 1981 I, I was it was shocking I mean you, it, you could tell the decline so I think it's cruel it's going to be it's going to start bordering on elder abuse at this point I mean I don't know the the Democrats have a hard decision to make how is this guy going to run for president in 2000 it, you know because you're going to have to start running like next year and I in no, no, this year it starts November 10th of this right year. After, the president, yes. right after the midterms, is when the uh, presidential, yeah, where the presidential. And if, and, and if he loses, if the Democrats lose the House, mm -hmm. then the impeachment starts. He won't be removed from office, but they will spend yeah two years digging up everything about Hunter Biden, which will make it harder and harder for joe biden and the democrats to keep the president well and presidency. we all knew this even before you know the election uh, i'm sorry i i am not a go along to get along kind of gal especially where it comes to democrats i mean we had a viable alternative to somebody who was clearly sunsetting as he was running for president in the fall of 2020 and his son the laptop comes out and they do everything they can to squelch that story but you know it's like we how can we have this you've got somebody who is incredibly fit mentally sharp as attack in bernie sanders but he much more than even trump would threaten all the interests that nancy pelosi and chuck schumer um you know represent now I don't know. I'm just kind of speaking of Chuck Schumer. Uh, who is this, uh, Jeanette, the, the the lawyer that is up for circuit court uh, judge uh, appointment? She was originally appointed by Trump. Her law firm is basically this firm that uh, prosecuted Stephen Donziger. And you know, it's like she works for Chevron. Well, it's the law firm, it, it, Jennifer Reardon, and it's the law firm that uh, represented Chevron and actually represented both Chevron and was ready and provided the private prosecution, which by the way, no one has explained this to me at all. And, and I don't know how that works. How is a prosecution done by a private company? It, it, there's a lot of things I don't understand. How do we still have Guantanamo? I don't understand that either. I mean, there's just a lot of bizarre stuff that goes on. And I think, you know, it's power. So um, yeah, we've overplayed our hand. I think, you know, the United States when we're getting back to Ukraine would have a lot more heft with the rest of the world outside of, you know, sort of our NATO leader, our NATO members if we, had, if we hadn't taken a wrecking ball to international law as a concept. Yeah, I mean, international law is an international law if somebody, a country, because it can do it, just goes around and violates all all kinds of laws, breaks all kinds of rules of human decency, as opposed, not to mention just you know international illegality. It's fun yeah. times, huh? Yep, we have to wrap it up by a family stuff that has to be tended to. So oh, geez, thank oh, geez, you. The relatives, I tell you. Okay. <laughs> you, yeah. This is, uh, yeah. Uh, it's easier to host this podcast than it is to deal with real life. Uh, just, you get to block everything out doing this. Thank you, Professor Marianne Cummings. Follow the professor on Twitter at Razor Girl. Girl is spelled G R R L. And Professor Marianne Cummings, besides being a particle physicist and an amazing artist, is also a Parks Commissioner, elected Parks Commissioner for Aurora, Illinois, 
Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I hope to see you Thursday. That is our show, and I'm going to wrap it up. I see Rodrigo has his hand raised, but I have to wrap the show up. I have to tend to other things. I want to thank all our guests, and I'm not even going to name them. I'm just going to, I should do that. I, I, I want to, I need to get out of here, but I will name all the uh, guests. And I forgot, my computer software crashed, so I can't thank the people who helped make the show uh, visually, but I can thank Professor John, Sarah Bush, Andy Brown, The Invisible Ninja, Hannah Feldman, Joe in Norway, and of course, Dan Frankenberger in the newsroom. They help put this, sh and Grace Jackson. They meet with me and they help plan these shows and uh, they're helping to make this uh, available to as many people as we can possibly reach. Thank you all to my guests. They are Howie Klein, read him over at Down With Tyranny, Jason Smiles, listen, Jason Miles, listen to the This Is Revolution podcast. Follow John Ross on Twitter at Fun With Friction. Uh, Mark Breslin, founder and president of Yuck Yucks. Go see live comedy. Dr. Harriet Fraud, follow her on Twitter at Harriet Fraud. Professor Adnan Hussein, listen to Guerrilla History and the Mudgeless podcast and follow him on Twitter at Adnan A. Hussein and at Weekly Marks. I want to thank Professor Marianne Cummings, as well as Peter B. Collins. Go to peterbcollins.com for a treasure trove of his radio shows, his podcasts, and his interviews. I want to thank Professor Jonathan Bick for bringing on Dr. Jack Rasmus, host of Alternative Visions. And I think that covers everything. I think it does. We have a YouTube channel, so please subscribe to it. We're cutting up morsels of these shows into digestible bits. If you would like to sit in our virtual studio audience, please go to my website and sign up. It's free. All you need is Zoom. And if you'd like to attend office hours, please sign up at my website. While you're over there, please, um, please, uh, sign up for my newsletter. I think I covered everything. I think I am David Feldman. Remember to stay strong and protect the weak. And I will play some music from Professor Mike Stein. Yes, I'm exhausted. People are asking me if I'm exhausted. Yes. Here is a theme song from Professor Mike Steinel. <laughs> He's groovy like a movie that you watched one time when you were kind of high. But now you can remember exactly why you liked it, but you did. He's charming, it's alarming how charming he is when he's for me. And just like that movie that we watched when we were stoned, we like him and we don't know why. He's gregarious, he's hilarious. And most of his head is hairyless And like a mean girl from school Who treated you cruel You like him And you don't know why You like him And you don't know why You like him And you don't